Um, first of all, welcome back to the second day of the conference. Um, I hope everybody will be as enthusiastic and as exciting uh, despite the gloomy weather here in Kapong. Uh, before we start, I'd like to check with our participants in Zoom. Can everybody hear me well? Can somebody type in? I can hear you well or something like that, if you can hear me well. Okay, thank you so much, May Rafida. Thank you so much. Um, all right, um, we'll start today's conference with session three with the theme Habitat and Wildlife. This session will be moderated by Yang Rosaha, Dr. Muhammad Nasi Mat Arif. Um, allow me to read his short bio. Dr. Muhammad Nasir is the Senior Research Officer in FRIM. He has been serving the R&D field for 17 years now. He obtained his doctoral degree in chemistry, wood preservation from University of Malaysia in 2013. He's now served as the Head of Research Policy and Planning Branch, Division of Research Planning FRIM. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome our moderator, Dr. Muhammad Nasir. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good morning and salam sejahtera. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I would like to welcome you all back to Frame uh, Conference 2022, unlocking the value of Urumuda Forest Ecosystem Services towards Sustainable uh, Development Goal (SDG). And yesterday. Uh, we already heard a very great presentation of uh, from all our three keynotes and seven oral presentations. And this morning, we will continue uh, to the third session of this seminar program. And this seminar, this third session theme uh, is Habitat and Wildlife. In fact, the last presenter yesterday, uh, who was very amazing, Mr. Shafiz, has already touched on this theme. And uh, without wasting uh, another time, I would like to invite the first speaker, first presenter, Kwan Mukrima Abdullah. And before that, uh, allow me to introduce her. Kwan uh, Mukrima is a research officer in frame and the and her areas of expertise is environmental economics and social forestry and she received an education in uh, bsc forestry science uh, ums and master in environmental economics uh, from upm and he and her professional experience, uh, she is active conducting research and consultation related to the environmental, economics, and social forestry studies. Uh, a little reminder to the all the presenters for this session. For the time for the presentation is about twenty minutes and uh, five minutes for Q and A. Without further ado, I. Uh, the floor is yours, Prima. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nasi. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nasi, for a very nice introduction of me. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good morning to our guest of honor, Dr. Bhatti here. And also uh, all participants from uh, in the auditorium and also from Zoom and also Facebook application. Okay, I'm Ahmed Karima Abdullah. I'm a research officer from Forest Research Institute of Malaysia. So today I will share with you guys uh, our latest and also current findings uh, in our study area at Ulu Muda Forest Reserve. Okay, entitled Biodiversity Conservation from the Economic Perspective, a case of Ulu Muda Forest Reserve. 
Okay, so since yesterday, all of you has uh, has uh, listened and heard uh, all the presentation related to the goods, related to timber, related to the non-timber forest products such as bamboo, rotan, ornamental and ornamental plant, and also medicinal plant. So today, I will I will share with you guys a different perspective, different different perspective of uh, those goods, which is uh, from the economic perspective. So. As mentioned uh, by Prof Awang yesterday, there are three main pillars in the Sustainable Development Goal, where economics is one of the pillars. That means uh, that mean we have to balance up between all those three pillars, uh, especially the economics pillars. Okay, so let's go. Okay, so this will be the presentation outlined. So I just glanced through it. Okay, so as, as for the introduction, as we know, forest ecosystem services or forest itself serve as a landscape for biodiversity. Okay, so uh, Malaysia uh, has committed uh, in preserving the forest and also biodiversity uh, by signing uh, the Rio Summit, uh, the, the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, where Malaysia committed uh, to preserve for at least 50% of its land uh, is covered by forest. So forest ecosystem services provided wide range of uh, services, including the biodiversity itself. So at present, people are more concerned in protecting and conserving biodiversity. So biodiversity contribute to the economic, uh, to the economy, food security, environmental stability, education, recreation, and also ecotourism. So the challenging aspect in conserving biodiversity is to identify, to identify the priority. So how, uh, at what level we want to set the priority and also we need uh, to balance up between the development and also the conservation. So in order to manage and conserve, all this information, especially the economic parts, uh, must be obtained. Okay, so why do exactly we need to conduct economic study? So the simplest way, uh, the simplest way, sorry, okay, the simplest way uh, to explain the economics is what money. Okay, so nowadays everything involves money. People are willing to pay hundreds. People are willing to pay hundreds to go to Sanwa Lagoon. People are willing to pay thousand to go to Legoland Malaysia. So how about biodiversity? So how about Taman Negara National Park? How about Man and Biosphere Tasik Chini? So how about Ulumuda Forest Reserve? Okay, so let us see, let's uh, go through why exactly we need to conduct the economic study. So there are three main reasons why we need to conduct economic study. The first one is to support act and policy, which is um, Malaysia has lots, lots of um, act policy and also legislation related to the forest, related to the biodiversity, related to the environment, where one of the requirement, where one of the requirement, uh, even in the forest management plan, and uh, in Malaysia also required to conduct economic study. Okay, the second one is the externality. Externality means the ecosystem services are always undervalued and neglected, especially in decision-making process. Okay, so the last one is, this is the very important one, which is the new financing mechanism. So the new financing mechanism um, is a very uh, popular, is a very popular uh, incentive or mechanism uh, related uh, to the economy, where yesterday uh, Prof Awang already uh, briefed or explained, and also uh, Dozum also already been explained about the forest beyond timber, about the payment for ecosystem services, about the carbon taxing. Okay, throughout the slide, uh, throughout the presentation, I will briefly explain uh, each one of them. Okay, so this is the, the simplest examples uh, of the application of the economic study uh, in real life. Okay, so um, so all of us has been charged uh, to enter the uh, hutan lipo. Eh? Now, now we call it Taman Eko Rimba. We charge RM2 ringgit. So from what basis you get the two ringgit? So through the economic study, we got the baseline uh, in order for us to charge, in order for the forest manager, in order for the uh, conservator to charge how much uh, the entrance fee and so on. And also, uh, this one is the tampik waterfall here. So... This is one of frame study where we apply economic study uh, to to set how much uh, how much um, is the the 
the uh, the how much is the i'm sorry <laughs> okay how much we are going to pay in order for us uh, to go to the Ulu Tampik waterfall. So Ulu, Ulu Tampik waterfall is uh, one of frame uh, prior um, one of frame uh, project. So all of us and I, I, I invite all of you to go to the Ulu, uh, Ulu Tampik waterfall. Okay. So back to our business. So research objective. So by assigning money, monetary value again to the biodiversity, it allows the, the benefit associated with diversity to directly compare with economic value of alternative option. Okay, so this evidence will assist in formulation of policy that protect biodiversity. So in 2021, which is last year during COVID, okay, a case study was conducted at Ulu Moda to estimate economic value. Uh, so this economic value will provide information, especially to the forest manager and also stakeholder in the government or private sector to improve sustainable forest management and assist the conservation of biodiversity for the benefit and also future generation. Okay, this is the real photo of uh, Ulu Moda. Okay. So uh, since yesterday, all of you have heard about the Ulu Moda, Ulu Moda and Ulu Moda. So again, I will recap and also glance through a bit more about Ulu Moda. So the core of biodiversity in Malaysia is located at its tropical rainforest. So Ulu Moda is one of the uh, one of the core of biodiversity, where it, where it's, it is actually a natural heritage of one. Um, why is that? Okay. So Ulu Moda Forest Reserve supply water to three important lakes and dams um, at Paddy Field, at Kedah, and also Perlis. So uh, Ulu Muda Forest Reserve consists of more than 450 species of flora, uh, at least 50%, uh, 56 species of medicinal plants uh, used by the local community. Okay, so uh, later at the end of at the evening of the uh, of the seminar, uh, Arif Fahmi will present more about this. Okay, so uh, Ulu Muda Forest Reserve also <laughs> listed as top 10 ecotourism destination under uh, natural, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, under National Ecotourism Plan 2016 and 2035. So this is the Ulu Muda. You go, this is Kedah map, which is uh, Miss Lakawi here. Okay, so we see the big portion of the Ulu Muda uh, at uh, Forest Reserve at uh, Kedah. So this will be the methodology. So we just glance through. I'll try to explain in a layman, layman term. Okay, so biodiversity is the is one of the environmental goods and services provided by forest ecosystem. And unlike timber, these uh, services does not have price as not traded in the market. It's not as simple as we, we go to uh, we go to the market and uh, and buy fish. You know, we, if we go to the market, uh, market, we buy fish, you got price. So biodiversity doesn't doesn't have price doesn't have price tag. So through the economic uh, environmental tools, we give a value, we give price uh, to these services. So let's us recap also. This is uh, this diagram is already presented by Prof Awang, where biodiversity is located here. At the non-use value, under the existence value, this is the biodiversity. So there are various ways. Uh, there are various ways for us uh, to value or to evaluate the environmental services uh, such as uh, biodiversity. So CVM is the only uh, contingent valuation method or CVM is uh, the only valuation technique that capable of capturing all those benefits, including all this value. So this is clearly shown that uh, biodiversity conservation uh, can be assessed through CVM. Okay, so CVM, so I give you this is the the concept conceptual uh, on how CVM is conducted. So so we can see here. So this is a theoretical scenario. So we have to ask the, our respondent uh, and and present it to them. So if the Ulu Muda Forest was as, was to be established for the conservation of biodiversity, are you willing to contribute? Again, uh, again, like I said just now, people are willing to pay hundreds uh, to go to San Lagoon, right? People are willing to pay thousands to go to the Legoland. So how about Ulu Muda? Okay, so this is how uh, the conceptual where we uh, we apply uh, dichotomous choice, dichotomous choice with uh, five different bits. So the first bit, uh, we are going to present all these uh, five bits, and the set follow-up bits, we, we will present the higher bits. For example, if we ask the first bit of uh, RM10 ringgit, 
So if the respondent are willing to pay 10 ringgit for ulu muda, so we higher up the bid, how about 30 ringgit? So 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 on uh, until the 80 ringgit lah. So sampling design, okay. Sampling design is a very, a very crucial, very crucial, uh, very crucial steps in this uh, study, where, okay, where uh, sampling design will will determine, uh, uh, will determine which target group, which population, uh, which suitable respondent we we have to collect the data. So, uh, thank you again to the Department of Statistics Malaysia. Uh, for assisting us uh, in in doing in conducting the uh, sampling design, so all these maps uh, is uh, provided by uh, Dozum. Okay, same with the sample size. Okay, sample size also is uh, sample size also provided and assisted by Dozum, where uh, they calculated already uh, for for one kedah. We have to collect 86 uh, sampling blocks, which each block have 12 samples uh, scattered through Kedah, including Langkawi, um, which is uh, the parameter adopted in determination of the samples is based on strata, whether it's uh, located at rural area, urban area, or suburban area. So a total of 1,032 samples were successfully interviewed. Okay, so we go to the result. Okay, so for the social demographic background, out of uh, 1,032 respondents, almost half of the respondent is female, which age range to 18 to, I'm sorry, it's not 780 years old, it's actually 80 years old, okay, with average mean of 47, uh, 47 years old and more of 35 years old. So, uh, how about the profession? So there are three categories of profession, uh, which is the first one is employed, self-employed and unemployed, where the highest, which is um, the highest is employed, which is people receive, a respondent receive uh, wages uh, from uh, the, their employee. So followed by self-employed and also unemployed. Okay, the average monthly gross income of respondents is around 1,800 per month with more of uh, 100, 500, uh, 1,500 per month. So this result shows that income as the income increase, the number of respondent declines. Okay, so we go to the education and background. For 80% of the respondent receive higher education until the secondary schools, where the highest number uh, is the secondary school, which is uh, SPM, okay? This uh, around 56.7%. So these findings is in line with the Malaysian rural, Malaysian rural education, which is at the highest education for Malaysian is uh, up until secondary schools. However, there, there are also uh, respondent does not receive any formal education, about 2.7%. Okay, so this is the basic information uh, that we collect uh, related to the forest. So a bit surprising, so we go through together. Okay, so uh, we asked the respondent uh, whether uh, they, they involve uh, in forest or any, any related activities related to the forest. So surprisingly, only 67.6% of respondents uh, involved in the forest and its related activities. It's related activities, uh, including picnics, including we go to camping, including we go to job work and so on. Uh. Okay, so uh, out of total of that, 76% familiar with the permanent reserve forest. Permanent reserve forest is a term uh, used uh, for the forest, uh, manage and conserve by the forestry department. Okay, because Ulu Muda Forest Reserve is under jurisdiction of Forestry Department, so we only focus on the permanent reserve forest. Okay, surprisingly, 76% of the respondent knew about the permanent reserve forest. However, only 66% involved in the forest. So that's me. Although the respondent does not involve in this in this uh, in the forest related activities, but they know about the existence of the forest reserve, uh, permanent reserve forest. Okay, so we asked about, uh, we asked 76% uh, of this uh, respondent, uh, have you ever visited 
uh, those uh, PRF. So 56% of them uh, visited uh, permanent reserve forest around Malaysia for at least once in their lifetime. So surprisingly again, only 55% of uh, our samples ever visited a permanent reserve forest. Okay. Permanent reserve forest also including the hutan lipo, taman eco rimba, taman hutan negeri, and so on. Okay, so next, okay, forty-five percent knew the existence of ulu muda forest reserve. So out of total one thousand and thirty-two respondent, okay, less than half knew the existence of ulu muda forest reserve. Okay, so is it good? Is it not good? Okay. So the level of public awareness on the existence of Ulu Muda a bit lower than expected. Okay, since why? Why? Because since Ulu Muda is the main water supply uh, for Kedah, Perlis and also Penang. Okay, so for various purposes, especially for domestic use. Okay, so quite surprising because uh, uh, a resident at Kedah doesn't even know about the Ulu Muda. Doesn't even know that the water the tap water that you, they use in their house is originally from the Ulu Muda. Okay? Okay, so for next, 17.3% only visited Ulu Muda Forest Reserve. Okay? So very quite low, okay? 45% uh, uh, know the, knew the uh, existence and only 17% ever visited Ulu Muda. Okay? Because why? Because Ulu Muda is listed as top 10 of ecotourism, ecotourism destination in Malaysia. But surprisingly, people at Kedah, resident of Kedah, only 17% ever visited. So here I suggest that awareness program, especially SEPA, communication, education, and public awareness should be conducted to increase the awareness and, the, and acknowledge the Kedah residents, uh, especially Kedah residents, about the importance and the services of, or even the existence of the Ulu Muda itself. Okay, so this will be the perception. So, uh, a respondent were asked to rate a uh, scale from one, which is not important, to five, uh, very important, on their perception on the importance of biodiversity conservation. So, the highest, uh, the highest uh, attribute that uh, score is the flora and fauna. So, which is quite good, and also the least is the heritage and also the cultural. But still yet uh, in range of important, lah, which is called 4.10. Okay, so we come back again to the economic side, to the economic valuation. Okay, so for this study, uh, this will be the formula. This will be the explanatory variables that, uh, that we are using uh, in, determine, in determine the economic value or in determine the, the uh, willingness to pay of the respondents. So, include, which is including frequency of visit, age, uh, educational, income, uh, and so on. Okay, another two minutes, I'll rush up. So, this is just a glance through of that. Okay, uh, and as it show that, uh, 75, uh, sorry, 75.3% of respondents interviewed were willing to contribute to the conserving biodiversity through the annual conservation fund. Okay which is the range between 5 ringgit to 100 ringgit uh, annually and the average level of w, uh, willingness to pay is around 42.60 ringgit annual so these two uh, logistic also log logistic models uh, were used uh, to estimate the economic value so so this will be the economy uh, this will be the main finding so the results show the differences between the mean and median uh, for different models so logistic models uh, slightly higher, which is around 87.90 uh, cents annually, they are willing to contribute uh, compared to log logistic around 52.6 uh, cents. Okay, so uh, we convert we convert the willingness to pay, we aggregate the value to get the value, uh, the total value of the uh, biodiversity at Ulu Muda. Okay. So the yearly calculated conservation value uh, or benefit of Ulu Muda Forest, uh, Ulu Muda Forest Reserve Biodiversity uh, is range uh, between 25.5 million uh, up to 42.7 uh, million. So if there is any proposal to charge or to contribute uh, to, co to biodiversity conservation, the maximum amount will be 87.90 cents annually. 
So this value can be used uh, by the Ulumulu Forest Reserve uh, Authorities, manager or conservator, to determine the fee conservation and appropriate uh, appropriate value for conservation. So there are there are some of recommendation that I suggest in this study, which the first one is the forest beyond timber, which is this value can be used as a guide for forest manager to create new or alternative option of utilization of Ulumudu Forest Reserve Ecosystem Services, which in line with a national aspiration of forest beyond timbers. Okay. So I'll since already, so I go to straight to the conclusion. So uh, pub public uh, place greater interest and willingness to pay for conserving biodiversity at Ulumudu Forest Reserve Kedah. So it's noted that respondents were only willing to pay uh, if there is an improvement of biodiversity and we are doing the conservation for it. Okay. So the most significant implication of this study concern uh, the economic cons uh, the conservation fee and new financing mechanism for Ulumudu Forest Reserve, such as payment for ecosystem services, which can be further explored and also implemented where appropriate for the benefit of uh, present and future generation. So I would like to thank the Forest Department, Free uh, State uh, of Kedah, and also Rancangan Malaysia ke-12. Okay, with that, I say thank you. Thank you. Thank for the presentation. Now I invite if there are any questions from the audience. Any question in the Zoom or in this auditorium? Okay. 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 Prof, mari sini dengan saya sebelah. Uh, so you actually just now uh, you use the the what the system from the dorsal to get the prospect respondents to interview. Right? So can you explain to us what actually those uh, provide to you that, and in what sense you are very sure that those data or those respondents can represent the population of uh, your, uh, your, what, your, your school of study so that you can, you can aggregate the data? That's my question. Okay, uh, thank you Dr. Bhakti for a very um, nice question. Okay. Uh, I'm afraid today there is no uh, wakil from Dozum. Uh, yesterday we got wakil from Dozum. Okay, uh, actually, uh, Dozum, uh, there's about two questions there, right? The first one, what uh, Dozum provide us? Okay, so Dozum provide us uh, the list and also the maps of a selected respondent. So this list and also selected respondent is very specific. They got uh, their list of address, names, location of the house, even sometimes the uh, location, uh, GPS location of uh, the sampling point. Okay, so this for the second question, how how we are sure that uh, Dozum provide um, the uh, the correct or the the good amount of uh, the good amount of uh, sample because as we know Dozum is uh, Dozum collected data on uh, on on uh, residents or on population of Malaysia okay jabatan perangkaan Malaysia okay uh, they provide uh, us uh, with few options actually with few options where we are having a very nice meeting with them we explain and we brief to them uh, about our intention our objective of study uh, what we expect and they they suggest to us few options on on how uh, on how the sampling design uh, will be uh, conducted. So um, after, after two weeks communication and so on, so we finally decide uh, that the best way uh, and the best way and also the best samples and also sample size uh, for that. 
So it's just not that simply we ask uh, Dozen to, to make sampling for us without any, uh, any consultation from the project side. So we both uh, free men also Dozen. Um, we have gone through a few meetings uh, to make sure uh, the data and the sample that we are collect is, uh, is sufficient and also represent, representative uh, the Kedah resident itself. Because uh, usually if the data is available, right? So we try to report uh, the sample data and the census data. Right? Yeah. So we see so whether these two data, two columns is different or not. Right? So we try to our best, at least for our our sample data, sample result is close to the census data. Yes. Sample and census data. And so if the data is available, if not, it's okay. Yeah. And then I think the paper is very good. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Any, any other questions? Okay. <laughs> so the question is two. What is so, the challenges upon collecting the survey or respondents? Yes, yeah, this is a very crucial part. This is the, the, the very challenging part, which is uh collecting the data. Okay. As we know, we are collecting the data during COVID, right? During pandemic, uh, when all of you rested at house. I'm sorry, it's not rested. Oh. You're working from home. But we, Prim, uh, we are working on ground, okay? Uh, so there, is a, there are a few challenges, uh, especially in, in finding uh, the sample itself. Because uh, not all uh, maps or location uh, provided by DOZM, uh is updated uh sometimes the maps is still in 2010 right uh, 2010 but uh there is also a map which is uh, very updated which is uh draw uh, beautifully digitized and there there is uh that's the main challenges which is the finding the house itself uh, in order for us to get uh, to survey the respondent, which is depends on uh, our enumerated skills actually. So uh, before we conduct a survey, house to house survey, uh, we actually do some trainings, uh, some trainings for our enumerator. So for them uh, to get the skill, the communication skill, how how they how they wants to communicate and how they want to persuade uh, the respondent uh, to answer our question and to involve and participate in the uh, in the interview session itself. Huh? Okay, am I answering your question, Muhammad Ikma Su? Ah, oh, sorry, it's not full there. I believe that yours, uh, okay. Thank you, okay. Fazila Musa. Thank you, uh, I'm sorry, I, I cannot allow more for okay. any question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Pan Muprima. Uh, let us all, one again, give a round of applause to Pan Muprima. Now, I would like to invite the second, present, uh, second speaker for today. He is uh, Mr. Kaviarasu Munian. He will present a presentation titled Fish, Fishes in Rivers and Lake of Ulumuda Forest Reserve, Assessment on its Diversity and Abundance. Uh, allow me to introduce him. Uh, Mr. Kavi is a research officer at Zoology Branch Queen. He received a BSc in Biology from University Putra Malaysia in 2008 and an MSc in Genetics and Genomics in 2015 from University Malaya. Currently, he is undergoing his PhD studies at University Tun Hussein On, UTHM, uh, since 2020. And uh, his experience is very, uh, he's a project leader and co researcher in more than five research projects related to fauna, diversity, and conservation. Published a number of journals, technical reports, semi technical reports, articles, new letters related to biodiversity and conservation. Now I invite Mr. Kavi, the floor is yours. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Nasi, for such a long introduction of my occurring on all my uh, publications. Uh, I think it's no need now about that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, good morning. Sama uh, sejahtera to everyone, uh, those in the auditorium and also in Zoom and Facebook Live. Is it right? Yeah, all right. So uh, yesterday, we was, um, Mr. Shafiz was talking on the vertebrates, uh, traditional vertebrates in Hulu Muda for a reason. And today morning, I'll be presenting on uh, another uh, vertebrates, which is equally important as the traditional uh, vertebrates. Uh, that is freshwater fish. Okay, fishes in rivers and lake of Ulumuda for a reserve assessment on diversity and abundance. So this is the work that my team and myself did in Ulumuda for a reserve. All right. All right. Okay. So okay, we back to our standard six. We know that. Um, our earth is covered with uh, almost 70% of water, okay? So this 70% of water, how much of this 70% of water is filled with fresh water, the water that we drink? Uh, so studies says that uh, it's only about 0.01% is actually filled with fresh water. And the habitat, the fresh water habitat uh, that covers our earth is about 0.8%. So if you see the figure is very, very small, but in aspect of the functional of freshwater ecosystems, it's very huge, right? So similarly to the forest, what is happening uh, with current developments and also globalization happening in all over the world, uh, actually it's pushed the uh, freshwater ecosystem uh, under threat, right? So study shows that the rate of wetland loss is about three times uh, of that uh, forest loss. And also the same time, the vertebrates in freshwater ecosystem are declining twice the rate of uh, declension involving land or ocean vertebrates. So freshwater ecosystem or freshwater habitat such as like river and lakes, a uh, rich ecosystem with, uh, with a very huge functions. They provide us uh, like a water supply, irrigation for agriculture, uh, mode of uh, transportation, um, source for food, fish, right? Uh, so generate power, electricity through uh, hydro dams and also water uses for industry. Not us for to forget that this freshwater habitat or ecosystem actually uh, provide a habitat, natural habitat to riverine and aquatic uh, flora and fauna, including the freshwater fish, right? So talking on the freshwater fish, it is uh, one of the important component for uh, freshwater ecosystem or uh, freshwater habitat. And also, it's also uh, one of the important economic sectors for, uh, for like, uh, such as like uh, inland fisheries. But current study shows that uh, almost 76, 76 of freshwater fish species that are found in Malaysia actually is currently under threat. So because of uh, various factors such as like uh, habitat loss, uh, uh, habitat disruptions, uh, pollution, and extra. So when my team, myself and my team was doing the research in Ulumuda for a reserve, we found out that uh, one of the main economic uh, activities that are being conducted in Ulumuda is uh, inland fisheries, takat ikan lah, nelayan, right? So uh, this is because we know that uh, Ulumuda for a reserve have a very huge network of river systems. And also these river systems actually fit into the uh, Tasimuda. So it's actually provide very good habitat for fish uh, population and uh, ground for spawning. So it directly it gives uh, the locals uh, a venue for them to generate income, right? So through inland fisheries activity. So it is vital for us, uh, what I say, to assess, to study the fish uh, that found in Ulumuda for a reserve and its lake uh, for us to uh, to what to monitor to determine the continuity of the fish diversity and also the uh, the population that exists within these ecosystems. 
So we done. Uh, so we carry out our system, our study uh, in Ulu model based on two main objectives. Uh, the first objective is to assess the diversity of freshwater fish, and second is to determine the burden of freshwater fish in model lake uh, Tasay model based on catch per unit effort. So this is the map. Uh, map of uh, where the study was conducted. Uh, we selected several uh, rivers and also the Tasi model to conduct the study. Uh, the assessments was done uh, based on two different methods, uh, based on two different habitat, river and lake, right? So we, we apply a different method for the river and also a different method for lake. So for the river, we uh, actually we selected eight. We managed to assess for eight rivers that flow that exist within the Ulumuda Boral Reserve. So what we did is we established a 200 meter of uh, trunk line track for each river where we use an equipment called uh, atrofisher. It's a, a equipment that we use to stun, to immobilize the fish and easy to collect the fish. Lah. So it's not a susah kita nak tangkap ikan tu, right? So, so we use a, a, a backpack to fisher and uh, we done the sampling for duration, standardized uh, duration for one hour and at the standardized wattage because the atrofisher is uh, back with, I mean, power with at battery, all right? So all the fish that we start to collect, we kept in the pail before we uh, examine, measure them, photograph them. So, and also we identify up to the species level using the current reference. Uh, uh, for both river and lake, we actually, we conducted about uh, three sampling sessions. We only managed to, uh, uh, what say, we conduct the research uh, sampling from September last year until February of 2022. So for, <clears throat> As for lake, what we did was uh, we sectioned the lake into three, section A, B, and C. So each section, we deployed about uh, five uh, gill nets, jari ikan. So we placed randomly around the each section and let the net in uh, like about 36 hours. And we checked the net twice a day. So similarly, we, uh, we checked the net, uh, take out the fish, the, from the net, uh, we identify, we measure, and photograph. So, uh, so that is for the sampling, right? Okay, for statistic analysis, to answer the two objectives of this study, so what we, uh, uh, diversity, the first objective is diversity. So we uh, run some statistic analysis uh, where we uh, calculate the species richness and also uh, we calculate on the diversity indexes. So for second objective, to determine the abundance of fish or the fish stock in the Tasty Moodle. So what we did is we, uh, we uh, measured the uh, uh, method uh, based on catch per unit effort. It is an alternative to infer uh, abundance of the fish stock. So the formula is very uh, simple. Uh, it's a total catch, total fish catch we caught. Uh, divided by the effort uh, that we put to catch the fish and also the number of the nets that we placed. Okay, uh, result and discussions. So firstly, we talk on the species richness. So a uh, total of 553 individuals we managed to collect from both habitat, lakes and from the lake and also from the river, the eight rivers, which comprise of 44 species and belongs to 24 families. So uh, we managed to, uh, about 37 species were recorded from the river, for river, the eight rivers, while, all, uh, while in lake we identified about 20 species. So in total, we have about 63 species um, for our freshwater fish that found within Ulu Motor Forest ecosystems or forest reserve. All right, so this is the figure is a compilation of previous studies done uh, by many researchers. And uh, yeah, there is uh, currently the, the figure is 63 species found within Ulu Buddha for a reason. 
Okay, uh, talking on the species compositions. Okay, if you can see, uh, I don't know how to show in the slide. So because I want to, all right. Uh, I think you can see if the first picture. Okay, those in the zoom and live, the first picture is the uh, ikat kawan. Uh, so we call kawan locally called kawan. Uh, this is the most abundant fish that we recorded in the Ulu Muda, followed by ikan cemperat, the second one. So, and last one is the ikan sial. All right. So, about yeah. ikan sial, sia siam, sia siam, sia. S R A sia. So, bila <laughs> so bila kita dapat ikan sia ni kita satu semua sia sia je semua ni dapat. Sia 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 sia. S I L S I A. K S I A. Tadi bukan sia sia. Jangan sia. Local community panggil dia tu bunyi macam tahu lah kan dia sangat siar kan? Ah, siar. Oh, dia panggil siar. Kalau macam-macam tadi, macam dia, macam dia frust kan? Ya, <laughs> siar-siar <laughs> je kita dapat. Oh, something okay. like that. Uh, so, you, uh, so it's local name lah. But it's okay. commonly called. Ikan siar lah, siar. So, right. so, uh, so uh, that's the most abundance. The three most abundant species that we collected. And uh, about five species, uh, these uh, these macaulotus or uh, squirrels, Japanese and this one of these the ikan catfish baung lah, the meteos uh, catenus. It's only uh, the, the this is the least uh, species that we recorded with only a single individual lah, All right. Okay. Uh, one. Uh, this one. So let's see. This is lampang jawa. Asalnya semua orang makan, kena makan, ya, yeah. okay. So this is ikan lampan jawa. It's actually it's not our local species. It's being introduced. It's being introduced uh, by our fisheries department also. Uh, yes, uh, for uh, purpose for inland fisheries. So, uh, uh, so uh, actually it's being introduced throughout the, our country. So that's why we can find in in nature habitat also for uh, uh, fish day purposes. So followed by with the uh, ini. Uh, Lapang sungai, so lapang sungai ini hantar semua orang tahu lah, right? So sedap ikan ini. So lapang sungai, and is the the third one is the ikan kelapia lah. So ini pun ikan kelapia pun is an introduced species, right? So this uh and also uh another one is the gurumi. Gurumi is ikan kalung. So these four species actually only found in lake. We didn't found any of this individual in river. So I don't know why I don't know where this fish went for spawning or what. So maybe we have to find further research on the distribution of these four species. So from from the lake itself, we managed to collect about 400, uh, 407 species. All right. So for answer for diversity, so we uh, we conduct uh, we uh, we run analysis diversity indexes uh, like uh, Channel Winner, uh, Simpsons, and uh, and uh, Megalith index. So if you see the 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 graph, the box plot uh, on the left, uh, so it shows that the lake, I mean the river, have higher diversity compared to the lake, the fish, right? So. Um, this is because uh, uh, there's a several factors that influence uh, why the lake have uh, lower diversity. Uh, yeah, when we are doing this research, uh, uh, the time effort, the time that we put is very limited. Um, mm -hmm. So we already done uh, carry out about three sampling sessions, so it might influence the, the the result. And same time also when we was conducting the we putting the net right, so the water was very high, so it, it influenced the catch rate. So I think it's sangat susah nak kita dapat ikan. Biasanya kalau air surut tu uh, memang jari tu penuh lah tu dengan ikan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so so unfortunately when we was carry out the uh, study, uh, the water tide was quite high. So tak dapat. Tapi kita orang pun pening macam mana dapat saya ikut dua di dalam jari ini. So uh, yeah. So this is this is our, one of the factors that influence this this result. Alright. So Okay, for then. Ah, you sorry. Okay, so uh, uh, to answer uh, for the second objective to infer to determine the uh, the diet the of freshwater fish, 
uh, as I say, we uh, adopt, uh, we use the method catch per unit effort. So uh, if you see, uh, we from the lake itself, the species, the 20 species that we caught from the lake, we selected three species, uh, which is more common at the commercial value. Uh, they are first is the Casabarau. So I think uh, I think it's Casabarau. I think uh, people, some people we know how the Casabarau, one of the best delicious fish, freshwater fish, uh, after Kelala, right? Uh, so Sabarau, Tilapia, and Lapa Sungai. So based on the CPU value. We managed to record about 0 0.13 kilogram per hour per unit. So, and followed by ikan tilapia, uh, 0 0.09 kilogram per hour per unit. And the, the least one was lapang sungai, about 0 0.02 uh, kilogram per hour per unit. So, um, I like to uh, stress out here uh, the, the, the result that I'm, we are presenting here is, um, is very preliminary uh, because. Uh, for us to really to capture this value, the CPU value, we should uh, should carry out this study uh, throughout the year. We have to uh, we have a very long monitoring period so that we can get the uh, the actual uh, the actual uh, the CPU value. All right. So because the what the the value that we presented here is very very low. So we are expecting that uh, the, even for the Sabara, or, yeah, especially for the tilapia, I expect tilapia will be most the most abundant species in, in uh, Moodle Lake, Tasi Moodle. Uh, so it's that's the uh, as I say, yeah, the factors uh, that influence this result is what is the time, uh, the time is very short time of monitoring. But we can use this uh, this CPU value to monitor the fish stock or, or the abundance in the fish in the lake. So let's say we done a, a, a year of sampling, a year of monitoring, and get the value of CPU e value, mm. and the previous, and then we carry out another the next year. If the value drop, and it indicate that the population are declining. So when did we at this indication, then we can immediately can introduce some mitigations, like we can restock the fish, uh, select the fish in the lake, or maybe we can control the harvesting in this uh, tasi mudu. We can uh, control them so that we can make sure that the population within the tasi mudu is stable. Mm -hmm. So we want something is sustainable. We don't want sekali tak satu tahun, tahun kedua, ketiga dah tutup dah. Tak ada tadi ikan pula dalam tasi, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to so to this, this is very what well, I say. This is very simple and uh, if uh, it's a cost effective lah. Uh, unlike the other method that gunakan solar to monitor the population and the fish stock, which is very very expensive. So so we, is we need some indications. Okay, ta, population ikan kat sungai kat tasi ni okay ta. So we need to have some indications. So this CPU value we help us on that. Okay, this is the yang saya yang orang kami those who are, don't uh, don't know what is sebarau ikan sebarau. Uh, that's it. This is ikan sebarau uh, ikan lapia and lapang sungai lah. Alright. So so let me conclude. So diversity of fish, the fish in river rivers and wooded lake of uh, Ulu Muda Forest Reserve is considerably moderate to high. So we are expecting more species to be discovered with more proper and systematic sampling in future, right? Then the result that presented here is actually, as I said, this is a preliminary result. We need to carry out the monitoring, a long-term monitoring so that we keep on monitor on this one. It's just not that kita pergi uh, takap je, keep on takap je tanpa kita monitor. So kita want, we want a sustainable uh, inland fisheries. So we have to introduce uh, several mitigations uh, so that to ensure the stable, the population uh, remains stable. So uh, say, as I said, the, for the CPU, C, CPU E value, so we should conduct the study throughout the year and use this, this value as an indication uh, on the population stability. All right. So, uh, all right. Uh, this is several some of the fish that we uh, we collected. All right. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kavi, for the very nice presentation.
Now I invite the there is any questions from the audience or in the Zoom. There's question in Zoom. Do you have any comparison about the catch between the rivers? Which river has higher richness? Uh, okay. Mr. Tan or Ms. Tan, I don't know. Uh, for this study, we haven't yet uh, we compared between the rivers. What we did was we uh, we make uh, we lump all the rivers uh, as a one ecosystem and come up with the species diversity. Um, but for sure, we can do a comparison between the rivers. Um, However, for my result, I can say the differences is not so significant. Uh, the differences is like uh, different in uh, two or three species only. So, uh, so as a, as as whole, the the river system we we analyze is as a whole uh, river system and separate to the lake. I hope I answered the question. Uh, Kavi. Hi. Yeah. Um, actually, we have a, a yes, yes. No. Um, for the uh, what what value do you uh, CPU uh, CPU uh, value? Is it different for the whole season? I mean, the dry season, the wet. Season. Yes. Ideally, we should uh, conduct the study or I mean to answer the abundance based on the CPU value. We should run. The sampling throughout the year so that we get the, uh, at a different season at a different time so because we have very uh, uh, although we don't have the four seasons like a temperate country but we are being uh, have two two major seasons we have a dry and raining seasons so when the raining season is uh, for sure is we influence the diversity we influence the abundance of the fish so for us to get the proper uh, a solid value of a CPU value. Uh, the sampling should be done uh, throughout the this uh, throughout the year, right? Uh, for sure, uh, is uh, we can't keep on doing sampling, keep on years and year year after year. But uh, at least we have a, a, a significant effort that we can uh, can use the CPU value to monitor as an indicator. For population stability in the lake. Kau mau saya answer for you? Yes, thank you. Ikan tu, ikan yang banyak banyak tu masak siapa? Ikan banyak banyak tu kita masuk uh, ada yang kita lepaskan, ada yang kita jadikan jeruk. Uh, ini kesimpulan lah. Uh, we jadikan uh, kesimpulan. And some, itu tak boleh declare lah, takkan kita nak cakap tak lagi kan. Ada yang memang ada yang masuk kat kuali. Uh, so, so because uh, we cannot take a lot of specimen, right? So sometimes ada yang jaring-jaring tu yang kita sangkut tu banyak pula. So kita dermakanlah kepada orang-orang yang kita kita share, kita kongsi bersama-sama. Ya. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> any questions? Okay. Any of four introduced species considered invasive alien species? Uh, uh, Seb, Dr. Seb. <laughs> okay, Dr. Seb. Uh, so for uh, for this species, uh, the four species uh, actually, we for my finding we have uh, ikan lampan jawa, which is, is already uh, normalized in our nature. I can say same goes for the tilapia. Uh, so far, uh, I found that the the occurrence of these introduced species, also our native species, uh, remain stable. Uh, we are still we can get a very good numbers of our local species uh, so so i can say uh, not really invasive but uh, uh, it, this is from the study based on this current study but if we do a proper uh, research for sure we can answer is it this invasive actually overtaking our our local species or not dr Samuel, do i answer your question doctor and yeah, the last question from Hayat, uh, last question. Yeah, to sedap dah. Oh, ikan siap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, on your project, yeah, the lack of that. Yes. Magalhães. Simpsons and Shannon. 
what do you do with the, the diversity? Do you uh, say they actually they uh, uh set the okay uh for sure this limited time la, I didn't explain further for sure. Shannon is reflect to uh more to uh, uh the common species how the common species being distributed in one so that index Shannon uh, uh while whereas for the Simpsons is more to uh, rare species and megalith is more to the diversity itself la. so each indexes have their own calculations and also the definitions. So, but it's actually reflect on the diversity itself. We can uh, sum or we can assume the diversity or reflecting on the diversity. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kavi. Let us all one again giving a round of applause to Mr. Kavi Rasulmanian. Thank, okay, thank you, Kavi. Okay, we have reached uh, to the last speakers for this habitat and wildlife session. With that now, I invite Mr. Elang Kumaran Satya Siwan from WWF Malaysia. He will present a, a paper entitled Conservation of Ulumuda Forest Complex, a brief sharing of past studies and the way forward for its pro protection. Allow me to introduce him. Currently, Mr. Elan Kumaran is a Pro Protected Areas Manager, WWF Malaysia. Uh, and for his education, he has got his BSc in Conservation Biology from University of Malaysia, Sabah in 2009. And, must, uh, and Master MSc in Zoology from University of Science Malaysia in 2019. He is a passionate conservationist with uh, 13 years of experience working on large mammals and protected areas. Uh, he is possessing a successful academic and conservation work record and I started as a wildlife biologist with WWF Malaysia in 2009 as one of the pioneers for the first large scale Malayan tiger study in the Belum Temenggo landscape. Without further ado, the floor is yours, Mr. Elang Kumaran. Thank you very much for the introduction, Doctor. Yeah. And a very good morning to all, especially uh, distinguished guests, uh, fellow speakers, as well as those joining us uh, online. Before I begin, I would like to uh, thank the organizer, Prim, for inviting WWF Malaysia uh, to this conference, as well as to provide uh, a slot for our presentation. And um, the title of my presentation is Conservation of Ulumuda forest complex, a brief sharing of past studies and the way forward for its protection. So this is the content of my presentation. So Ulumuda forest complex is located in Kedah. And as you can see in the map, uh, those green patches are the forest reserves and the area within the purple outline is Ulumuda forest complex. Uh, when we say Ulumuda Forest Complex, actually it's not an official term. Uh, that we refer to a landscape comprised of eight different forest reserves, which are uh, Ulumuda Forest Reserve, Bukit Sayang Forest Reserve, Ulumuda Tamahan Forest Reserve, Tubak Kecil, Tubak Besar, Perdu, Parang Terap, and Bukit Keramat. So as you can see, it's not practical to refer to the whole landscape by mentioning all the names all the time. So we use the term Ulumuda Forest Complex which is not an official term, but still it makes it easy for us to refer to this landscape. And in this area, there are three dams. Uh, these are Moda Dam, uh, Perdu Dam, and Anning Dam. So the existence and the investment that go, goes into this dam actually shows the importance of this area in terms of uh, water provisioning service. 
this this forex is not only important for people in Kedah, but also uh, people in Penang and Perlis. It supplies water to uh, various sectors, uh, including domestic agriculture as well as uh, uh, industry and services. It is also part of CFS uh, area. This photo I took at Moda Lake in January 2020. So um, this was during a dry season and where the capacity of the lake, uh, the water level went down to just 7.5% from its capacity. So this allows us to track in much of the area which usually inundated with water, but now we can track. Lah. So that shows how dry it can get in, in, in Ulubuda. So that brings us to the point about the climate change. Study from Naharim shows that um, there will be extreme weather events in Qatar. And this, this highlights the importance of keeping our forest intact because uh, it, it brings that, it, it shows, uh, it will make the ecosystem to be resilient as well as allow us to continue to have the services from the ecosystem. Another study also shows that reduction in vegetation uh, caused Qatar's surface temperature, the land surface temperature to rise. So the converse is uh, keeping the vegetation intact help to uh, make the ecosystem more resilient and in, in some way mitigate the extreme weather events. And that brings to another issue, which is water provisioning service. And we have studies that shows keeping forests intact, maintain the quality and quantity of the water. And Ulumuda Forest Complex caters about 50% for overall water demand for all sectors, uh, which also includes socio-economy. And Qatar's water security depends on sustainable management of this forest. Another important point is that about 40% of Malaysia's rice production uh, is based on an irrigation scheme that depends on steady water supply from the three dams that harness water provisioning service from Ulumuda Forest Complex. In another word, uh, Ulumuda Forest Complex is important for food security. So it is of natural interest. Not only at national level, Ulumuda Forest Complex, although there are no people living inside of it, uh, surrounding the forest, there are local communities around Kampong, which lives and they live there and they rely on the biodiversity for their livelihood, alternative income, as well as for personal use. So it is also important for, for them. These are the major flood and drought events in Qatar. Uh, the, the columns are in blue color. They are the one, uh, they are the major flood events, whereas the brown color drought events. So the idea here is that we know that the weather is getting more extreme and there are this climate change, change impact are real. So it is important for us to understand and take um, mitigated mitigations in order to for us to face the impacts. It may not be really uh, helpful for us to, to, to blame the extreme weather events in, in the case of any tragic incidents, because we know the information are already out there. So the best way to, to, to deal with this climate change impact, and according to this trend, is to keep our ecosystem intact, and that will help the ecosystem to be more resilient. So our aim and approach um, we aim to protect Ulumuda Forest Complex in accordance with its importance to ecosystem services, especially in terms of water catchment for nation's food security. Apart from a great number of studies, we do a lot of studies. Our approach deals with countless stakeholder engagement involving uh, federal state agencies as well as district authorities. We also make sure that our work always involves local community because we do not want to sideline the local community in our conservation work. When it comes to method, uh, WWF, we, we, we have a WWF project and program management standards. This might be uh, new to, to some of you. So this is the method that we use uh, to guide our work. And there's a tool called uh, Miradi used for this purpose. It involves identification of conservation targets. Uh, we define our goals and objectives and then we identify threats towards our conservation targets. And then we develop strategy and conservation interventions to tackle the, the threats. We get it peer reviewed through workshops and stakeholder engagement. 
And then throughout the process, we evaluate and we do cost correction. Oh, that's a photo from a recent workshop. So in terms of the scope, we, we, we do a lot of studies, try to understand the conservation status, but also trying to, we try to understand from the decision maker's point of view, what are the limitations in setting aside the forest and explore possible conservation intervention and feasible protection status. So summary of selected research findings. These are the list of studies that we have conducted. I have not included um, publications in, in the form of booklets and pamphlets or even coffee table book. Uh, if you look at it, uh, in the first one comes from 1984, which is a proposal of conservation strategy for Kita. Uh, that's the one in the blue cover here. Uh, for this presentation, I'll be sharing studies in green fonts. So the first one is Ulumuda Carbon Stock Assessment, uh, which was done in collaboration with FRIM. And the purpose is to assess the carbon stock in Ulumuda and assess feasibility of RDD uh, mechanism. Uh, the study was done in, uh, with Dr. Hamdan from FRIM, he's here. So I don't want to go too, more, too detail into this because Dr. Hamdan also have a session after this, which <laughs> speaks about this. Here, I'm just presenting the basic findings. The study shows that uh, Ulumuda is, uh, meets the criteria uh, in terms of uh, information that need required uh, for, by the IPCC, and it is feasible for RDD activities in Malaysia. Uh, the findings from this study has been shared with the Kedah and federal state governments uh, in September. Uh, a bit more on the details. So this uh, table here, shows uh, carbon pools. So there's ACD, which is above ground carbon, and then uh, below ground carbon. And then we have the wood, litter, and soil. So there are five carbon pools. Among all the carbon pools, above ground carbon density has the highest uh, carbon among all. And, and in terms of the forest strata, protection and virgin forest has a notable amount of carbon lit in litter and soil. So if you look at it, protection forest, so the litter is 4.4. Whereas for the lot of a forest, although it's more than 30 years, uh, it's still one quarter of it. And it's the same for soil. We have carbon 67.8, but here it's half of it, although it is more than 30 years. So that's an interesting observation. Uh, in terms of the study also managed to establish forest reference emission level, which gives an idea of the, uh, the trend of uh, emission. And this will help us to understand how we can have conservation intervention, which can change that. I would not want to go too detailed into this because we will leave it to the experts. I can see Dr. Hamdan smiling. So the next is from hydrological, hydrological modeling study from Ulumuda. For this, we collaborated with UPM and UMP experts to assess the impact of land use on water quality and quantity. Uh, actually, one of the, the experts is here, uh, Dr. Sofian. He is also having a session after this. So if you have any technical question pertaining to hydrology, I would suggest you to attend the session. <laughs> so the research conclusion is that uh, the study managed to find uh, the water catchment boundary for Ulu Muda Forest Reserve that feeds Muda Reservoir. So that's the one in this red outline. The green color here is Ulu Muda Forest Reserve. So and when we compare it with the when we compare it with the existing uh, gazetted water catchment forest class within Ulumuda Forest Reserve, it is less than the identified area. And we know that the Kedah Forestry Department actually have increased the size of water catchment forest class, but we don't have the latest uh, spatial data, so we can't present it here. Um, but we know that visually, when we look at it, uh, it still does not include the whole of the boundary as identified in this study. In terms of the water yield, Ulumuda Forest Reserve can cater about 50% of water demand for Kedah. And the study shows there will be 13 years expected to have lower water yield than the baseline. The baseline is there. The study also uh, explores different scenarios uh, of land use in relation to water yield. So it looks at 
uh, land clearing scenario, street conservation scenario, reduced impact logging scenario, and forest plantation scenario, uh, where 5% of the area is forest plantation. And it, it shows that street conservation scenario yields the most amount of uh, water compared to other scenario. And this benefit of street conservation is most visible during the dry season. Uh, that means the, the early part of the year. And the study, initial findings of the study suggest that this benefit is related to groundwater recharge. As we can see, this value is much higher for, for street conservation. However, we need to do further study to verify this. And the study also shows existing land use within the Ulumuda forest complex has impacts on water quality and quantity. This graph shows the sediment yield and strict conservation scenario is the one in the green line. You can see it produces the least sediment. Sedimentation is expected to cause the river to be shallow and this is visible in Sungai Muda. Locals observe that rocks which are found in the middle of the river are no longer visible and it are now covered with sediments. This, this one is also from the study that looks at the uh, Sungai Muda before it goes to the lake. Uh, it was is using image comparison analysis and it shows that the rivers are getting more rounded, wider, maybe because of the sedimentation and the color of uh, this multicolor shows excessive sedimentation. This is from another study uh, that talks about uh, which is which is a literature review. Uh, we reviewed and consolidated 81 past studies that cover aspects of fauna, flora, and, and ecosystem services uh, in Ulumuda Forest Complex. Our assessment shows that most of the areas in Ulumuda Forest Complex are under-researched, and especially the area Sungetelian, which is this part. So those black dots are actually camera traps that we set. We set the camera traps there because that's the least researched area. We suspect this is because of inaccessible, uh, the area is inaccessible. So it's difficult for researchers to go in and live inside the forest. Therefore, uh, most of the studies happens, if you see, it's just nearby here, or where the logging roads are. In terms of the uh, difference between studies pertaining to flora and fauna, studies on fauna are much more available, easily available compared to flora. And however, the studies on fauna more or less on checklist. Lah. It is not really a robust study which focuses on population density, occupancy, habitat use, or interspecies interaction. So that robust ecological studies is still miss missing in this area. And we find that this area is rich in biodiversity and important habitat for wildlife. Those are the uh, recent consolidated uh, list of species uh, in our report. So if anyone wants to report, you can contact me later. I have the soft copy. So our assessment also shows, uh, okay, this is uh, some camera photos from Ulumuda that we set. Okay, and we, we find that uh, in, in Ulumuda forest complex, they have, there's no record of Malayan tiger and gull for the past uh, 20 years. Um, so this is a bit worrying. Um, the last record, I think, is from 2003 or 2000, 2003, uh, where it was just a track but there's no records of Malayan tiger or gao, which is Salada in the past 20 years. And there's also human and elephant conflict in this area and subsequent translocation, uh, which may affect human and human population in the area. Lah. And there's no leopards recorded in the area in recent camera trapping studies by WWF Malaysia. We are not saying there's no leopard. All we're saying is that we have not recorded it. Lah. And we know that there are poaching activities here. You can see here people with a gun as well as old bullet cases, this, this guy is carrying a bird cage. Um, also, we have our camera traps being hacked and stolen. We, we, have, we suspect it could be poacher or encroachers. They do not want their activities to be recorded by our camera traps. This is a study that, um, that investigate the ecological connectivity between Ulumuda Forest Complex, which is in blue, blue in color, and, and then Bintang Hijau Forest Complex, the one in the brown color. We find that the ecological connectivity is critically affected. And uh, if we go down to certain corridor, Wada corridor, we find three bottlenecks there. Bottlenecks are basically a constricted small area where both sides of the area 
uh, of the corridor is is either plantation or something else, and only very limited amount of habitat available for, con for which is conducive for wildlife to move. And some of the areas just one hundred meter meters apart. If you focus in the one of the bottleneck bottleneck here, you can see this brown area, right? So there we find this clear felling. So this bottleneck, apart from steep terrain due to road construction and quarrying activity in Perak, uh, the recent clear felling within the Gunungina's Forest Reserve is expected to worsen the connectivity between Ulumuda Forest Complex and Bintang Hijau Forest Complex. So it has here, uh, so it might affect this. So we are afraid that uh, this might affect the terrestrial wildlife movement and may cause Ulumuda Forest Complex to become a forest island by itself. And we know from the Thailand side, this is mostly like plantations. There's one national park here, so Sankalakiri National Park, that area. It's much smaller than Malaysia, uh, than the Ulumuda. And we have some patches of forest here. So next is on ecosystem services and its economic importance. We find that uh, there are limited studies on ecosystem services. And uh, because of that, there's some under, there's, underappreciation of Ulumuda forest complex to the extent that it should be. Uh, but to the extent it should, but there's underappreciation on that. So when we look at it, uh, we understand that perhaps uh, it may, that this, the area is, is important for state, uh, for, for revenue. And uh, perhaps that's one of the reasons that uh, even the existing limited information cannot be fully utilized. And when we compare this area with other biodiversity hotspots in Peninsular Malaysia, we noted that the state's economy is the most important factor in conservation and protection of Ulumuda Forest Complex. So we don't go too detail into this. What we did here was look, compare Ulumuda Forest Complex with other biodiversity hotspots and against that we several factors that we, ex we, we expect to, to, to influence uh, uh, protection, protected areas, uh, establishment of protected areas. I, I would like to bring your attention to just this part. If you look at Ulumuda Forest Complex, it is 17.2% from the size of Qatar. And if you compare that to uh, Royal Bloom State Park, it's just 5.6% from Perak. So we have, in terms of the context, Ulumuda is just so much bigger. So we need to understand what the state tend to lose la, if, if we want to get this way, whole area protected. And also in terms of the state's economic condition, Qatar is the second poorest state among all the other states which already have the, uh, their own protected area. So this gives us a context of why is it, what is the limitation from the decision maker's side? Why, why they, they can't uh, it's difficult for them to protect the whole area or to improve the size of the protection area. So this is a summary of it. The challenge is to how we, how we can change this into opportunity for a particular area to sustainable financing mechanism. So this is a feasible approach and we we trying to explore a feasible approach. We looked at Qatar Development Plan 2035. We can understand Qatar is very clear in terms of the direction they want to uh, make the Negri to become high income state. Uh, it focuses on uh, progressive economic growth, uh, create job opportunity, increase the income of the people, as well as human well being. So, based on that, we capitalize the state's priority on, as, as listed down in the Kedah development, development Plan and craft our strategy and, and plans according to it, as, per, as seen in this box which is to come to look at development of economic justification for the protection. And at the same time, to look at sustainable financing mechanism, which can help the state to find alternative revenue uh, should the state wants to protect some area and also to focus on human well-being. And for this, we, we, we are exploring green financing opportunities for Ulumuda Forest Complex. We are looking at biodiversity offset, payment for ecosystem services, uh, ecological fiscal transfer, how we can help the state to, to, to make the, uh, the case more, more, more important to get maybe a larger chunk of the EFT, as well as to look at carbon market. These are very early stage 
we are in discussion with the Bahagian Perancang Ekonomi Negeri Kedah and we are hoping to get a positive response. But this is at a very early stage, so I will not be able to explore, explain more on this. But the overall idea here is that to help the state to find alternative revenue which can reduce their dependency on uh, extractive activities in Ulmuda Forest Complex. So we understand that the whole forest complex cannot be protected. So it's less likely to get the whole area protected. Maybe some area we can have strict protection area um, and some area conservation and recreation where um, it, is, it is less strict. Um, uh, and, and some area is, which is for community use. Maybe they extract fish or honey from the area. This is similar to what Mr. Hafiz explained yesterday, like the OECMS approach and also sustainable timber uh, production site. And these three areas can, can, be, can qualify or can be explored for carbon credit sites. So this is to give an understanding that um, how, how we can approach in, in terms of protection of Ulumuta forest complex. And we cannot expect the whole area to be protected, lah, especially given the state's economy condition. So I would like to acknowledge our funder for main funder for this, which is CIMB Islamic Bank Berhad, as well as WWF Malaysia donors, as well as um, our, our government stakeholders, uh, Bahagian Perancang Ekonomi Negeri Kedah, Kedah Forestry Department, Lembaga Sumber Air Negeri Kedah, uh, Perhilitan, both federal and state, uh, MADA, uh, Plan Malaysia Kedah, and also the district councils, Padang Terap, Sik, and Bali. Thank you very much. Mr. Aaron Kumara for the very informative presentation. Now I invite uh, if there are any questions from the audience. Can I uh, interject? Yeah, I was very interested in the, I think the last two slides that you talked about PES, you talked about biodiversity offsets. Okay, can you elaborate more? How do you want to implement this biodiversity offset, for example, for Ulumuda? So maybe I, maybe I should have uh, said this in, in, the, in the beginning. Uh, I'm a wildlife biologist. So, so we're working with uh, this, um, this, uh, an entity called Nature Based Solution in Malaysia. Uh, they are the one who has this expertise, and and we are we are working with them in, collabor in collaboration with them uh, And um, so so when it comes to biodiversity offset, uh, I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to explain more on it because it's really not within my field of expertise, um, and it is still at a very exploratory stage. And even in Malaysia, I never heard of any of that mechanism running successfully. So, yeah. Are there examples? You say running successfully. Maybe in in Malaysia, I, I've never heard of any. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's why. Yeah, okay. Any questions? Okay. If not, okay, we can... Let us giving a round of applause. Okay. So, uh, that's the final presentation for this session. Uh, for the conclusion, I can conclude that the habitat and wildlife exploitation and conservation involve various costs and benefits which should all be taken into account to achieve optimal outcome. For this to occur, it will be necessary to develop appropriate economic instrument and incentives. Uh, with that, I end this session three, Habitat and Wildlife, and I hand over the session back to the Pengurusi Matis. Again, thank you, Dr. Mamad Nasir and all the speakers for bringing us to a very interesting and fruitful session this morning. Again, please give a round of applause to all the speakers.
As a thankful gesture, I'd like to invite Yabusa Associate Professor Dr. Bakti Hassan Basri, uh, accompanied by Puan Rohana Abdul Rahman, in front for the Lowe Token of Appreciation. Please welcome Dr. Mohamad Nasi. Next, please, please welcome Puan Mukrima Please welcome Encik Kavya Rasul Munyan. <laughs> Finally, please welcome Encik Elang Kumaran Satya Siwan. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bhakti and Varohana. Before we stop for a break, uh, I'd like to make a, a housekeeping note. Um, to all the participants that haven't registered for today's conference session, uh, you can proceed to registration table or registration counter to scan the QR code. Um, we're going to stop for a break, for tea break, um, and we'll meet again at 10.30 a.m. Um, so have fun and see you again. Let's continue with our conference. We'll continue with session four with the theme regulating services. This session will be moderated by Yamru Zahar and Cik Mahmat Fazil Matisa. Please allow, uh, please allow me to read his short bio. Encik Mohamad Fazil Matesa holds a Bachelor in Mechanical Engineering from Meiji University, Japan, and Master's in Public Management from Korea Development Institute School, South Korea. He has vast experience with expertise in farm mechanization and automation, mechanical engineering, and safety and dam engineering. He now serves as the head of dam management at the Dam Management Water Resource Division, Muda Agricultural Development Authority, Mada. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome our moderator, Encik Mohamad Fazil Madesa. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, Assalamualaikum, very good morning. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for the brief introduction of myself. So I am a dam engineer from MADA. MADA stands for MUDA Agriculture Devel Development Authority. So we bear the name MUDA in our agency's name. So every time people talk about uh, MUDA, Ulu MUDA, we feel anxious, we feel, we feel that we need to get involved with the, with the program. So uh, allow me to continue our session today. So currently we are in uh, session four, regulating services. So we'll continue with our first presenter for, uh, for this session. Uh, Allow me to introduce Mr. Muhammad Azahari Faidi, Research Officer from FRIM. The area of expertise is in remote sensing, geographic information system, and forest, and forest hydrology. So Mr. Muhammad Azahari will be presenting uh, a paper titled Findings of Study on Hydrology in Ulumuda Forest Reserve. So, Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chief. Again, 
for the introduction. Assalamualaikum and very good morning. Uh, my name is Muhammad Azhari Faidi uh, on behalf of uh, my team in hydrology. I uh, will present the finding from our work in Ulumuda. Uh, the title of my presentation is Water Quality Observation in Watershed Area of Ulumuda Profesor. Uh, my project team is uh, Dr. Siti Aisha, Mr. Sajirul, Abizi, Zuraida, Dr. Mariana, uh, Mufif and Rashida. For the introduction, as we know, the water avail availability is essential not only for human consumption, but also is crucial used by the socio-economic activity. So the water uh, quality is depend largely on human activities and uh, nature in the catchment area. So catchment area is an uh, area where the water is collected by its natural surrounding landscape. So the more uh, forest in the watershed, uh, the lower the cost of the water. So as, as a forest uh, proven serves as a natural water filter, it has been directly linked to the drinking water treatment cost. So besides natural and human activities, uh, the characteristic of the catchment area also contribute to the water quality deterioration. So forests naturally control the water cycle by regulating precipitation, evaporation, and uh, water flow. So trees serve as a natural sponge. It's collecting and filtering the rainfall and release it slowly into stream. And it's become most uh, effective land cover for maintenance of the water quality. So the water movement through the forest ecosystem is closely linked to the water quality through the sedimentation and dissolved nutrient in the water during the flow. So the Ulumuda uh, Forest Reserve uh, located in Kadah is an important water catchment area. I think we should wait. Okay. So we apologize for the short interruption. Uh, okay, so to the audience in uh, Zoom and in FB Live, currently we are having uh, small difficulties. Please bear with us. It will take not long. No. But I think I can answer. Can I continue? Can I visit you? Thank you. 
Okay, thank you to the technical team. Okay, okay. please continue, Mr. Okay. Okay. So, the Ulu Muda Forest Reserve uh, is located in Kedah. It's an important water catchment area uh, to supply uh, water, uh, raw water to the Muda Lake. So, this uh, forest reserve divided into two management area. The first one is Ulu Muda Tengah, uh, with uh, the area of 58,000 uh, uh, hectares. And the other one is Ulu Muda Selatan. So Ulu Muda Forest Reserve uh, should be protected as it serves as important water source for the state of Kedah, Perlis, and Penang. Uh, it's not only used uh, for domestic usage, but for the industrial water supply and also water resources for the irrigation. So this forest area uh, with a total of uh, 107,000 hectares, 75% uh, from this area is uh, an important subcashment that supply water directly to the Buddha Lake. So in the forest catchment area, it is natural that the upper stream have a better quality than the downstream due to the sediment loading through the surface runoff. So the quality of the raw water can be identified in terms of its uh, chemical, physical, and the biological uh, parameter. So Department of uh, Environment, DOE, use uh, water quality index to evaluate the status of the river water quality. So a number of water quality parameters, there are six parameters in the uh, WQI uh, that include in the mathematical equation to rate the water quality. So the weight of each of the parameter based on its effective standard and it, it uh, assigned uh, weight indicate that the significant and impact to the sub-index. So this is, this is the water quality index by the Department of uh, Environment. It has been used for about 25 years to serve as a basis for the assessment of water quality. The six parameters that include in water quality index is uh, chemical oxygen demand, diesel oxygen, uh, BOD by chemical oxygen demand, ammonia, uh, potential of hydrogen, pH, and uh, total suspended solid. So this is the sub-index to calculate the water quality index. There are six sub-index based on the six parameter included in water quality index. And this is the water quality index uh, classes from one to five, six, uh, five, because there's a two A and two B. So this is uh, classification is based on, based on the Malaysian National Water Quality Standard. So for class ninety two point seven above, it will be in uh, class one. So this is the use of the water based on their class. For the class one, it practically no treatment required, suitable for very sensitive aquatic plant uh, species. Uh, for the class two A and two B, it uh, required a conventional treatment and also uh, suitable for sensitive species and can be used for recreational activity. Uh, in a class three, it requires uh, incentive treatment for the use of water supply and it can be used for the livestock ranching. Class four for plant irrigation and class five other than those mentioned above and not suitable for, for use. So the objective of this study is to assess the water quality in Ulu Muda Forest Reserve and our expected output is to have a result on the river water quality based on the water quality index. So this is the methodology in our study. We start uh, on the data acquisition, then we map the stream network and catchment. After we have uh, stream network and catchment, we determine the sampling location for, for, this, for the field sampling activity. Then in the field, uh, we divided it into two activities. First, we collect the water sample in the bottle. And 
the uh, direct measurement uh, using the multi-parameter equipment for measure pH and dissolved oxygen. So for, for the water sample that, uh, that we got from field sampling, we bring to lab for the analysis of four remaining uh, water quality index parameter, the chemical oxygen demand, biochemical oxygen demand, ammonia, and total suspended uh, solid. So based on the result, six parameter, we combine and we calculate the water quality index using the equation, the sub-index for uh, water quality index. Then after, after the WKI, we can have the water classes for the sampling data. So this is the data that's been used uh, for the initial planning of our study. We use uh, Sentinel-2 satellite data and digital elevation model with 12.5 meter and we use also the forest uh, reserve boundary. So the EM data has been obtained <coughs> and processed to be used for extraction of the river network and catchment area. So the elevation uh, in our study site is from uh, between 30, 30 meters to 1,200 meters from the mean sea level. So Sentinel-2 data has been used for extracting the lake area in, this, in our study area, the Lake Muda. So and the M data is used for river network extraction. So the Muda Lake is estimated to be 1,300 hectare with 2,200 long of uh, river network for the entire Ulu Muda Forest Reserve. So from the data from the catchment and the river network, we plan our sampling location. So we have a total of about uh, 19 locations involved in water quality sampling around the Muda Lake and also the Ulu Muda Forest Reserve. So for the field sampling, we carry out uh, three times in September 2021, November 2021, and February 2021. So in September, uh, water quality observation and sampling, we carry out at uh, 10 locations in Muda Lake uh, involving Muda River, Baho, Lasso, Bahoy or Labua, Teliang, Kali and at the Jetty Kube. Uh, seven more locations has been added in November 2021, uh, namely Teboh River, Char Charo, Jawa, uh, Muda Tunnel, Floating House, Kobo Island, Charuk Terra, and Chetsong River. This is the location of the uh, our sampling point. The, we divided into the lowland uh, forest that located outside the forest reserve, but surround, in surrounding uh, Muda Lake. Uh, there are also protection forest, vegetation and vision forest. So as been explained uh, yesterday, vision forest is also the protected forest, but there is no logging activity in this area. So we also have a sampling point at, uh, near to the lake. So this is a field sampling activity that's been conducted in Ulumoda Forest Reserve area. We have a discussion with the forestry department staff before we go to the sampling point. So we use uh, Aquatrol 600 smart parameter to read the physio chemical parameters and we bring a uh, water sampler uh, to our lab. So we keep in the ice, uh, the box with the ice to maintain the quality. So uh, in, uh, in the lab, we bring our sample to, for, for the analysis. This, is, this one is a picture show that the, there is an analysis of total suspended solid, one of the parameter of uh, water quality index. The other pictures uh, show the analysis of chemical oxygen demand, where we use <coughs> HANA multi-parameter photometer and the reactor. For the biochemical oxygen demand, we use uh, YSI Pro, and also we incubate the sample in incubator for five days in 20 degrees. And the last parameter is for the ammonia, we use HANA multi-parameter parameter photometer. And for the other two parameters, DO and uh, PH, the value is 
be measured uh, in the field by directly used in the WTI equation after this. <coughs> so this is the result and analysis for the first part of this initial uh, planning. We have uh, produced the stream network and the catchment area for the main uh, river network in the study area. So there are 16 uh, <coughs> main river network with the catchment. With the <coughs> Bahu River is the long uh, length of the river network with 212 kilometer with the catchment area about uh, 2,000 hectare. So this is the result of uh, Mudan Lake. It's been estimated uh, to be 1,300 uh, hectare. Mm -hmm. This uh, this map is produced by using the Sentinel satellite data. Okay, this is the result for the water quality status in September 2021. Uh, the different uh, water uh, color has been used in this table, uh, green, blue, orange, red, and black is represent the classes of the water quality, the WKI. So we can see from the, the result, DO for the all the site is uh, in the class one for the, in September, 2021. So this is the, the variation of the result for each of the parameter, six parameter. And this one is the result for in November 2021. So there is a difference between the TSS value during these two period. You can see in September 2021, there is class three in TSS. And for the 2021, uh, almost uh, all the site is class in class one except for Muda River 1 and Muda River 2. So there's a difference between the location with, uh, between uh, September and November. So we add uh, a point during our fieldwork in November. So in some, in some place in February, uh, we, we have a problem with our DO sensor you know, instrument. There's no data for DO so that we cannot uh, assess the water quality index for that uh, point. But we still can uh, evaluate the water quality through the, the parameter, the issue of the parameter, uh, six parameter in, in this uh, WKI. So for, for the recent uh, value of water quality, February 2022, uh, the the O value is arranged from uh, three point one two to nine milligram per liter, which is between class one and class three. You can see from the variation of the color in this table. And uh, TSS value uh, around two to three hundred and sixteen uh, milligram per liter, uh, which is in Tabo, Bahoy, and Kale, Floating House, and Cook Island are in the class one while the other uh, in class two to class five, class four. So the water quality index, so we differentiate our result into two, uh, three uh, result in for the September, the WKI in all patient is in class two with the range of WKI from 80.23 to 92.58. Uh, uh, Bahu River and Muda River uh, for show the cleanest water uh, since they are in the upstream of the river catchment. While the river Muda, uh, Muda River 3, located near to the lake, has the lowest WKI. So in November 2021, the water quality uh, for Muda River 1 fallen to class 3, while the other location remain in the class 2. So Charuk Jawa has the highest WKI value. And the range of WKI in November 2022 is between 73.4 to 91.9. So the water quality improved in February 2022. Uh, the river reaching a class one, such as in Bahoy or Labua River and Kubo Island. 
However, Kali River, Floating House, Lasso, Muda River and Seraya River, there's a no calculation for WTI, as I mentioned, that due to the not available data on this oxygen. So other location uh, remain in class two with the range of uh, WTI value between 73.5 to 97.20. So this is a summary of the water quality index from our study from September, November and February. You can see the blue color is the class one WKI. The yellow, orange, orange color is uh, class three. And we have uh, two uh, location with uh, class one that uh, at the Bahui Wa River and the Kobo Island with high value of the WKI. So we select three uh, location. Uh, because of the because in in this location there's a data from September, November, and February. So we compare the the result uh, from Muda River to Bahui and also the Teliang River. So Muda River is the protection forest, Labua River also the protection forest, and the Teliang River is the virgin forest. So if we compare within three uh, location, we find out that uh, at the Bahui uh, Labuan River, uh, the water quality is in class one uh, after uh, in February 2022. So this is the water level of Modern Dam. If you relate the water level to the to our result on the water quality index. We can see that uh, in September, uh, during the September fieldwork, there's a dry season. November 2021, uh, rainy season. And February 2022 is a dry season. So from rainy season to dry season in uh, Bahoy or Labo River, the water quality index uh, increased uh, from uh, class two to class one from 88.4 to 97.8. Uh, similar to the, the other location, uh, the water quality from uh, at the Muda River 2, from 73.4 to 84.8 in February. And for the Telia River, increased uh, from 19.2 to, sorry, just a little bit decreased from, uh, increased uh, 19. Two to ninety two point zero in February. So for the completion, so from this uh, study, it was found that the range of the water quality index in Ulu Muda Forest Reserve is between seventy three point four to ninety seven point eight within the uh, nineteen uh, study study sampling sampling site. So uh, in the, the recent uh, water quality index has been obtained in Bahui or Labuan River in February 2022 indicate that the, the, the highest water quality index. Um, and we find out from the all the parameters, six parameters has been uh, analyzed from the study. We find out that the COD and TSS is, has been identified as a main factor uh, to the variation of the water quality index. So, I think that's all. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for the presentation, Mr. Omar Zahari Faidi. Okay, now we open the floor for questions. Do we have any questions from Zoom? <clears throat> okay, we have one question at the back, please. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation, I'm Joe. Um, checking if you have any idea why the CSS for those two or three rivers were so high. We have a uh, you know, some findings that show where it's coming from. Thank you for the question. 
uh, basically uh, during our data collection, so the area and Ulu Muda Forest Reserve uh, already start or logging activity. So even in our uh, upstream uh, sampling site at Baho, there is a uh, logging activity has been uh, in, in the area. So that's why the, the water quality is in the TSS the value is quite high. Okay. The question was about TSS value. Okay, any other questions? So if, if there's not any more questions, another round of applause for Mr. Ayan. Thank you so much. So next we are going to have uh, another presenter, Dr. Muhammad Sofian Sulaiman. Dr. Muhammad Sofian is a senior lecturer at Faculty of Ocean Engineering, Technology, University of Malaysia, Terengganu. His expertise is in hydraulic, hydrology and sediment transport research. Has enabled him to obtain a number of grants from Ministry of Higher Education, APS Malaysia, and other non-government organizations. So currently, he focuses his research on field work and computer modeling in the field of hydraulics, hydrology, sediment transport, and river dynamics. Until now, he has published over 30 peer-reviewed journal papers and four books in the same field. So we are honored to have Dr. Mama Sufian. So please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning. Uh, thanks to Mr. Chaperson, uh, our honorable guests, uh, members of the floor. Uh, my name is uh, Muhammad Sofian Sulaiman from University of Malaysia, Tunganu. I represent my team, uh, UMT and UPM, and WWF as well. Uh, so we work uh, on this project, uh, have digital modeling and water resources study at Gulumuda Forest Reserve. So basically this research has been concluded uh, on uh, 2018. Um, so I cover part on the uh, water quality and UPM uh, basically they cover the water, quant water quality part. Uh, so um, my research is basically on the modeling of water resources. Um, and the keywords for this research is basically on the hydrological modeling, the water resources, land use changes, water yield, sediment yield, and water demand. Um, so I, I finished my slide last night. So basically the structure of this presentation might be different from the previous presentation. So I will try to simplify the finding because the report that we submitted to WWF have, has more than 300 old pages. So I'm going to simplify them into these three main, uh, uh, I would say information that you need to know uh, the first two information is basically the, the one that um, I think everybody needs to know and everybody needs to grasp the information about the water resources study in Qatar. And the third uh, criteria or the third uh, item that I'm going to present is the work that we have been doing for the past uh, three to four years. Now, for the fundamental of hydrology, I'm going to talk about these three elements, what is the hydrological cycle, uh, the hydrological alteration, and the data that we need to have uh, to study uh, the hydrology uh, kind of discipline. Uh, so I think everybody know what is the hydrological cycle. Uh, it is a cycle of water on the terrestrial area. So if we look at on this diagram, uh, we have a rainfall event coming from the uh, cloud. And then uh, before the rainfall hit the land, part of water or part of the rainwater will go back to the atmosphere in the form of evapotranspiration. And then part of water will directly goes into the land as a surface runoff 
and part of the water it will infiltrate uh, beneath the ground. And ultimately, this surface runoff and the infiltrated water will meet at the coastal area. So it is a, a cycle process. The water that we drink today might, might reach some other countries a few years back or billion years ago. So it is a renewable kind of energy. Uh, sorry, it is a renewable uh, kind of process uh, that we have on the land surface. Now, I think just now Mr. Elon has uh, shared with us uh, the big or monumental flood and drought event in Kedah. So I'm going to uh, make it bigger to look at our country. What are the major flood and the major drought that we have? Uh, if you look at the major flood, we have 1926. This is the major red flood uh, in peninsula. Uh, in Kuala Lumpur and federal territory of, of uh, Wilaya, we have 1971. Uh, and it is a repetition. Uh, again, we have flood last year, 2021. Uh, basically, uh, that magnitude of flood has been occurred in 1971. And 2014, um, is very unfortunate for the east coast of peninsula. We have a big flood event. It's a yellow flood. Uh, this name, yellow flood, uh, is a name after uh, the post flood. We have a very, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, some kind of uh, debris and dust uh, that uh, surrounding the, the flooding uh, area. So even my campuses, uh, my campus also inundated uh, during that time. Uh, basically, if you went, if you go to Tenggalu uh, and then you visit your MT, so basically your MT located near the coastal, uh, just behind the coastal line. Uh, so during that time, we have a um, high tide and then we have a heavy rainfall. So this combo effect basically um, trigger a major flood and we have one story building at least, uh, you know, in a little bit the water and students need to, uh, you know, uh, move uh, from the hostel to the uh, safe area. And if you look at the drought, uh, if I still remember when I was a kid, 1997, uh, it's a very, it is a very strong El Nino during that years. Uh, if you look uh, from my slide, we have uh, water rationing for six months. And even in Kedah, we have 2020 uh, kind of water deficit in Kedah as well as Malacca. So, uh, this kind of tragedies and monumental extreme event, either flood or drought, is frequently occur in our country. Although we are blessed with a um, ton of water, mountain of waters, but uh, we still need to manage how to, uh, you know, uh, have a plan or how to mitigate uh, between these two extreme events, the flood event and also the drought event. Now, after we understand the hydrological cycle, we need to know what is the alteration that might have to this water cycle. If you look at the forest setting, okay, like for example, Ulumuda Forest Reserve, we have a very big canopy, we have a, a, a very dense vegetation. So I would say, based on the literature as well, the evapotranspiration process might go up to 95, 95%, surface runoff less than 5%, and then the infiltration to the base flow up to 20%. So what is the significance of having high evapotranspiration in this forest setting is that we can expect a high or a frequent rainfall event. So that's why the forest area can be regarded as a water catchment or water stock area. Because of high evapotranspiration, high rainfall event, then we can have high water storage. And what happened if this land use setting is changed to urban setting, and then uh, the percentage of water cycle will decrease. The water cycle will be there, but the percentage of occurrence will be altered. So uh, instead of 80% for forest setting now, it goes down to 30%. Surface runoff will be greater than 50% and base flow will be lesser than uh, the forest setting. So, when we have the altered scenario like this uh, from the forest setting to the urban setting, then we need to check whether the river that we have uh, can give uh, the service that 
that all the biota need to live. So that's why we have another term we call the environmental flow or indicators of hydrologic alteration to see whether the river health can be sustained when we have this alteration. Okay, next, uh, let's go, let, let's look at the data on the hydrology that we need to obtain. Like in my case, uh, when we do uh, hydrological modeling, at least we need to have the digital elevation model. So for our model, we obtain the IFSA model from JPS. It's very sharp uh, model, as uh, very, very sharp uh, elevation model with five, five meter resolution. Uh, we have land use land cover from DOA. And then we need to have uh, the soil series data from the DOA as well. So even FAO, they have uh, their inventory of, of, uh, of uh, soil series. Uh, the slope classes, basically, we can obtain from the DEM. And last but not least, we need to have the weather data. So at least uh, we need to have the rainfall data. And another four optional data, we need to have temperature, uh, wind, solar radiation, and humidity. So these five weather data uh, is a compulsory for us to run uh, a hydrological model like, 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 uh, like uh, what I did for the past four years. Another ground-based data that we need to have, uh, the red color that I highlighted is the observed data that we need to obtain to compare with the simulated data. Uh, because uh, everybody know a software is like a uh, rubbish in, rubbish out. So whatever we key in, then the outcome can be everything. So we need to validate and calibrate them I mean, the simulated data with the observed data. So if we model uh, the water yield or the stream flow in the river, then we need to test or we need to calibrate and validate with the actual observed stream flow in the, in the river system. And same goes to the sediment yield. If we model the sediment yield, then we need to have the TSS parameter, for example, the physical parameter, then we can have a reliable model to represent the actual scenarios uh, in the relocation. Okay, next, let's look at the water resources study in Kedah. So basically we have two, uh, a very big study uh, provided by GPS. One of the study related to the water resources is NWRS, National Water Resources Study, 2000-2050. Uh, they even come with the review version 2011-2050. And the second, uh, uh, I think a very good study as well, uh, is the latest study, NAWAPS, National Water Balance Management System. They study the water balance and water availability uh, for the selected river basin. So NWRS uh, is a very general study for the state, like at the state level. And NAWAPS is a dedicated study for the river basin. And it's a very lucky in Kedah, uh, for the phase one NAWAPS, they have uh, Sungai Muda River Basin and Sungai Kedah River Basin now up study yeah, uh, for phase number one. Now, this is the NWS 2000, 2050. If you look here for Kedah State, uh, generally we have a rainfall of 2300, which is lower than the average rainfall for Malaysia, 1900. And in terms of evapotranspiration, transpiration, it is 61% and 5.63 for groundwater and 32% for surface runoff. So this is uh, the data for the state at the whole, not at the river basin. And then uh, this is now up study 2020. So if you look here, uh, they have performed water availability study for Muda River Basin and Kedah River Basin. So if you look at the Muda River Basin, uh, the average rainfall uh, from, if not mistaken, 2015 up to 2020 is about 1,900 millimeter per year. Uh, the most interesting part is here. If you look here, we have a dam release. We have a water transfer uh, from Muda Dam to Pudu Dam. It's about 1,082 million cubic meter per year. And this water transfer is basically benefit the party irrigation at Kedah. So without this water transfer, uh, the party harvesting twice per year cannot be naturalized. So with this water transfer, basically, uh, 
the 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 harvesting of paddy uh, is very rich. We have two plants per year, and finally, if you look here, the water availability means uh, the yield of water versus the demand of water. If we have the demand which is greater than the yield, then we have a deficit. Now, in Muda River Basin, we have deficit basically. We have negative 104. So, uh, on the scale of raw water, when we have a deficit of water, means that the available water in the river system is is and is is not capable to accommodate the demand that we need to have for the host for, for the uh, Muda River Basin. So, with that in mind. Um, the, the industry key players in the Muda River Basin, they need to plan what is the priority for Muda River Basin. So in this case, with this study, uh, the portable water is the most priority uh, in the Muda River Basin. Now, uh, we, look at the, we look at the river basin uh, for the whole Kedah state. So we have three main river basin. So river basin means that uh, the the divide or the boundary of the river from the river mouth up to the uh, mountain areas at the upstream. So we have Muda River Basin, we have Kedah River Basin and Mergo River Basin. And Muda River Basin uh, is the largest in terms of catchment area. Uh, the land of Muda River is about 180 kilometers and the major tributaries apart from uh, Sungai Muda or Muda River, we have Sungai Kete, Sungai Sedim, and Sungai Cepe. So these three tributaries, they are located downstream from Ulu Muda Forest Reserve. Now, if we zoom in, where is the Ulu Muda Forest Reserve? So basically, Sungai Muda River Basin located on top of two main streets, two main districts, which is Sik and uh, Baling, and Ulu Muda Forest Reserve located at the upstream part, and then uh, with this Ulumoda Forest Reserve, uh, basically we have two main rivers. We have Sungai Teliang and Sungai Muda. And we have major tributaries like Sungai uh, Lasso, Sungai Bahoy, Sungai Labua. They fit into uh, either the Sungai Muda or Sungai Teliang. Now, everybody know we have uh, uh, Muda Dam. So when we delimit the catchment for Muda Dam, and then we took uh, the uh, weir at the Muda Dam as the outlet of water, then we can delimit where is the boundary for our water catchment. Now, based on, on, on this map, uh, if you look at the uh, right-hand side, uh, some part of Muda, uh, Ulu Muda Forest Reserve, basically, they are not drained directly into Muda Dam. They are drained uh, directly into Sungai Kete, right? So I would say uh, maybe 10 to 15% of them, they are not drained into uh, Muda Dam or Muda Lake, they are drained downstream uh, from, the, from the lake. And as I said from the previous slide, uh, they have a veer, so they do not have the environmental, environmental flow uh, beneath uh, the veer. So, the only way for the water from Muda Dam to escape from this dam is through the, over, uh, through the overflow event. So they have a Sayung tunnel, it's a free flow tunnel. So basically, whatever water that goes into Muda Lake or Muda Dam, they will be transferred to Pudu, Pudu Lake. Right. Now, this is the projected population uh, because we are trying to find what would be uh, the supply and demand supply and demand sequence? Uh, whether the water generated from the Muda Dam uh, able to accommodate uh, the demand of water for the whole Kedah state. So that is the main idea. Although it is not realistic, we want to look with that small amount of terrestrial area for Ulu Muda Forest Reserve. What would be the percentage of water in the dam or in the lake can accommodate? or can fulfill the demand for the whole Kedah state. Now, it is projected uh, based on the census 20, 2000 and 2010, uh, Kedah state can have uh, like 2 million people, sorry, 3 million people approaching 2050. And if you look at the uh, projected demand as well, uh, approaching 2050, we can have 1,855 million liters per day. 
And based on the data by SPAN, if not mistaken, they released uh, the water demand for portable in Kedah 2019, uh, based on their uh, survey, it is 1,490. So it's not far from projected 2020, which is 1,529. All right, now let's look at what we are doing for the, fast, for the past uh, three to four years on the hydrological modeling. Uh, first of all, let's look at the modeling theory. So the model that we use to find the water yield and the sediment yield for Ulumuda Forest Reserve is using this SWOT model. Uh, it is a physical, physical based model, which was developed by USDA. Uh, it can be used to compute or to root water. Uh, sediment and nutrient from the subcasement. And then these are the main equation in the model. We have a water balance equation. We have the water yield equation. Water yield is the main component that we want to look at. And also the sediment yield, uh, this model use uh, muscle modified USLE model. And this is the modeling approach. So in terms of data input, we need to have a DEM, we need to have land use, soil type and weather data. And when we do the model processing, we need to have uh, two, uh, what we call main uh, process, which is the model calibration and model validation. And if you look at the table, we have the performance rating. For example, uh, to say that our model is good and fit enough, we must ensure that the statistical reliability of the model between measured and observed data is within this range. At least uh, the NSE, uh, Nash Sutcliffe Efficiency, or R square, uh, should be greater than 0 0.5 to say that it is satisfactory. But uh, when we do the model, uh, we have the time frame, we have the time scale of the model. We can model daily or we can model monthly. But it's very unfortunate uh, to model daily, our result is high wire. We cannot have this uh, range. Uh, so what we did was we uh, tried to define the temporal scale from daily to monthly, then we can get this desired data. So uh, to model water resource and flood, there are two different kind of uh, activities and approach. I would say for the swap model, it is good to model water resources to find water yield. But for the flood model analysis, uh, using SWOT is not uh, I would say it's not compatible because SWOT model, like the model that I am using, they are towards finding the average values instead of uh, small scale temporal, which is very significant for the flood event. Now, like I said, this is our performance of the model. If you look at the calibration model, so when we have the data from MADA, so thanks to MADA, we need to divide into two, uh, the calibration data set and validation data set. So if you look here in terms of R square and SC and the P bias, more or less they are satisfactory level. And also for the validation, they are satisfactory level as well. And if you look before the calibration, uh, the model tends to over predict what is the yield of water. And when we do the calibration, you can see there are some agreement between the observed and the simulated. Now, with this in mind, uh, we find the average water year from 1989 to 2018. So more or less, I would say the water year for Ulumoda Forest Reserve is about 1,800 per year, millimeter per year. And if you look at the monthly uh, distribution of water, uh, water year, February is expected to have uh, lowest water year inside the, the Muda Dam and, Muda, and, and the lake. And October, November is susceptible to have a high water yield. And then uh, this is the uh, spatial map uh, with the data that we have. We can map out where is the location that that's supposed to have a greater influence in terms of contributing the water yield and the groundwater effect. So in terms of water yield or surface water, so these are the 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 dark color is supposed to have a greater yield compared to the other area. And if you look at the right hand side, uh, we have a very uh, big patch area. So this area uh, indicates 
the location that supposed to have a high storage of groundwater. So basically, the Sungai Teliang area, this area should be protected uh, because we have a high uh, volume of groundwater storage uh, based on my my modeling part. Based on my modeling. Now, with the average data from uh, 2018, how many minutes do I have? <laughs> okay. so with the uh, average data from uh, 1989 to 2018, we obtained the climate change data from Nahrim. So we get data from 2020 up to 2015. So Nahrim provided us with the six kilometer grid uh, climate change data, the projection of rainfall. So if you look at the rainfall inside Sungai Teliang, for example, uh, from 20, approaching 2030, from 2020 up to 2030, there will be decrease of rainfall. So we need to prepare with this. Again, uh, this data almost similar to the uh, uh, Sungai Muda. Uh, approaching 2030, uh, you can expect that the rainfall will be decreased. Now, what happened? We fit this rainfall or this weather data into our calibrated model. So it's very alarming that you need to know uh, the average from 1989 to uh, 2018 is the red dotted color, 1008, 1,800 millimeter per year, the water yield. Approaching 2030, we have a decrease of water yield. We have a decrease of water yield. Uh, but towards uh, 2040 and 2050, we have a fluctuation. Now, if you look at the histogram at the right hand side, uh, there are another findings that, that I, I, I would like to share with all of you. Uh, the blue color is the baseline, and the other color is basically um, uh, the decadal uh, simulation. If you look at the blue color from January to June, which is expected to be the drier month, the baseline color or the current value that we have is actually dominated compared to the climate change scenarios of water yield. But approaching from, uh, from July to December, uh, the baseline kind of uh, uh, decreased compared to the projected water yield. So I would say uh, approaching towards 2030 until 2050, uh, for the early year, from January to June or July, uh, January to June, the projected water yield will be lesser compared to the baseline. But approaching to the year end, the projected water yield will be uh, in abundance. So we, we, we will have some sort of two extreme events. Uh, the first year, we'll have a drier kind of season. And then towards the end, we're going to have a wetter kind of of, of season in, inside the Muda Dam. All right, so uh, this is the analysis of supply and demand. Although it's not fair to compare the water yield from uh, Muda Dam with the whole uh, Kedah water demand, but this is what I want to stress. With the 10 to 11% of terrestrial area inside the Muda Dam and inside Ulu Muda Forest system, Basically, the yield of water that we have inside the lake able to accommodate up to 70% of demand for the whole Kedah state. Say, for example, one time all the rivers are gone inside the Kedah, except for Ulumuda Forest Reserve. The water inside Ulumuda Forest Reserve able to accommodate almost 70%, sorry, 67% to the overall demand, including the portable, including the, the irrigation, uh, the livestock. So I think this is one of the 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 the, the most crucial uh, finding that that we need to protect uh, uh, the water resources inside Ulumuda Forest Reserve. All right. Uh, in terms of sediment here, uh, uh, basically the data is not enough. I, I don't want to elaborate more on this since the data is not enough and the satisfactory level is not good to present this. However, this is the data that we get. So this is the gap for our research. So way forward, uh, we need to have a better, better data in terms of, of sediment. And then in terms of land use change, uh, we do model the, uh, the scenario analysis. We model these four scenarios, clear fair, street conservation, 
uh, logging uh, using reduced impact RIL and conversion uh, to the production of uh, forest plantation. So the way we, we model this scenario is we convert whatever uh, the majority of land use inside the Ulumuda with this uh, conversion. Uh, in terms of water yield, over the long term, strict conservation will give will give uh, a stable yield of water, especially during the dry season. And in terms of sediment yield, if you look at the, the green color, the strict conservation basically will protect uh, the river from having high amount of sediment accumulation. All right, so I think that's the finding uh, from my part. So I would like to give some crucial uh, concluding remarks. The first one is in terms of water balance, uh, majority of water balance at the Ulumoda Forest is of, occur in the form of lateral flow, evapotranspiration and groundwater flow. So the groundwater, especially at the Sungai Teliang is very, uh, I, I would say huge. We have a few storage uh, for the groundwater flow at Sungai Teliang. Um, only a small percentage of water balance occur in the form of surface runoff. I really know we have a forest cover, so basically we have uh, lesser surface runoff. Uh, the groundwater flow is considered in this case because uh, the model uh, can segregate the groundwater into low aquifer and shallow aquifer. But somehow at Ulumuda, since we have a, a very steep uh, kind of topography, so most of the water will be stored in terms of lateral flow process. Now, the water yield, uh, okay, this is a, uh, I would like to stress uh, point number two from below, sorry, point number three from below. From the month of January to June, the expected water yield is lower than the baseline for the future prediction. Uh, the projected water yield is lower than the baseline for most of the simulation outcome, although the yearly water yield might be higher than the baseline data. And the uh, proceeding uh, notes that I would like to stress, in contrast, month from July to December show the extreme water yield for the most of the simulation outcome, although the yearly average water yield might be lower than the baseline water yield. So it's kind of extreme event between uh, the first, uh, first half of the year and the second half of the year. And then in terms of supply and demand, uh, point number two from bottom, I would like to stress this out. Although the terrestrial area for Ulumuda Forest Reserve is only 10 to 11 percent, uh, uh, compared to the whole Kedah State, it can, or based on my modeling, able to accommodate up to 70 percent of the total raw water demand. It's not treated as a raw water demand for Kedah until 2050. And then uh, for the sediment yield, uh, I would like to stress. Uh, Point number one, because we have lack of data, so this is the gap of, of our research. So we are unable to calibrate the model well. So I think Frim uh, can champion uh, this water, uh, this sediment kind of study inside Ulumuda. And also, we do have uh, a short, a brief uh, one chapter on the analysis of, of reservoir sedimentation. So based on my uh, analysis using the error reduction method, uh, based on the current data that I obtained from Muda, we expect that the dam will last for 287 years with the current setting of, of land use uh, before the dam is sorted up to 50% of the storage uh, of the uh, Muda dam. And last part is the uh, street construction. I would like to stress uh, point uh, number two from bottom for street conservation. Uh, the sediment yield during the simulation period is the lowest compared to the other scenarios. And the last point is the strict conservation is seen to dominate the water yield during the early year when the rainfall is lower than the year end. So I think that's all for, uh, for my presentation. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Sophia. Uh, by the way, Mada, we already did uh, one of uh, one study, and we found out that the current uh, situation of our Muda reservoir is only 80% of the original capacity. So we did a bathymetric survey uh, with Nahrim, and uh, from the finding, uh, we can say from their finding, it was concluded that if there's nothing 
if there's no change in the land use, uh, Muda Reservoir will only last for another 60 to 65 years. So maybe later we can discuss more with Dr. Sukran to let him uh, look at our previous study. So now we open uh, questions from the floor and even from the audience from Zoom and FB Live. We have one question from Zoom. Does the water demand analysis on the or include demand, uh, demand? Okay. Please, that is clear. Okay. Uh, the water demand analysis is only cover Kedah State, not Penang State. And water demand uh, cover uh, four sectors, uh, which is the, uh, the portable to domestic sector, the irrigation, non irrigation, and the livestock. So far, so okay. Thank you, Dr. Sophia. Okay, any other questions? So, currently, we have eight water treatment plants from uh, SADA taping water from our MADA irrigation system. And uh, we have another three from Perlis. So, we can see around 11 water treatment plants is taking out water from uh, the system, which coming from Ulu Muda. Okay, is there any other questions? So, if that's not, uh, shall we give another round of applause for the Sukhan Slaiman? Thank you so much. And now we continue with Dr. Bhakti. Uh, our Dr. Bhakti is an associate professor in the School of Economics, Finance, and Banking in UUM, Malaysia. He obtained his PhD degree in environmental valuation from the University of Newcastle, United Kingdom. His research interest is in environmental and tourism economics, particularly the development and application of economic valuation methods. So he has used various valuation methods in his research, including, but not limited to the choice, experiments, travel cost methods, contingent valuation method, and hedonic price method. He is currently undertaking flood mitigation consultation work under GPS. His primary task in the consultation work is to analyze the benefit and cost, benefit cost analysis of each proposed flood mitigation alternative. Okay, so Dr. Bhatti has published numerous articles and uh, he is currently the Dean of the School of Economics, Finance and Banking. And we are very lucky to have him today. So please, Dr. Bhatti. The floor is all yours. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Alhamdulillah. So, if I can relate my topic presentation today to what actually is being presented by two uh, keynote speakers, Dr. Dr. Roda and Prof. Awam, and a couple of questions from Prof. Shabaki yesterday. So my paper actually is more on what is the value, value of the ecosystem services that Ulu Motor provides. Okay, so basically, before I start my presentation, so I would like to uh, thank or introduce my team members, which is uh, Dr. Samson Bahim and Ravi, Kwan Osman Musa, Inti Amizam Paz, Zumi and also from Frim, uh, Puan Mokrima, right? And then what I'm thinking now, then when I met the Pengara, Pengara Big Pen, uh, Bagian Pencangan Ekonomi Negeri, so whether the state have asked any conversation from the federal, from the federal government, yes, the state did actually since from the Prime Minister for right, but until now there's no uh, compensation or any financial aid from the federal government, right? Because uh, the state of Qatar actually uh, sacrificed a lot by keeping or by having this uh, Ulu Muda forest in terms of particularly in terms of a uh, party plantation. So basically, my uh, 
presentation today is about ecosystem services of forest, which is uh, presented very well and quite comprehensive by Prof. Awa yesterday. Right? And then I will touch a bit about the MADA. But I received the book program yesterday and found that my session will be moderated or chaired by the by an expert from MADA, Saya Goyang. A big Goyang, actually, yes. Because what I'm going to share here is the data from MADA. But I think this is the opportunity for me. I'm the luckiest, actually. So if anything wrong, please correct me as the wrong Peter person. I'm really, very really sorry. Right? Because it's very good conference, good feedback from the expert and things like that. And then I will share a bit about the water consumption of party plantation, right? My study methodology, result, and conclusion. And the most important thing is how actually we can use uh, this finding as a basis for us to justify why we need such amount of money from the federal government, right? Because when I asked Dr. Injek Mahazi, he told me that the federal, the, the state government only asks 100 million from the federal government annually as a compensation to preserve this Ulu model. But I don't have a chance to ask him, where did you get this 100 million? Right. But maybe this paper, this kind of conference, this kind of study as a good basis for us to justify we put number and scientific study, right? So why we need such amount of money? So basically, this is what actually Prof. Aung presented yesterday. When we talk about the ecosystem services of forest, we can divide into four categories. But what I want to focus is about the water for paddy plantation. Right? Paddy plantation. So for us to understand this map, so I would suggest you to look at the table here. Okay, to look at the table here. So basically, <coughs> basically, we have three dams in the Ulubuda area, Ulubuda forest, which is Muda, then Muda, Dam Perdu, and Dam Ahning. Okay, but Ahning actually is not very significant. Correct me if I'm wrong. All right, Ahning is okay, but talking about the Muda and Perdu, okay, when we talk about the catchment area for Muda, is actually almost to 990 kilometers square. Okay. Compared to Purdue, which is 171 kilometers square, square kilometer, okay, in terms of catchment area. But in terms of Kolam I, this is what area here, right? For Muda is only 15 square meter, right? Compared to Purdue, which is 52 square meter. Can you imagine big catchment, big catchment area, but with small kolam eye? Kemana I cannot pergi, right? So that's the reason why actually uh, this characteristic is important. And then the maximum reservoir storage for Muda is one to five, okay? One to five, 125,000 uh, acre feet. Right, and for the Purdue is 875,000 acre feet. Right, so there's a reason here is how actually the excess water from the Muda Dam will be transferred to Purdue Dam. Am I right, Mr. Chairman? Yes, right. Then they call it a Sayong Tunnel here. So, one interesting point here when you look at the map here, when you look at the Catchment area here is a kind of map actually. You can map one to one from the Bulubuda area here with the Mada for with the Mada area, Bulaya 2 and Tiwaya 4. Am I right or not? Very, very similar area here. Right? So very, very nice, interesting. Bijak ni engineer dulu, the BK Taku study. Okay. So here we have here we have four wilayah, four region for this Mada area. We have wilayah satu, which is uh, wilayah Kanga. We have wilayah dua, 
which is uh, a jitra. We have here wilayah empat, kota salam semut, and wilayah sorry, uh, wilayah tiga, which is a pendam area. So this is very important for us to understand when we talk about the dam, then where the where the water goes to goes to the for the party plantation. Right. So this is how the system works. Okay. So there are four main source of water for this party plantation, and if I can rank them, so it starts with uh, water from river. Okay. Second one water from dam, the third one, sorry, the first one water from rain, rain water, sorry, the first one from the rain, second one from the dam, third one from the river, and the last one from the recycled water. Rain, dam, river here, and then the recycled water, right. And then it's very nice system here. You see that? So even though here, the silo tunnel here, the excess water from this dam or dam, uh, uh, Buddha dam, will be transferred to the Empangan Perdu with the silo tunnel here. And then with the Sungai Perdu here, it goes to the Alata and the Pulubang area. When you come to Kedah, I will bring you to this area. Of course, with the system of the Madam here. Stop, nah? Okay, show you how actually this LSD at Lubang we now uh, we transfer the data divide the water to the Terusan Utara or Terusan Tengah and Selatan. Like this one. This is system at the Mala area. So basically at Mala area, the reason why actually we are focusing on Padi, because if you look at the land use of the Mala area here. I would say two thirds of the land use at Mara area is used for the party plantation. Okay, which is 160, 100,685 hectares for the party purposes. And the remaining, the remaining is for other agricultural activities. Okay, again. If you look at the sorry, if you look at the contribution of Madras to the national party production, right, in terms of percentage, I would say from 2009 to 2020, it is actually 40%. So we are actually producing 70% of self-sufficiency. The remaining 30% we imported, we import from other countries, right? And from this 30%, 40% daripada the Mada area. So can you imagine? Let me share with you in terms of what they use for party plantation, right? So very, very important for us to tell the federal government just now we receive this muda, then only can be last for 60 to 65 years, 80% of the capacity. Okay, it's very, very important for us to tell the federal government. Okay, you look at data here. So the red color here uh, shows the contribution in terms of time matrix and in terms of percentage, the blue color here. Okay, the blue color here. So I would say 40% of national party actually is contributed by a farmers in Mada area. Right. So basically, in Mada area, we have 184 irrigation blocks. Okay. The Pange is a block of 184 blocks. Okay. And then it is actually uh, the four region, region one, two, three, and four. And then there are two seasons in Kedah. So in Mada area, a party season, which is the main source of water come from the rain, and the second season, the water come from the dam, right? So in terms of average yield, right, we're talking about the second season and primary season here, right? So the pattern quite consistent for the primary season. 
the pattern, the pattern, right? The pattern here, right? But in terms of the second season, the pattern is not consistent. Some regions produce less and some regions uh, produce uh, more. The one we do not investigate in this paper. Like, well, I can just report to the my, my findings of the data, but this study is quite consistent with the pattern here. Okay. This is very interesting. Water consumption for paddy plantation. Okay, so you look at the paddy gross yield from 2011 to 2021, right? So we can see that the secondary season actually always produce more compared to the primary season, right? That means when the water, the main water composition from the dam always produce more uh, paddy yield compared to the primary season, right? And in terms of the, uh, in terms of the party water consumption as well, so we can see that the second season uses more water compared to the primary season. So for the information, when I said that the water consumption, it covers the four elements or the four sources that I mentioned just now, rain, dam, river, and the cycle of water, right? Now we go for the source of water during the primary season. So as I said just now, when we talk about the primary season, the main contributor is water from the rain. Okay, so the reason uh, we have the blue color here, okay? And then when it comes to the secondary season, the main water comes from the, from the dam, right? So if you compare between rain and river, it's kind of opposite line direction. You see just now, if we have more water from river, the blue color river, right? Rain. Sorry, rain, sorry. From the rain, down on the rain. <laughs> sorry, Mr. Chancellor. <laughs> when it comes from the rain, right, with the rain in the night, Malinka, automatically the water from them will go down. That is for the second season and the primary season. Right. So can you imagine if we do not have enough water from the rain during the second season? Then when, when we take it into account the 80% becomes 70% and so on, you know, you know my message right? This is really important here. You see that like, the pattern here. Okay, so that means during the second season, like, so even though, even though the mother now collaborate, the main water must come from the rain. If the rain water is not sufficient, then we use the water from the dam. When we have this situation, this scenario, and unfortunately in Auzubila, we don't have enough water from the dam, what we will do, what we will do to solve this problem. But this is very important for us to understand. Okay, so that's the reason why this study is very, very important for us to understand the value of uh, water. Okay, for this study, so I did the focus group discussion. So the main purpose of discussion is just to test our questionnaire and try to get uh, some uh, feedback from the focus group participants before we do or before we go for the fieldwork study. Okay, so in this case, uh, as Puan Muklima said, I'm the one actually prepare everything, my group prepare everything, but during the focus group discussion, unfortunately, I cannot attend because of the COVID-19 positive. So I have to stay at home, monitor from WhatsApp group everything, right? So we uh, discuss at three different locations. We have here Wilayah Pendang, Wilayah Tiga, Wilayah Empat, Wilayah Satu. And then we call a couple of participants Right. We discuss here, uh, so we discuss uh, the most important part here is about the input. Okay, so in our questionnaire, so in our prepared uh, document here, we divided the cost of Pergaman Padi into three stages. One is the Penyedaan Tapak Sama Padi, okay. The second one is Penanaman Padi, and the third one is the Harvesting Period, what to the Menuaikan Padi itu. And then when we compare the jumlah of cost, jumlah of the 
cost for ferry production in these three different wilayah. So we found that wilayah Pendam actually, wilayah Pendam actually, uh, the cost is much higher compared to the cost in uh, Kota Sarang Semut or in Perlis. Okay. And then uh, during the during the discussion as well, so the participants uh, told us uh, what kind of uh, ration to, to be listed and so on. Right? Because some ration, uh, even though they use, but they cannot uh, make it as a apa tak boleh guna melanggar pun melanggar dia punya ada dia punya akta akta lah kan ration jadi ration tu so I have to be very careful because kata kalau dah tahu ini salah tak boleh melanggar tapi kadang-kadang orang -kadang boleh jual pun so I'm not going to uh, explain further for that part right. this is one thing for us to understand before you go for the uh, fieldwork survey the second one is we talking about the legal the nilai bidaan because in this study as well uh, we, we want to know uh, if the uh, state government uh, want to charge more for the services that Ulu Muda provide to them so what time or what is the value they are willing to pay right so for this case uh, I have to thank Prof Awang I trust him a lot catch up Prof Awang Bagi pesan rumah rasa je tahu lah Okay, daripada nilai bidaan RM2 sampai ke RM20 So we can see the trend here So from here, so we can set what is the minimum value of WDP And what is the maximum value of WDP right. And we also uh, tested uh, what kind of uh, payment vehicles When we talk to the farmers right? So are they more happy or more comfortable to pay with the utility bills or via or through uh, tamung pakatan uh, or from the cukai tali the existing one for your information the current uh, charge for farmers is cukai tali air dari cukai ada di punya rate dia this is what we found from the study here so basically uh, most of them actually uh, prefer or happy to pay melalui cukai tali air So this is the model we use. So the model we use to calculate the value of water for plantation is a straightforward, which is we use the technique, residual uh, value technique. And for the WTP, we use a double bounded contingent version method. For the residual value technique, it's very, very straightforward. So we have the TVP, total value of production. In our context here, it is actually how many actually the farmers uh, can get right? and then the price to the value so all the variables here is can be obtained from the questionnaire for example labor right for example the input and so on but the only thing we don't know from this equation for the unknown variable is the quantity of water so it continues to because that the price of water Right, so in the economic term, uh, during the value marginal of a product, so it is actually equal to the price of the input. Okay. 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 Uh, this is our sampling, right? So to make sure uh, our sample actually representing the population, so we based our sampling based on the hectare here for region one until region four. This is a hectare, that is a percentage. This is a target respondent. This is the survey respondent here, right? We interview or we survey, we have 405 respondents, right? So this is our questionnaire here, okay? Uh, Treatment section, okay, that's on. Okay, this is the result, I think. Okay, uh, this is the input, we, uh, the information we received from the from the mother, okay. So here we need to do the, some kind of conversation. The mother reported the water use in terms of acre food. Acre food. So the first thing first, we need to convert this acre food to the cubic meter, right? Another thing is the mother use the term of hectare, but the farmers is familiar with the terms of renom, 
right? And all the input measures here under the Terlum concept. So on top of what actually we receive from the MATA information, we also uh, get information for the EVA, EVA for transpiration. So this one I have to uh, thank uh, Cik Muhammad Farid when I uh, shared or presented my initial study. So uh, he, he actually kept challenging me because my finding is not actually uh, accurate if I don't take this value here. So when I talked to the MATA engineer, Right, so he told me it is actually around five to seven millimeter per day. Right, so here the midpoint I take here is a six day, six, six millimeter. Pardon, Check Six is a Six millimeter here, and then I have to convert this one. So this is actually equal to water loss. Water loss during for this uh, process is a 500. 570,000. Yeah. Then after we uh, divide this value over here, then multiply with the same area here and convert this area, then the answer is what we got here the water use for M2, which is the, which is uh, during the uh, primary season, which is 415 meter cubic per rental. So we do use a lifting per loan. And during the secondary season, the water use is 699 uh, meter cubic for the secondary, for the per loan for secondary season. Right, so this is up here. So this up here, okay. So as I said just now, we can get everything here except for this one. So when we do the simple calculation, the very straightforward here. So what we understand from this funking, from this finding is, uh, the value of water for party plantation is tiga ringgit lima puluh empat sen for setiap cubic meter, okay, per dom pada waktu prime season musim utama, and the value is uh, 1.35 cubic meter for the second season per dom per dom, sorry per dom ya. Okay, in terms of the in terms of the uh, CVM analysis, so we can confirm right based on the response here. We can confirm right. So if we put a uh, higher bid value, the response become the agreement to pay less and less. Okay, so this is very important here. Currently, the farmers pay actually for region one because the party tama is understood for the region one. The value is puluh ringgit lima puluh sen. Per loan per tahun, okay. And for the region two, three, and four, which are under Kerala state, the value is empat ringgit dua puluh sen per loan per year. Okay. So this is our analysis, the the double bonded analysis side. So some of the variable is significant and some of, some are not significant. But the most important, the, the most important thing here is the farmers actually are willing to pay extra of up to four ringgit. 4.74 ringgit. Right? So that means if we ask them to pay extra for the Chukai Tari Ai, they are willing to pay up to 4.74 ringgit on top of on top of what they are paying now. Okay. Then the conclusion here is very, very interesting, but I'm quite actually quite nervous or not so sure to share. This information, but since the mother and the expert here, I think it's all this opportunity to share. Right. So what can you get here? The value actually, the value of water we use for the party presentation during the during the what sorry here yeah? <laughs> during the second season that the market time it is actually. 540 million right, during the primary season. And during the second season, M1 here, so the value is 339 million. Right. Then if we uh, combine them for yearly, actually, on average, I would see that right, the value of water for precipitation per year is 422 million. This is a thing, right? 
Kalau nak fikir nilai air itulah dalam tanaman padi. That's the one side. That actually the 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 the, the state government can use or can apply to justify why they need such amount money from the federal government. And in terms of WDP here, that this is actually the state government can implement that way I think. Right. So this is the extra money, the extra of money that the state government can charge to the to the to the farmers, right? So when I do the calculation here, so on top, and then if we include what they are currently pay now and plus with what actually they are willing to pay based on this study, the total collection yearly is 3.56 million. Right. So with that, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Basti, San Basti from the UM. So since we have not, we don't have uh, so uh, very much time. At least one or two, okay. <laughs> Be fair, la. Any question from the floor? And any question from uh, our audience in Zoom or in Facebook Live? It was very interesting when when I see uh, things from Madam, which was presented by somebody else. Uh, there's a reason why Pandang they 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 have a, they have oh, lower yeah. yield and everything because of the soil type and everything. The factors. So um, looks like. There's no question. Okay, Professor Adams, I'm going to come ask you. Hey, Professor, thank you very much. Hey, 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 Tapi saya guna kaedah the residual method lah. Mm -hmm. uh, the, my, at that point in time, when I did my estimation, the value come to about between two ringgit fifty cent to three ringgit lah. So which is not very far from your yeah. estimation. So, but uh, I just want to ask you. Just the question that I want to ask you is, in the case of Mada, interestingly is they have about 10% of the water being recycled. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so how do you factor into your analysis, taking on board of what, what water provided by uh, by Mada River system, uh, dam system, and versus what is also now hmm. from recycled water. I think uh, in that case, I think uh, Mada provides quite detail from as you see just now. There are four uh, type of source for water, and Mada actually report for every season. Uh, what is the percent? What is the percentage come from the rain, from the dam, from the river, and from the cycle? So this one slowly, slowly based on the term, right? Yeah. In terms of percentage, right? Am I right? Betul tak? From betul betul. Okay. Tidak tidak betul betul. So uh, we have a lot of data in Mada, and we um, mengalu-alukan all the researchers to take a look at our data and do analysis and give us more insights and more findings. So thank you so much, thank Dr. Well. Bhatti. Okay. And allow me to continue with Dr. Hamdan Omar, Head of Geoinformation Program, Frame, Forestry and Environment. So, the, so our Dr. Hamdan Omar will present on assessing dynamics of carbon stock at Ulu Muda Forest complex using field sampling and remote sensing data. So, Dr. Hamdan, please. Right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Moderator. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and uh, very good afternoon. So, I hope uh, everyone uh, still. Uh, 
a pleasure to, to continue our session because uh, this is the second last paper. After this will be uh, one more paper to, to be presented. So um, today I'm going to talk about the, the assessment of uh, carbon stock eh? and its changes uh, from the last two decades at Ulu Model Forest Complex. And uh, I must thank uh, WWF uh, for funding this project and also uh, RMK12 uh, through the uh, project that is headed by Parohana and also uh, uh, her team. And then uh, this is um, our team that, that is uh, working on, on uh, the exercise of uh, assessing carbon at the Lumo the Forest Complex. So thanks also to Mr. Ilan uh, that presented this morning. Uh, somehow he has made my, my job easier. Because <laughs> uh, some part has been covered by him. Okay. Um, okay. All right, so before we go further, I would like to define what is the carbon stock. Eh? So uh, in the in terms of uh, forestry ecosystem, carbon stock is referred to as the amount of living matters at a given habitat expressed as a mass of or organism per unit area of habitat. So uh, it is actually the, the mass, the weight of a tree. So imagine that you've cut the tree, put them on, on the weighing scale, and then how much is the, the, the weight or the mass. So that, that, that is something that you can, you can imagine. Eh? But what we are talking about is the dry mass, the dry mass, the dry mass of the uh, tree materials. And uh, half of the dry mass is actually the carbon, uh, the carbon stock. So I believe that uh, every one of you has have seen uh, charcoal. Eh? So if you see charcoal, is this, that is actually the, the carbon, eh? which come from, from the, the wood or tree materials. Eh? Um, So uh, this is how uh, our forest, eh? our forest looks like in, 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 in a graphical view, which comprise of uh, several uh, categories or several conditions that can explain the structure and also the, the composition of the, the content of the, the forest. Eh? So this is uh, uh, where we are, this is uh, why we are measuring the, the carbon stock because um, uh, yesterday we heard about the, the, the classification or the stratification of the forest that have been made at Ulu Moda. And that comprises of virgin forest, protection forest, and also the log of, log of a forest. And the log of a forest is even uh, categorized into several other categories. So that represents the, the condition of the forest. And when we measure the, the carbon stock, uh, within these categories, uh, the, the value will be different. Eh? And the objective of the uh, study is, is the, uh, to estimate the carbon stock and then to quantify the changes of, of uh, uh, carbon stock throughout the uh, years. And in this case, we took, we, we took uh, the year of 2000. Uh, until 2021, which is about uh, two decades. And then we measure the difference that have been occurred uh, between these two periods. And then to assess the uncertainty. So the, the, the importance of why we are measuring the, the, the carbon stock within the forest is because it plays uh, a big role in, in uh, regulating in regulating the climate because forests has the ability to absorb CO2 and the other uh, greenhouse gases. No, uh, 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 no, no, uh, no one uh, or there's no ecosystem other than forest that has that ability. Yeah? And then uh, at the same time, it also produce oxygen, yeah? oxygen that we uh, consume every day. And did you know that how much, 
how much uh, oxygen that we use every day. Dr. Bati, do you, do you have an no. idea? No. no. Don't know. Eh? So uh, there is a study that uh, told uh, about 55 liter of air that we consume every day. Uh, 55 uh, liter, uh, they, 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 they measure it in liter. And uh, out of uh, that 55 liter, only 20%, 18, 18 to 20% contains oxygen that we inhale in our lung and uh, and we uh, outhale or we 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 almost can uh, CO2 ataupun gas gas lain lah yang tidak digunakan so uh, why we didn't care about that any idea why we didn't care about that huh? because it is free Imagine that you can, if you have to pay that that services, uh, then everybody keep uh, counting every day how much air or how much oxygen that they use. And this is coming from the forest or the, the trees that 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 that, that, that uh, boil uh, around us. Eh? So that is the uh, uh, some background of the study. So uh, the study area covers the uh, Ulumudu Forest Complex. <coughs> which is uh, already explained by uh, Mr. Elan uh, this morning. So I don't want to go through this. And we use the, um, the satellite imagery yeah, to assess uh, the total amount of carbon stock and also its changes uh, over the years. And here we have uh, a series of satellite image. Right? And in this case, we use a Landsat, eh, which is the, uh, a satellite that is owned by uh, United States, and uh, it keep and it, it has the uh, the ability to capture uh, the historical uh, phenomena or historical data because uh, this satellite has been launched since uh, 1978, so it has a, a good, a consistent uh, record in terms of um, data capturing and also the archive. And then we also uh, did, did some sampling yeah, to, to, to measure the carbon stock at, at the ground yeah, to, so, so that we can model and we can uh, estimate the total amount of carbon stock within this uh, forest complex. Yeah. So this is uh, the data that we use yeah, in terms of uh, uh, maps. Yeah. We have uh, uh, 2000, 2012, 10, uh, 15, and also uh, uh, last year, 2021. So uh, there's about a five years interval uh, within each uh, company, uh, a different. Huh? And how do we calculate the changes or the difference? Huh? Uh, there is two methods actually. Uh, one is the uh, stock difference method which is uh, in short SDM and then uh, another one is uh, uh, gain loss method uh, which is uh, more uh, complicated so we use this the, the simpler one and uh, it is uh, calculated based on the uh, carbon stock for for at least two periods uh, two periods you need to have at least uh, uh, say uh, for for the year uh, two thousand, and then for the year uh, two thousand five, and then you can you can uh, see the changes or measure the, the the difference. So in this case, we have five five series. Then you can at least measure four difference, eh? four difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, when we are dealing with a satellite image. The data doesn't tell you how much carbon stock directly, so uh, we have to to measure or to model it uh, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, appropriate manner so that so that uh, the carbon stock can be measured in indirect ways. Eh? So in this case, we use uh, a forest canopy density uh, index or FCD to represent or to uh, to show. Uh, the, the variation of of the carbon stock within the uh, uh, 
uh, uh, Uruguayan forest complex, and uh, there is uh, some some calculation uh, involved in this process. Uh, and then uh, this FCD is able to show the difference or the the uh, the variation of the density of forest and thus the cover stock of the forest. So if you can see here. Uh, that that the the right uh, the left side uh, uh, area or the left side region has lower FCD as compared to the adjacent area, which is the uh, uh, the area that has been logged more than thirty years, and this one is uh, area that has been logged recently less than ten years. Huh? So you can see the difference, and this is. Uh, why we are using the spatial or, or the, the, the satellite image to, sh to show or to, to uh, delineate this condition and to, to, to provide us information so that we can calculate the variation in terms of carbon stock. So we are talking about the, the, the landscape, a big landscape, and you cannot, you cannot go uh, for every point uh, within the forest uh, uh, physically. So that's why we, we have to use the satellite image. Huh? And then uh, this is uh, some uh, activities that we have conducted. Uh, we have about uh, 20 assembly plots uh, that is uh, distributed uh, within uh, several categories or several strata of forest. And uh, I think what Haja has uh, mentioned about this yesterday. So we just we are also following the same stratification system that uh, have been using. Uh, that, uh, that was used in this uh, study area. And uh, this is the sampling uh, <coughs> design or, or, or the, uh, uh, the plot design that we use to sample uh, the cover stock. So I'm not going to uh, detail in this because it, it needs two days training to, to understand this. Eh? <laughs> so I just go quickly and uh, we are measuring five carbon pools. Eh? When, when we are uh, talking about carbon, there is, uh, 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 there is five carbon pool, and eh? we call it pools or takunan carbon. A pool, this pool is the, a place or, or container that able to store carbon, eh? to store carbon. Maknanya dia macam bekas lah, bekas untuk simpan carbon. So dekat mana? Is the, uh, the first one is the above ground, above ground living biomass or uh, this, the carbon that is stored within the living trees. Okay. Uh, and then the second one is the below ground or the carbon that is stored within the root system or the root of the, the living trees. <coughs> and then uh, the C is the dead wood. Uh, dead wood, uh, there is two categories here, live, uh, tending dead wood and also the lying dead wood. Huh? And then uh, besides these uh, three uh, major pools, there is also a little form. Huh? Little four, which is comprised of uh, the dead uh, leaf and also twigs uh, from the trees that need to be measured. How much? Because it also contains carbon. Eh? And then the last one is the soil carbon. Eh? In this case, we we measure up to uh, 30 centimeter depth uh, uh, from the surface uh, to measure the carbon uh, carbon stock. <clears throat> Okay, uh, this is also again the, the sampling method, the protocol that we use to, to sample uh, the carbon pools. Eh? Okay, uh, this one also have been presented by Elon uh, this morning. Uh, so we can see here, I want to highlight that uh, the, the, the difference of the conditions of the forest will reflect a different uh, amount of carbon density or, or the, 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 the carbon stock that is stored uh, within each of the uh, forest strata. So you can see the difference here. Eh? Uh, but uh, in terms of carbon pools, uh, most or the majority of the uh, uh, composition of carbon stock is stored within the living trees or above ground living trees, uh, followed by uh, uh, below ground by mass and also the dead wood. Uh, and so on. Eh? Mm. Okay, so this uh, this is the model that we developed from from the uh, FCD that we have produced just now. So we compare it with the uh, the sampling plot uh, information that we measure on the ground. So 
uh, based on these two uh, information, we are able to to come up with with uh, a regression or, or correlation uh, that that will uh, uh, help us on on uh, in the projection or in the estimating the uh, carbon stock throughout the uh, uh, Umu forest complex uh, landscape. Eh? <clears throat> And then we also uh, measure uh, some independent sample plots to validate uh, the results. So from, from the model that we produced just now, uh, we found that uh, uh, the, 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 the error was about 60%, uh, which is uh, uh, when we translate into accuracy, which was, was about uh, uh, 84% eh, in terms of accuracy of the estimate. So let's move on. Uh, we also uh, validate the result through uh, qualitative methods, which we use uh, higher resolution satellites and also the, the, the drone image to compare uh, the, the FCD that we calculate or the, uh, the carbon stock that we um, estimate. Uh, is it correct in terms of, of, uh, of the uh, condition? the real condition of the forest. And so we can see here that, uh, okay, let, let's concentrate on the column C, which is the forested area. So uh, when we measure the uh, FCD, uh, it is uh, parallel or it is in agreement with the, uh, with the uh, uh, result that we produce. Uh. So this is the uh, value in terms of carbon stock. And then this one is uh, the log over forest, which is recently logged. We can see the scars of the uh, logging activities here. And uh, when we go to the higher resolution image, this become uh, more clear. And then uh, we, we, we compare this condition. So uh, <clears throat> the result uh, shows that, uh, that uh, the, 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 the produce uh, estimation is, is uh, is about 83 percent in terms of quantitative uh, is is uh, 84 percent but in terms of qualitative it looks like this eh? mm. okay uh, so this is these are the, the coverage of uh, several data set that we use that comprise of uh, medium resolution image high resolution image uh, uh, that to cover the, the whole uh the forest complex mm. And we also use uh, the drone uh, images uh, just for comparison purpose. Huh? And then uh, <coughs> the result shows that uh, this is the uh, FCD or the indicator that we use to, to, to uh, represent the carbon stock. And then this is the, the final value for carbon stock that we separate into uh, forest strata. Huh? So we can see that the protected forest, uh, this, this protected forest is including the virgin forest, and then uh, the log over forest, and also and, uh, the, the, the rest of the categories of uh, forest strata that we have in Ulu Munda Forest Complex. So we can see here that, again, uh, the variation of the carbon stock value within each uh, forest strata uh, we reflect the real condition or the, the real um, uh, density uh, of the forest. And then from there, we also can map out the results in a, a spatial form, eh? a spatially distributed form. That from here, we can see where is the, the, uh, the that has higher amount of carbon stock and where, where there is a, a low in terms of carbon stock. Eh? And the, the, the figures below the, the map shows the total, uh, the total in terms of uh, carbon. And then this is the average per hectare. Eh? And then when it comes to the valuation or, or uh, when we want to value the services we need to measure in terms of CO2, eh? uh, CO2. Because the, 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 the global uh, standard has said that uh, whenever you want to, to uh, put a price for the carbon, you need to, it need to be 
uh, in terms of CO2. So from C, you just multiply by uh, 3.67 to get the CO2. Uh, this is a simple calculation. And then this is the trend and the trend, uh, the changes of carbon stock from 2000 to 2021. Uh, we can see that the amount or the, the total amount of carbon stock is reduced, somehow reduced from year to year. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, value, uh, we, we, we put, of course, there is, there is a fluctuation, uh, fluctuation in terms of, uh, there is no fixed price for, for, for carbon or for CO2. Uh, even in, in the, uh, uh, the global market, uh, there is a fluctuation, and this is the figures from from 2008 to 2000 uh, to last year. So let's say uh, let's say we, we take the average number is about uh, 20 US dollar. Doctor, so doctor, excuse me, the time is up, but please proceed with your presentation. Make it fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is is uh, going to end now. So this is the value. <laughs> so that is the value of the, the services that we are talking about. Eh? So uh, carbon sequestration is one of the ecosystem service. And uh, uh, the, the way of how we, we measure it is uh, depending on the availability of the data and also the methods that we apply uh, 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 to the data to get the, the value. Eh? So we have about, let's say for the last year, we have about uh, 5.3 thousand million, which is about 5.3 billion ringgit Malaysia in terms of value. So I'm not talking about this because uh, this is somehow uh, related to the carbon offset and also the, uh, in the offset mechanism. And we did uh, also some stakeholder consultation uh, in September, which involved uh, several stakeholders. So uh, we come to the conclusions. Ulumuda complex, Ulumuda forest complex, comprises of about half of the forest reserve that we have in Kedah. So uh, the contribution or the 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 uh, the, uh, sumbangan ataupun uh, uh, hutan tersebut terhadap uh, ecosystem services uh, dalam carbon sequestration ini amat besar. Dan if you value that. Uh, the value that we, uh, I, I uh, presented just now can be can be used as the baseline. As the baseline, it's not it's not controlled, but can be uh, somehow uh, can be used as the uh, basis for the calculation of uh, ecosystem best uh, service value in carbon sequestration sector. So with that, I thank you very much uh, for your attention and just sorry, Mr. Director, for keeping the time. Thank you so much, Dr. Amdan. So we open for questions. Okay. Uh, Michael, doctor. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm, uh, 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 okay, I'm Don Haiti from Forestry Department of Peninsula Malaysia. So, uh, firstly, uh, congratulations, doctor. It's a very good uh, presentation. I think that. It's a very good uh, topic that you uh, shared with us. So, very interesting. Talking about Ulumuda, of course, we know that Ulumuda is a very sensitive area. Uh, and uh, from your finding, it's a very good uh, for policy department uh, to take uh, an action. Okay, question number one. So, I just want to know about the integrity of the data. So you show us uh, that the changing of the forest cover. So the integrity of the data. So uh, your comments are okay. So because uh, we have a lot of sources uh, in terms of uh, changing uh, forest cover uh, that uh, also used by NPO that are waiting to to uh, and everything you know about that issue. Okay, secondly, uh, I just want to know about uh, plot. As we know that uh, forest reserve Ulumuda is a huge area or a big area. So your sampling, is it enough that your sampling, you can conclude uh, your finding for this uh, Ulumuda forest reserve? 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mahadi, for the question. Um, for the first question is the about the integrity. Eh? So uh, we know that we have a lot of sources that we can use to uh, measure carbon stock or to, to conduct this kind of exercise. But in this case, uh, we reported that that uh, uh, the integrity can be reflected in terms of accuracy and also the error that I just reported. But uh, it also, when we, when we come to the uh, comparison or the trend of the carbon stock changes, it will reflect the management practices that, is, that have been carried out by the forestry department. So maybe that is the, the, the integrity part that you, you, don't want to, you want me to highlight. So uh, in this case, um, uh, actually, uh, satellite data doesn't lie. It doesn't lie. It tells you the truth. If you have uh, good quality or good resolution data, then it, it can tell you what is happening on the ground. So uh, I cannot comment uh, on your uh, uh, management part, but uh, in terms of uh, data, uh, that is how remote sensing works. And then the second one is about the uh, uh, <laughs> oh, sampling. Okay. okay, of course, uh, of course, uh, if you have more sample data, uh, it will be good and representative. But the way we did, uh, we conduct the sampling uh, is, of course, we uh, uh, get some help from, from the forest department, uh, Kada. And uh, we go directly to the, uh, to the strata of the forest. Uh, we don't simply, we don't simply uh, uh, do the random sampling, but we go to the specific strata, which has a, a, a proper uh, logging records in, in each compartment that we uh, conduct the, 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 you know. But of course, if you have more sample, uh, that will be good. Uh. Another thing is time, lah. Kita tak cukup banyak. Kita ada masa banyak lah untuk, untuk uh, to do this exercise. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Okay, thank you so uh, for the questions. So, any other questions? <laughs> so, okay, if there's uh, no more questions, another round of applause to the Tanda. Thank you so much. And now we are going to have our last presenter. Yes. Mr. Mohamed Fahimi Jafar. Okay, so Mr. Mama Fahimi is the senior research officer at Marbi. So today he will be sharing with us these species of Ulu Muda Forest Reserve and their food source. So, please, Mr. Mama Fahimi, please proceed. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi and very good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Okay, uh, I will make it fast uh, because I know uh, everyone is hungry for take a lunch. All right, um, my name is Fahimi Jaffa and this is my team. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, feel uh, to give me an opportunity to uh, join this project uh, in Ulu Muda because normally uh, in Mali, we just uh, cover uh, in terms of agriculture area, not uh, forest, uh, agriculture, forest area. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, the first, the first uh, one I want to tell you about the bees. What is the bees? Uh, the bees was the major groups in order in Hamletra. and the Hamletra, uh, the term of Hamletra is come from the female have a thing. Uh, so that means all of worker in the bee colony was a female. There is no male. Okay, and then the males will come uh, if if uh, there is a swarming uh, season only. Because uh, men uh, or the drones in bees uh, did not forage the food, did not forage the resin on other. So the, the function is for mating only. And then the bees are similar to the one group of the wasps, uh, we call it the speak about wasps, uh, but only bees are usually uh, robust and hairy. Okay, this one is the photo of the bees, uh, called it the Lofotigona Crinfort, because uh, in our project, uh, the the project leader 
uh, asked to us to take the photo of the beast, uh, the great photos. Uh, so, uh, maybe they want to uh, show the audience about the beast in Gunung Mulia. Okay, uh, the important of the beast, we know that the formation in the natural uh, vegetation, uh, and then uh, we know that most of the tree in the tropical forest are inside for the net, usually from this. Uh, okay, the beast not only we know in Malaysia we just uh, know about the stingless bee and the honey bees, all right? Because uh, normally in Malaysia we have uh, more than uh, two thousand species of the bees, uh, not only uh, the stingless bee and the apis militer or apis rosata. Okay, uh, the the important we uh, we 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 know that the the function of the bee as a pollinator, and then uh, there's uh, some literature uh, state that uh, the bees uh, will give uh, uh, more than uh, sixty uh, thousand per year uh, if we uh, convert uh, to ringgit uh, uh, for your service uh, to plant uh, to plant uh, to pollinate the coffee uh, plantation. Okay. Okay, and then the ones uh, of the problem in variation decline of pollinating, uh, say as already we like uh, often quantity data because uh, normally in Asia, uh, no one care about the bees because it's too, this bee is tiny, right? Uh, if the bees come to their homes, they will come to work, they will come uh, call bomber, and then the bomber will come and then spray in insecticide. So, uh, problem solved. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, and then the B species of Urumbula. Okay, the objective of the study uh, have uh, two objectives. The one is to assess the diversity of B species uh, in Urumbula. And then the second one is to obtain the meta code data from the B uh, using CLR marker. Uh, we want to know what uh, the plant uh, associated with the B, uh, what the plant taken by the B, what the plant eat by B. Okay, uh, this is the same area. Uh, we go to the Gunung Inas uh, rest area. Uh, second one is the uh, Route uh, 157 uh, uh, Road. In uh, if you want, if you want to go to from the Bali to the sea, uh, this is the, the area. Uh, the same thing. And then at the Kampung Gulau, uh, from the middle from the Gunung Muda, and then Kampung Landai uh, is about, uh, one kilometer from Gunung Muda. And uh, our supplemented uh, is the line transit. Uh, it's about 500 uh, meter transit uh, along the road, and then we uh, we uh, we use the Bait method, uh, which is the solution uh, honey and water, then we spray uh, to the uh, leaf uh, in the uh, sample uh, site. And then uh, the bees we capture, uh, which is okay, this is the uh, normal method uh, in insect collection, and then the bees uh, are identified uh, using uh, machine. Okay, uh, the result on bee species, uh, we collect uh, more than uh, 3,000 uh, 3, individuals of bees. Uh, Along the sampling uh, period, uh, and then the site two, uh, lot uh, 157 was the most abundant uh, compared to other. Uh, then the, this data, we can conclude that uh, when the area is uh, too far from the blue border, and then the pollinator or the bees will decline. Uh, we can show that uh, we, we can see at uh, the uh, sample area number four. Which is uh, one kilometer from Lumbuda. So the bee species it decline uh, is compared to the uh, which, uh, site uh, is adjacent to the uh, Lumbuda uh, forest. <laughs> okay, uh, the bees by tribe uh, we uh, have identified uh, is about uh, 12, 12 uh, tribe uh, of the bees, calling the Nibboni, Bombini, Apis, uh, Empine, Cosmini, and, and so on. Okay, I will show you. Uh, the species of the bees. Okay, okay. This one, uh, the species of the bees. Uh, we photograph it. Uh, from the left, uh, we have a Zalacopa. Uh, this one is Zalacopa person. And then the tigers, uh, the uh, the blue banded uh, bee. Uh, and then Amidila. And then the last one is Zalacopa. Uh, if if we found, if we look at the Zalacopa, the this one, uh, the body is so big, but the wings is so tiny, so um, we don't know how the bees uh, fly from the uh, one place to the one place. Okay, uh, this one is the tribe of my pony. Uh, this one is the uh, Tetragonula uh, pali stigma. We have the, the orange uh, belly pony uh, in Malaysia, the Tetra uh, pali stigma, uh, Tetra Gorilla pali stigma, Tetra Gorilla uh, Tetra Gorilla. Uh, 
what we call it, uh, Serindone. Uh, Serindone is uh, uh, normally from the Thailand uh, species, but in Malaysia, uh, we found it. And then we have uh, Apicalis. Uh, normally, we found it uh, at uh, 1,000 feet uh, uh, from, uh, from the sea level. And then we have the Heterotyrone uh, the species, the common uh, we found in everywhere. And then the Heterotrigona electrocastra. Okay, this one's the, the beast, uh, which is uh, from uh, the tribe of uh, Meliponi. And then the solitary beast, uh, such as uh, we have uh, Osmi, Osminia, and then we have the uh, Seratina. This one is uh, Seratina. This one is the. Okay, this one, uh, I will talk about uh, this species because this species uh, normally we only found in Ulu Muda Forest. Okay, there is no. Uh, species of this beast from the other area, okay, except uh, Ulu Muda Forest. And we suspect this species was a new species in Malaysia. Uh, so uh, we have the several work uh, to confirm it as a, a new species. Okay, and then, and then uh, the food source of the bee. Uh, okay, the, the bees we collect, uh, we, we know that the bees, uh, we collect honey, honeydew, honey, pollinizing and sapphire. And then something uh, that we collect is mineral such as salt. Okay. Okay, this, this photo is the uh, heterotigonite tamba. Uh, they will pass their honey uh, from individual to individual. So uh, that's why the honey is come from the vomit of the bees. Uh, so <laughs> that's why uh, in Malaysia we have a, a, what we call it a badang story. Right? Uh, you eat muta, so you have a strong body. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay. Uh, the method uh, for identify the plant in uh, in the uh, bees uh, we use the method of coding. Uh, normally they will use uh, esotericis, but the esotericis uh, is uh, time consuming because we want to uh, separate one by one the pollen and then we want to identify the pollen. And then we go uh, for metal recording. This one is the first uh, first track uh, to know about the plant uh, then inside the bee's body. And then the result on the bee's uh, food source. Normally, uh, we found that Garcinia species was the most heavily consumed by bees. And then uh, the second one is similar to Pelatus was the most that they found in, in the all the bees. And then there are uh, several bees uh, consumed of Pelatus family. Uh, normally from the Meliporini, Bombini, Ceratini, and Ceratini. And then only uh, Zalicopini consume Mitragana piosa, uh, or we call it Ketum. Okay, this one is a Ketum uh, flower. Okay, because uh, in sick, uh, they have a Ketum plantation actually. Uh, so uh, we found it, uh, only this bees uh, go uh, to uh, Ketum flower. Okay, this one is the, the top 30 of the uh, species of uh, plant, which is uh, associated with the bees. Uh, we can uh, we know that uh, the pattern of the, the plant species is related uh, to the size of the bee species and relate to uh, the size of flower or corolla of flower. Uh, we, we know that uh, the some species uh, uh, in family of the uh, have uh, uh, consumed by the bee, maybe the flower or maybe the resin or maybe uh, the plant sap or other. And then normally, uh, the species of the bee uh, we found uh, uh, is not, uh, not not far from the, the food source. Uh, normally, uh, actually, uh, normally, uh, if, if, if you talk about the meliponini, uh, the radius, uh, if you find the meliponini, they will, uh, they will polish is it's about uh, two kilometer uh, radius only. So we know if, if, uh, uh, for, for the further uh, study, for the future, if you want to know the, the species of the uh, of the plant uh, in, in the one area, so we can uh, collect the bee and then we know uh, what's the plant around the this area. Okay, that's uh, maybe the future. Okay, the summary uh, is the bee's uh, food uh, source will change due to the, to the seasonal pattern of the flowering, and then the size of bee will affect the size of flower, uh, the big flower from the big bee and the small flower from uh, for the small bee. And then during the uh, rainy season uh, of flowering, uh, shrub grass and astrophorani will be the food source of the bee because 
he found that uh, one uh, the plant uh, getah uh, after one of the diet is supposed to be. Okay, this one is the amandila, amandila zonata. Okay, uh, this one is the unknown species. Uh, we we confirm it as the amandila species, but we don't know the the real name of this species. Uh, as far as amandila, however, there's no the there's the chlorophyll pattern. Green the beast, uh, closely related to Emilia dalsoni, uh, which is uh, found in Australia only. And then this study uh, will be conducted in the future to great species uh, because uh, we just uh, go from the, from the, the DNA. Uh, if you want to confirm that it's the new species, we have a uh, lot of lot of work uh, in, in terms of morphology and then we confirm it with the uh, DNA. Okay, uh, that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mohamad Kadi. So, about the new bees, so you, you guys can name the bees? Ah, uh, yes. It will be your name? Oh, no, no. no normally, if you want, if, if, if it's sent to the new name, it's not our name. Uh, okay. Maybe there's someone name, uh, Menteri Besar Kedah or Agung Kedah or Or oh, oh, can you use Bulu Muda name something? Ah, uh, yes. Or, <laughs> so thank you so much. So is there any questions from the floor? It's a very interesting topic. Okay, Tuan, is it okay? Uh, okay, sorry, yeah. Again, uh, question. Uh, I'm not a researcher, but I'm a forest manager. So it's very interesting to know about your findings. So from your observation or finding research, uh, you find a new species, okay? So as we know that uh, bees, uh, we can find in a forest reserve in Pahang. It's also a big area. So we have a species of uh, Tuana and so on. So I think the environment here is quite similar with a uh, uh, forest reserve in Pahang. So uh, from your observation, so what is the special features, features that you, 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 you can describe? Uh, we can find the new species here. That's a very simple uh, question. So we have a new species here, but uh, in terms of uh, environment from uh, Pahang and uh, most of the, uh, our forest reserve uh, is quite similar. So uh, your, your, your special uh, element that we can find new species here. Okay. okay thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, the bees, uh, it will reflect to the climate because uh, in Kedah, if you're throwing the, the climate in Kedah, uh, it will, it will uh, place it at uh, zone one, which is uh, more dry. Uh, it's compared to the soft area in uh, Pahang or others because uh, normally the bees will stay at one place. If you talk about the Tuolang, Tuolang will migrate from the, normally from the Kedah. Uh, to the south area, and then they will start at KLA, and then, and then they will spray and then uh, die. Okay, uh, normally uh, we can conclude that if there is the species, the new species in that area, maybe there's the unique, uh, maybe of the plant species, uh, normally they will uh, forest uh, the plant, the only, the, the only plant uh, that they want uh, ready to their Spring. So normally uh, the bee species will stay at one place. Uh, if, 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 if you talk about the amygdala or the solitary bee or not about the apis. Uh, so maybe in Bulmuda there's a unique uh, area or <coughs> maybe the climate uh, and so on. Normally in Malaysia we found uh, new species is every two weeks only. Uh, sir, meaning that uh... Uh, roaming area for the bees is only four, uh, it's only two kilometers. This uh, one is only for the male pollinator or stainless bee only. Uh, so the mega bee or the the bomb bombus different uh ecology different biology. Okay. Ini berkaitan dengan uh, the discovery of a potentially new species. 
Dan dia jumpa di guru muda Horus hmm. Rizal Jadi saya nak tanya Nak tanya ke doktor awam Tanya doktor Dekan uh, kita daripada <laughs> Yang banyak buat environmental economic valuation How do you value the discovery of a new species And, and attach that value to the conservation Of that forest reserve Sepatutnya Syah yang Dr. Syah yang sepatut jawab Saya Discovery of the new species. Yeah. Yeah? So, what is the economic value? So, from the uh, what we call this uh, theoretical point of view, huh? so this uh, need to determine the the, the incremental net cost. Yeah. Ataupun the uh, when we conserve the area, we have new species. And then uh, we can compare with, uh, for example, degraded land. So uh, the new species will contribute to the contribution of the biology. Then uh, it is quite difficult if we found new species and what is the contribution to our environment. So maybe we need to compare if uh, under two situations. One is uh, Uh, degrade, degraded land mm -hmm. yeah? and uh, loss of species and then if we conserve then we have new species and uh, in order to do this maybe we can use uh, the uh, depending on uh, you know, depending on the uh, the value that we are talking about whether whether the direct use uh, or the option value or request value So uh, it's quite difficult, <laughs> uh, and maybe, yeah, uh, maybe we can use. Uh, you know, uh, the best thing is uh, 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 using CPM or uh, uh, this case choice model. You know, in this case, yeah? and it is very important if the the species is. Of pollination, and then there is another method that we can use yeah, for pollination, so it's like this, yeah? uh, using the chain in the productivity method and so on. So depending on what kind of problem and the issues, so we can uh, determine the method to use. So I think uh, that the future uh, is very good for the future, yeah? for genetic resources. We haven't done, I think, Uh, genetic resources, conservation of genetic resources. Yeah? Uh, so, not, not, not much studies have been done, not many studies. Yeah? So, in Malaysia, I don't know uh, uh, how many studies on genetic resource conservation. So, this is very important one of the aspects for the future research. Okay, thank you. Dr. Bakti. Thank you, Prof. QLA schools. Okay, thank you so much. So, any other question? Okay, stay in line. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, Only remember about how I got, got stung in the, the field when we ran away. But, so I really appreciate that, that we have this kind of presentation that gives the perspective that actually we do come across a lot of bees in the forest, but it didn't occur to us so that we need to see the same trees and so on. So thank you very much for this presentation. About the new species that you mentioned, right? Just want to understand was it Uh, detected at the slot closer to the forest or away from the forest, and what sort of plants that it was uh, it was hanging around? Is it a forest 
species, or is it a species that can be found uh, in the secondary forest or in couple area? Okay, uh, normally the species we found, the, the, the new species we found in Gunung Buda actually located at the road uh, one high seven. Uh, it's the road uh, from the Bali to Sing. And then this one is, is the uh, the area is the adjacent to the forest area. Which means uh, if beside the forest area and the agriculture area. Uh, so our uh, our finding uh, found that the species, uh, the new species, uh, consume a lot of the agriculture area, uh, plant from the agriculture area. So that means uh, it's not focused only uh, from the forest area. So they will uh, go to the uh, agriculture area. Uh, in I guess adjacent to the forest area, so the So okay, so it was found near the agriculture area. Actually, it's not. It's, it's close to the Ulumuda. Okay. So if there's no more question, thank you so much, uh, Stefanimi. So today, as I may conclude, we already uh, heard about water quality is as, is, is as important as water quality. And uh, we also know that uh, Ulu Muda Forest Reserve is approximately 10% of Kedah land area, but can accommodate up to 67% of total demand of water for Kedah. And we also learned that uh, the annual average of the monetary value of water being used for paddy planting is estimated at 422 million and the farmers are willing to pay additional for this water and um, we also learned that the the value of carbon stock from the study was amounted to 5 billion and we also might discover a new species of bee and we hope that this new species will have a unique name that represents Ulu Muda. So for my conclusion, uh, I can see there are some ambiguous data from a different presenter. So maybe later on, we can discuss on this data and we can choose which one is the more accurate data to present. And uh, Ulu Muda is essential for Kedah State Government, also the Malaysia, AKA federal government. And by working together, we hope Ulu Muda will be preserved better in the future. Thank you so much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so and all the speakers for bringing us to a very productive and interesting session this afternoon. As a thankful gesture, I'd like to invite young Rosanna Barahan Abdurrahman in front. Uh, for giving away token of appreciation. Please welcome Encik Mohd Fazir Matisa. Next, please welcome Encik Azhari Faidi. Please welcome Dr. Muhammad Sofian Sulaiman. Please welcome Associate Professor Dr. Bhakti Hazar Masri. Please welcome Dr. Hamdan Omar. <laughs> Finally, please welcome Encik Muhammad Fahimi Jatuan. Thank you, Panorana. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, participating, for active participation this afternoon. We're going to 
stop for lunch. Um, I'd like to invite everybody to have lunch outside of the hall. And we'll meet here again at 2.30 p.m. Meet you later. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan selamat tengah hari. Uh, welcome back everybody. Selamat kembali. Uh, untuk sesi pada petang ini, bagi perhatikan uh, polisi kita iaitu memperkasakan bahasa Melayu. Saya akan memulakan dengan sedikit pantun lah. Pagi-pagi memetik lima manis rasanya kena-kena. Selamat kembali ke sesi kelima. Semoga semuanya masih bersemangat. Welcome back everybody and we'll start our, we'll continue with session five with the theme forestry dependency. This session will be moderated by Yang Bermahagia, Datuk Nurhaidi Yunus. Um, please allow me to read his short bio. Yang Bermahagia, Datuk Nurhaidi Yunus holds a bachelor degree from, uh, in, in forestry from UPM, University of Malaysia in 1998. He also holds Bachelor of Science from Kochi National University, Shikoku, Japan, in 2008. He now serves as the Head of Section of Micro and Macro Planning for the State Department of Pen Peninsula Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome our moderator, Dato' Imbahagia Dato' Nahadi Yunus. Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon. So uh, before we get started, I would like to invite everyone to take your seat and kindly either turn off your mobile phone or put them in uh, silent mode. Okay, so before uh, I start my uh, session as a moderator, I just want to uh, raise the issue. So maybe I will conduct my, my session in Bahasa Malaysia and also Bahasa English eh? in English. Because uh, as a government, we, we, we got a policy, eh? everything now in Bahasa Malaysia. But I'm uh, quite comfortable in Bahasa English in English, but uh, to follow the uh, procedure or kata peraturan, I have to mix eh, at least a uh, problem, at least at the uh, Bahasa Malaysia skin skin phone, I think it's quite okay eh, uh, rather than I'll, uh, conduct my <coughs> session fully in English. Malaya, thank you, uh, Malaya MC. Okay, thank you, Puan uh, MC. Okay. So, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you, uh, MC, again. Uh, Dr. Dr. Rosli tak ada? Yeah? Because I was mentioned that uh, he will um, kata, uh, closing. Eh? So, uh, as a citation, uh, saya just untuk ni record yang uh, berusaha Dr. Rosli bin Harum, uh, Director of Research Planning Division from FRAME, the Honorable Guests, uh, Professors, uh, Doctors, uh, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. So, saya nak cakap lebih tadi sebab ada tipu saya dua orang, eh? Prof. Uh, Awang dengan uh, Prof. Syawahid. Eh? So, it's my sifu, uh, kalau in Japanese, uh, sensei. Eh? sensei. Uh, so, because uh, I got my master's from uh, Japan, so it's got fluent bahasa Jepun. So, saya pun my master's sikit, eh, my PhD sikit lagi. It is a uh, on the writing process, lah. So inshallah, very soon, lah. Inshallah. Amin, amin. amin. So my PhD actually from uh, Scotland, uh, tapi kita saya buat dekat UKM saja, lah. Because uh, ada certain uh, problem, lah. I can't go there. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Salam keluarga Malaysia. First of all, I would like to welcome you to the first paper presentation session of uh, the Friend Conference 2022, uh, unlocking the value of Ulu Muda Forest Ecosystem Services towards Sustainable Development Goal, which is uh, under SDGs. Eh? So uh, today is the second day. 
So I'm sorry because I cannot attend yesterday. I got a something or meeting with the ministry. Uh, so sorry for that one. Uh, so my session is under session five, forestry dependency, kebergantungan kepada hasil hutan. So I am Nor Haidi Ben Yunus, uh, Senior Deputy Director, uh, itu jawatan lama dalam yang dinyatakan tadi. Eh. Uh, tapi bolehlah rangkum sekali lah. Eh. Sekarang ni saya, uh, Deputy pun saya, uh, Director pun saya. Uh, section uh, ketua section pun saya juga lah boleh boleh rangkum. So under uh, forest planning and economic division, forestry department of Peninsular Malaysia, and I'll uh, be chairing this session, which will run for about two hours, eh? two hours, uh, starting from two thirty p.m. until four thirty p.m. So uh, I I believe we have uh, adequate time for our session. Uh, but one of uh, my friends there uh, asking me to shortcut, shortcut, not balik takut jam. We 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 try to manage that one. Eh? Okay. Today there will be four presentation, and every speaker will have twenty minutes. Eh? Remember that twenty minutes. Tapi kalau sepuluh minit pun lagi okay for their presentation, and five minutes for Q and A session. Just uh, after presentation, uh, I have to open for Q&A. Uh, sebab before this, saya kumpulkan semua sekali. And then after that, baru kita buat Q&A. Sebab tak apalah. So, I just follow the flow. So, finish uh, presentation. Uh, straightly, uh, I will open for Q&A session. To all presentation, please take note. Eh? Again, I say, eh? please take note and alert on your time allocation. You will hear a bell. Are they watching? Okay, say what you I will hear a bell. Uh, you will hear a bell at the 15 minutes mark to notify that there is only five minutes left for your presentation. And a bell at the 90 minutes mark to signal your last minute and please wrap up your presentation. A double bell at the 20 minutes mark will signal the end of your presentation session. Betul? So, correct me eh, if I'm wrong. Okay, the team for today's session will be covering numerous and crucial aspects of forestry related with the value of Ulu Muda forest ecosystem uh, services towards sustainable development goals. But uh, we will concentrate more on the uh, economic sector. So, Mana uh, Yan, Puan Marina, Online. Okay, okay. So uh, we strictly go for the first presentation. Eh? Okay. So our first presentation is from Frim. The title of the uh, paper is The Value of Non Timber Forest Product to the Local Communities. So, presenter. Uh, Saya baca sikit lah, dia baru bagi, saya baru terima lagi. Okay, uh, Mr. Arif Fahmi, uh, Arif, Mr. Arif kan bukan doktor lagi? Uh, okay, sorry, eh? correct me lah kalau saya salah. Mr. Arif Fahmi bin Abu Bakar is a research officer from uh, Economic and Strategic Analysis Program, Research Planning and Division from FRIM. So, uh, kepakaran uh, market study in forest economic and valuation of ecosystem services and uh, kata expert in herbal industry, trade and business. So, the professional experience, uh, 12 plus town experience in frame, uh, more on the research policy and planning branch, uh, economic and strategic analysis since 2016. Correct, uh, assistant uh, in the economic uh, planning, economic analysis strategy. Oh, okay. So, sini uh, economic and strategic analysis since twenty sixteen. Eh? Okay. Okay. Sorry, and thank you. Okay. Uh, so, our first presenter will share about the value of non timber forest product to the local communities. Without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker 
of the day, Mr. Arif Fahmi uh, from uh, Frame to deliver his presentation. So, Mr. Arif, the floor is yours, but please remember 20 minutes only. Okay, please, sir, your floor is yours now, so you can do anything. Eh? <laughs> okay, thank See. you, Dr. Andre. Yang saya hormati, Prof. Awang, Prof. Shah, Dr. Bakti, Sibra Imdin, Terima kasih banyak atas kehadiran. So, uh, today I will present the paper titled The Value of Non-Timber Forest Product. Or after this, I will refer to NTFPs uh, because it's shorter to the local communities. Then this uh, paper is actually uh, authored by me, Puan Rohana, Nofazrin, and uh, Mr. Zahari. Uh, I know uh, since yesterday there is there are big expectation toward the value of what was presented and I know that I should come up with the value but unfortunately today we are not yet to that uh, extent we are still final, finalizing the data so uh, my presentation today is actually some sort of teaser or just to introduce what are we trying to do and then uh, i will focus on the some uh, the data on the background of uh, the our respondents okay so this is my presentation outline uh, the first one is introduction of course and then objective data collection uh, that's why i said this is a preliminary finding uh, and this is uh, really unfortunate because i know the expectation is there to look for the value but we are really sorry we just finished the survey uh, in uh, one month back then there are a lot of thing to do with the data and we are middle of analyze, analyzing and also polishing the data so uh, for the value we will uh, try to uh, come up with the, another presentation maybe uh, in the next uh, seminar or conference then I will give some conclusion and way forward on what happened to the communities with the non-timber forest products. Okay, so uh, this is the picture of the <coughs> Ulmuda Dam, or we maybe we are more familiar with the name of Tasik Muda, but the local call it Tasik Gube. This is the, what we call it, uh, Muka, Pintu Muka, uh, the, the, the gate now of the dam, but uh, this is actually when the river overflow, the water will go straight to the Muda River. This is actually the Muda River, uh, but most of time, this not, uh, this situation is not happen. Uh, the dam will not overflow, but uh, the the dam, uh, the dam will stop the water from uh, uh, going direct to the Ulumuda River. So this is uh, just to introduce how the, the uh, Ulumuda uh, Ulumuda dams, uh, Muda dams look like, uh, Muda Lake, and then also known as uh, Gubel Lake uh, among the local. And then this is the, actually the introduction about the, my topic. I will talk about non-timber forest product, sometimes also known as non-wood forest product. Uh, what is it? It is actually forest product other than timbers. So timbers have always been known as the main primary product of, uh, from the forest. But however, we must acknowledge that non-timber forest product also play a significant role as the source of income especially for the communities around the forest area. So in this case, Ulumuda, later I will show how many people involved in collecting or depend on the uh, non-timber forest product by the local communities. Okay, sorry, uh, it's not on actually. Okay, so this is Ulumuda uh, Forest Reserve Location Map. I'm pretty sure uh, this map already been shown for many times since yesterday. Uh, but 
the red dot is actually where our sampling location mostly in uh, the uh, our potential villages around the Ulumudas, Ulumuda forest reserve. Then, uh, this is some previous study related to my uh, market for non timbers product. So, uh, Dr. Lim Him Fui have some uh, papers very long ago with Dr. Woon and Jeff Vincent on the market for non timber forest product in Paso Forest Reserve. And then Casper uh, Sparrow uh, and Carsten Smith also, 2005, the economic value of non timber forest product, a case study from Malaysia, uh, also can be referred. Then Colin, uh, non timber forest product dependence among the Jahat subgroup of Muslim Malaysia. This is uh, di directly related to the Orang Asli. And then uh, during the proceeding, Presidangan Kebangsaan Penilaian Ekonomi Sumber Hutan 2014 by the uh, FDPM uh, itself, Jabatan Pertanian Semenanjung Malaysia, uh, I believe this proceeding have also uh, uh, have a lot of uh, study on the market of non-timber forest product. So the overall objective of this project is actually to do the uh, economic relation of ecosystem services. It's bigger than something related to uh, market or approach only. But my part, uh, like I just mentioned before, I will do on the uh, relation of uh, the, the value of non-timber forest product or the market-based approach, which is something that available on the market come from the forest. Uh, but okay, for this presentation, we will go through the overview of the community dependency toward the Ulumuda Forest Reserve uh, within this 20 minutes. Uh, then I believe I can do it uh, shorter than 20 minutes. Hope so. So, so this is something about the data collection. Uh, before that, if I present on the uh, economic value uh, or uh, market value of this non timber forest product, of course. We do develop the questionnaire, but I go straight to how we collect the data uh, in order to capture who do, uh, do the collection of this raw material or non-timber forest product from the forest. So the survey was conducted on 102 forest product collectors. That means 102 people uh, really engage in the collection of the non-timber forest product or the product from the forest. And the, uh, this collector uh, was surveyed during 2021 to 2022. And then uh, this is the method of data collection, uh, how we do the survey. The first one is we do face-to-face -face survey. Uh, this is also the pictures uh, when we do the survey. Uh, this is actually the most, uh, uh, the respondents actually <coughs> Uh, most come from this kind of survey, doing a face-to-face -face survey. Then uh, we also do two focus group discussion. Uh, this approach is actually, okay, the first approach, when we do face-to-face -face survey, this is also important to get the connection. It, actually, this is not easy because to put the trust to the communities or the or kampung to our surveyors, or enumerators, it's so difficult. Mm -hmm. We need to build some kind of engagement with them before we are able to identify the collectors. So to identify the collector is also some kind, of, some sort of sensitive to the communities because they know sometimes they do something that they are unsure if it is uh, permittable or not to do the collection mm -hmm. of the raw material from the forest. So when we come up and introduce, we are from the Forest, forest Research Institute, uh, the, the first impression is we are also engaged with the Jabatan Perhutanan. Uh, so they will, uh, they will put extra cautious to the surveyors. Mm -hmm. So we need to build trust among them first. Then we also need to, to, to have a good, uh, relationship with them to to get another uh, information on the next person who's doing the activities or related activities or the collectors to get the contact of collectors we need to capture the first 
a collector and the first collector will give their network to the uh, surveyors or enumerators. But it is really difficult because we need to build a good trust to them so that, uh, and the, the question is actually also uh, quite time, uh, uh, consum consumer quite a lot of time because it's quite tebal. Uh, it's Amount um, uh, is around uh, 19 or 20 to 20 pages because uh, we capture information before pandemic and after, uh, during pandemic because the survey was done during the pandemic time. So after we have the, the good connection, then we come with this focus group discussion. We do have two focus group discussion. The first one was conducted in uh, Tasik Gube uh, among the Pesatuan Nelayan. The Ulu Muda is special because uh, fishmen is the first, uh, the largest group among the forest collector because they do have few uh, lakes around the Ulu Muda forest complex. Then uh, we do the second discussion uh, on 1st June this year in Kampung Landai, Seed Kedah. This is another group. The first group is focused to the fishermen or the uh, nelayan tasik. Then the second group is uh, for more on uh, cover the cover the uh, respondent from other collectors, including honey, bamboo, and etc. Then during our this uh, focus group, actually both of our focus group uh, attended by the Ali Parliament said Dato Ustaz Tamizi. Okay. Then this is the distribution of respondent. Kampung Landai is the most uh, 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 number of respondent, followed by Kampung Kota Au, Kampung Berante, then uh, the rest. Uh, actually, most of the respondent come in uh, from the Se district because uh, Ulu Muda Forest Reserve also cover in Baling district, right? but. Uh, I don't know, it's just a coincidence or what. Most of the respondent is from the state district. Okay, then uh, this is the background. Almost all the respondent are Malays. Only one Orangsli. This Orangsli is actually the Kampung Orangsli uh, in the Baling areas. Uh, it's uh, also in the uh, Ulumuda Forest system. So the gender is uh, 97 of them are males and another five is female. Then uh, the average age of the collectors, this is quite surprising. Uh, one group, this is actually the, the collector, uh, the, the thing that they collect from the forest. Uh, fish, honey, bamboo, fruit, rattan, rayong, some garu, singlet bee and medicinal plant. Uh, but this group, uh, the stump, the stump is actually usually used to make a uh, parang punya punya tu. Uh, ni then uh, ulu parang, then uh, they also do some uh, art carving on the ni uh, uh, the, the woods, so they collect the uh, stump from the forest. Okay. Uh, okay, this is by uh, the number of non-timber forest products collectors according to forest product category. The top one is of course the fish lah, because they have, they, they really established, they have it on their own first one. Uh, there are 39 of them. Uh, we cover almost all the ahli in persatuan. The persatuan is around 40 people. And then uh, the second most uh, number is honey followed by bamboo wild fruit, rattan, and the rest is others, means another uh, seven group is others because they are not uh, as many as the other group. So this is the prelim preliminary finding on the non-timber forest product collectors and this involvement status. Either they do it full-time, part-time, and seasonal. And as expected, we can <coughs> look at the, the graph. The fish, actually, most of them uh, out of the 39, 34 is actually do it full time. So uh, for another three and two do it part time and seasonal. But the rest of other uh, 
non timber forest collectors and non timber forest product collectors they do it seasonal as a seasonal or part time so in overall if we take all the 102 respondents uh, 44 percent of them do the collection activities on seasonal basis another 31 percent on full time and only 35 percent will carry out uh, the uh, uh, part time uh, part time collection and I believe the 35 percent is actually come from the fish group so fishing is the main source of income to the uh, majority of fishermen lah. they do it as a uh, full time now while other uh, non timber forest product collectors involved in debate as part time or seasonal so this is how much they depend on the uh, non timber forest product collection activities out of the total uh, income of their monthly income out of the total monthly income the main job and uh, non timber forest product activities actually contribute almost the same before pandemic uh, during the pandemic 45% of their monthly income are come from the non timber forest product activities collection and then while before pandemic is actually higher 53% uh, come from the uh, non timber forest product activities where uh, i believe the result is also influenced by the fishing activity because they are the biggest group uh, and this is the total <laughs> income uh, include including all the activities in the uh, categorized as non timber forest products so that's why i said the uh, fishing activity will give uh, uh, influence to the result the total the total uh, so this is my conclusion and we way forward i have another three uh, minutes uh, the preliminary result shows the community high dependence. So we 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 can conclude it is high dependence to the forest because half of their income during this group uh, among this group uh, come from the uh, non timber forest products collection activities or activities related to non timber forest product. And then sustainable conservation of this non timber forest product resources is very important because it could lead to uh, extra exploitation and whatsoever from the communities when they are to depend to the non timber forest product, but we cannot stop them because it. Uh, this is something related to the community. Not they are not doing it in a big big industry or so whatsoever. It just to uh, most of them are doing it to provide extra income to their whole uh, in monthly income or family income then that's why it is important to provide technical assistance to the community to in order to achieve sustainable use this means uh, instead of most of them now do it, uh, selling the, the product in raw raw form means we we could maybe add, uh, value add to the we need to uh, to interfere or to uh, introduce something to value add to their raw materials to become with something finished product which is uh, added more value to them then uh, to do that collaboration with the government and private sectors in various aspects is important how to uh, to provide them with the technical assistance and also to assist them to develop the product, to uh, groom the product, to groom their business ability, is need to do in hand with various uh, government and private sectors. So, and then the, this is the next step what I, I just mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, which is the next step is to integrate the green value of non timber product. Actually, we do take the uh, uh, to come up with the green value with uh, we do take the uh, price and harvesting cost of each activities and this is will provide which is with uh, provide us with the green value but the challenge is to match it with the stock which yesterday someone asked about the value of rattan the value of medicinal plants in the forest but the tricky part the first part is quite straightforward. We just 
uh, calculate the our finding, but the tricky part is to estimate the value manual forest since the most uh, hurdle or the most uh, 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 limitation to our uh, study is in term of sampling because we do have a uh, small sampling uh, which is make us very difficult to extrapolate uh, to estimate uh, the total stock of the non timber forest product dimension non timber forest product in the forest uh, but i do believe it can be uh, can be done if we can collaborate with other agencies where, where we saw a lot of other agencies also do collect the data from the yeah. ulu muda forest research so with that thank you Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, thank you again, uh, Mr. Ari Fahmi, for the eye opening and uh, enlightening presentation about the uh, topic uh, related with this uh, seminar. Uh, before that, uh, thank you, Dr. Rosli, for coming and uh, joining us. So, okay, so uh, okay, I open to the QA session. Okay, this, uh, Prof. For the case of Ulumuda, for the case of Ulumuda, whereby we know which is IDD, you don't have any population characteristic, right? Yeah. So I think you mentioned at the end of the presentation, this is one of the shortcomings of your research, right? So how actually, based on your finding, do you mean the inventory? I mean the, the, the inventory part. The, uh, no, the the sampling that you calculate the value whatsoever. Okay. The, 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 the respondents that you uh, survey and so on, right? So how actually the, the finding of the study can be integrated to represent to represent the land timber what's the NTF okay. for the for the case of Ulu Mulder. Okay. Uh, there are two elements in this uh, problem. Uh, the first part is the market value, but for the market value, actually, we are not simply uh, pick the respondent. We also depend on the second scope, which led by Dr. Huda. Uh, she done the survey for all the uh, villages around the Ulumoda Forest Reserve. Then uh, the total respondent is actually more than 1,000. Then they also ask the respondent if they involve in any of these uh, non-timber forest product collection activities, and then we pick the respondent from the survey. So it's quite comprehensive, and I don't think it's an issue for the first part of coming up with the green value of this non-timber forest product. But the second uh, uh, element, which involves with the inventory activities, of uh, all of these 12 uh, activities, actually, they do have the resource in the forest. We need to estimate how much in the forest in, in order to give the, way, the total value to these uh, elements or these uh, uh, raw materials or non timber forest product, uh, the value to give. So this is, I mentioned about this. For, for example, the ornamental plants, we do have the value at the green value, but to estimate how much this kind of ornamental plant in the non Ulumuda forest reserve is difficult because our team is just able to do one inventory for activity for the whole Ulumuda, one, only, only one place. So how to uh, estimate the, whole, the total value in the forest? It's also applies to the medicinal value. We where. Uh, to make it more complicated, complicate the medicinal, medicinal value is actually they have a lot of species and each species have different value. Yeah. And then, in order to estimate the the, the stock in the forest is also dif, uh, dif, difficult because uh, such we need to understand. Last uh, last uh, yesterday, the presenter I I think it, they present it's almost sixty species of the medicinal value they inventory. But how to estimate how much is the total value of each species in the uh, forest that we are trying to figure out? Then uh, this is, that's also why I come up with the transition to uh, incorporate or to uh, take uh, consideration with other activ uh, inventories activities done by other agencies or the researchers. Okay, thank you, thank you, bro. So. One more question, Prof. Yes, 
That's good for the presentation. Uh, I, uh, I just need a bit of uh, clarification. Okay. Because uh, based on your slide study, the income generated from NPFP collection may range from 45% to 53% yes. of the overall income. Right? But yesterday, when uh, Puan Huda made the presentation, if I'm not mistaken, she mentioned that the income or the value of collection is about 188 ringgit per month, and that only reflect about 9% yeah. of their overall. So maybe can you clarify? Okay. Maybe I misunderstood us. Okay, this is because uh, what Dr. Huda done is totally on the total uh, villages. The sample, the sample is actually the villages or the respondent is actually the villages around the Ulumuda. But ours is specific to the non-timber forest product collectors only. That's why they are higher. Because they, they, they the, some, uh, almost half of them do it full time as uh, the uh, forest uh, the collector, as the collecting activities. And some of them do it part time as their collecting. And they, they do it uh, as a commercial activity. So, but Dr. Huda just uh, the whole population of the uh, villages or, or communities surrounding the Ulumuda Forest Reserve. Okay, thank you, Prof. So, no, not yet. Eh? So, okay. I have a question. Okay. Actually, oh. as a moderator, I'm interested to ask uh, uh, Mr. Arika. So, please, okay? Eh? Okay, I have one, two, three, but very short and simple. Okay, in your uh, presentation just now, you mentioned that the community totally depends on the forest reserve. So, can we call or conclude that this kind of activity is a uh, uh, social forestry? That one is first. Okay. Second, uh, out of 100 plus your respondents, so we can see only one or less leaf. Yeah. So what kind of method that you use uh, for survey is a random or selection uh, respondent. And the last, uh, this one is a bonus uh, question. So your what about the collectors? Uh, they have a permit or what? Because uh, I raised this issue because of uh, you know the uh, forest reserve totally protected. Then uh, anybody want to uh, the muscle in our forest? Uh, definitely they have to pay a permit. And I relate this permit to the uh, revenue for the state government. That one is only. That one is also under uh, economic and eh? economic uh, eh, problem. So that's my uh, three questions, please. Uh, okay, the, uh, the first one is on the social forestry. Then the second one is on sampling or sampling for the orange yes. leaf. Okay. Okay, so I try to answer the first question, but this is more relevant to the second second uh, scope. So the second scope actually. A uh, second presenter is Parohana. She also can answer it, but <laughs> so you can reserve to Parohana to answer yeah, but, for the first question. Uh, actually, it's more uh, relevant to Dr. Huda, which uh, was presented yesterday, uh, to make it social forestry. In my opinion, this is my personal opinion. Maybe we need to make it more structured. Like what uh, the, uh, the 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 frame for the social forestry program was trying to do, led by Chepare. This is the potential uh, economic activities that are potential to uh, develop a proper social forestry activities. Actually, we do look at the possibility, and a new proposal will come. After this, we also uh, already bring our innovation and commercialization uh, program to take part in the activity. Uh, for example, if they are doing the collection of rattan, maybe we can create a proper rattan hub in the area. And then we do it. This is also can answer partly of the permit issue. We do it with. Uh, proper documentation and proper uh, what we call it arrangement means we cover the permit the required license by the authorities and 
so whatsoever so that it can be a, a proper social forestry activity okay. uh, then it's also will inclusive of more uh, communities around the areas instead of a small group of them now so it has a potential the, all the activity have potential but it need to uh, extra work need to done by the agencies uh, in order to assist them because uh, if we stop them from collect the 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 uh, for not timber forest product or the product or the forest produce other than timber but it, it won't help they will still do it because they live near to the forest and actually they are the most suitable person to have the most responsible in order to take care of the forest and then we should look at from that side then the second on the same thing of orang asli orang asli is um, huh? since the beginning we know it's difficult actually to to uh, take any uh, information from the orang asli uh, this baling area i don't have i don't have uh, the information on my hand but i can see in Tanura Hani around also. She know how much uh, household uh, in the this uh, kampung. But the, the the only one respondent actually the leader of the collector. But when we ask the leader, other collector, he said no one do it. But I believe uh, he just have tried to hide the truth. Uh, that I believe more of them involved in this. Uh, kind of activity, but um, maybe we can improve by uh, 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 creating a much uh, reliable connection with them, much trusted connection to get more information from them. Then the third one, permit some, I must be frank, some of them do ask for the permit. The permit is one of the issues uh, uh, raise up during both of the our FGDs uh, in the uh, do, um, with the Pusatuan Layan and also the, uh, the villagers in the Kampung Landai on the second FGD. The, the Pusatuan Layan also have the difficulty with the LK, LKIM to give the permit for permit for fishing and uh, also have conflicts with the forestry department because the jetty actually have the bump gate with where the Jabatan Putana should collect the permit. Uh, they also ask how to make them, actually they are willing to pay the permit, the collection permit, but they said the process, I, I actually uh, cannot uh, bias on this uh, matter, uh, but this is what they said, they, they, but this is more to toward their what we call it perception. Uh, the perception is to get a permit is very difficult, but I don't think, but on paper, when I get clarification from the forest department, it's actually easy. Uh, but I don't know, uh, this is something we can also look further how to improve the, the, the mechanism to, to join the uh, forest department and also the communities. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ray. So you have to collaborate with us, forestry department, and we will take action under our jurisdiction. Uh, so we have our forestry department of Kedah uh, here. So please take action. And then, uh, so I have uh, more questions, but I will reserve for our next presenter. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Arun. Give a tip to uh, Mr. Arun. Thank you. Okay, now we move to a uh, second uh, paper or so presentation. It's also from Frim, and the title is The Value of Non. Oh no, this one is the first paper. Okay, uh, an exploration of economic activities nearby the Ulumuda Forest Reserve. Is it depends on the forest ecosystem services? This one is like a, just like a question. Eh? So, uh, presenter Puan Rohana Abdul Rahman from Economic and Analysis Strategic Program Research Planning Division, free. So, 
Tuan Rohana Abdul Rahman is a head of program uh, under uh, Division uh, Economic and Strategic Analysis at Forest Research Institute of Malaysia, Prim, and the uh, expert in natural resources economics, value chains analysis, and impact assessment. The education background, uh, Tuan Rohana. Uh, she got a Bachelor of Economic UPM and Master's of Marketing UPM. So I'm not sure it's under Prof. Uh, Awang or Prof. Uh, Shawahid. Eh? <laughs> okay, so professional experience. So, uh, uh, okay, now uh, she is a researcher uh, at the frame. And she has been the leader of the six national projects. Sorry, yeah. uh, kata saya nila. So, sabar cepat panjang lagi tu. So, okay. He will, uh, her presentation today will be touch and share with us on the uh, exploration of economic activities nearby the Ulu Muda Forest Forest Reserve. Is it, uh, is it depends on the forest ecosystem services. Uh, without further ado, please join me in uh, welcoming Juan Rohana Abdul Rahman uh, to deliver her presentation. Please, the floor is yours now. But remember, 20 minutes. Eh? Okay, thank you. Please. Please. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. for sharing this uh, session. Yang dia hormati, awal sifu. I think everybody pun sifu pun. Ah, kan? Sifu dah ada dua-dua. Tak pasal ekonomi natural resource ni. Tak ada lain dari river. Prof Syah, Prof Awang. Rasanya tu je. <laughs> okay. Jadi, uh, thank you for coming Prof. Thank you for coming uh, uh, Prof Awang. Juga uh, Cik Zainuddin. Daripada jauh. Dan juga uh, Dr. Bakti. Okay. Uh, today, I will share an exploration of economic activity nearby the Ulu Muda uh, Forest Reserve. Do they depend on forest ecosystem service? Okay, I think the past two days, we talk a lot. I think most of the paper, we are talking about Ulu Muda Forest Reserve. That is a question for me. Why Ulu Muda? Why? What do you think? Why Ulu Muda? I think after two days, conference, presentation, we know how is the value of Ulu Muda, how important of Ulu Muda Forest Reserve, not only for Kedah State, but also for our national as a, a source for our food security, 40% yeah. as mentioned by um, uh, Mada, is a, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Bhakti this morning, as mentioned what how important the uh, forest ecosystem service from the Ulu Muda because the supply and the characteristic of the Ulu Muda itself with a boundary with the Thailand area and then also to Belum is uh, located nearby the, our central forest pine is really amazing. So we know that uh, 10 uh, hornbill species is in Ulu Muda and Belum, not in uh, Sarawak. It also indicated how rich uh, of the biodiversity in Ulu Muda. So I will share introduction, justification, scope of the uh, study, research site, methodology, and primary uh, preliminary findings from our study and also the conclusion. We know the tropical rainforest is uh, rich in biological diversity and Malaysia has been recognized as one of the 12 mega biodiversity in the world, being a natural habitat for flora, fauna, and provide a lot and offering various ecosystem services. This is, uh, I share uh, national report to our uh, Malaysia report to Convention on Biological Diversity. It shows that how overall biodiversity richness in Malaysia. We have 307 species of mammal, 700 uh, plus birds and others. So that's why when we talk about our Malaysian commitment towards uh, CBD, 
Convention on Biological Diversity, Malaysia is committed to ensure to maintain at least 50% of the country land area as forest and tree cover. It's very challenging. That's why the role of forestry department is crucial to achieve that. I believe it's not easy with a lot of uh, land use changes, uh, issue, and then the sometimes the dilemma between the forestry department decision and the uh, government decision uh, and others. I cannot say more. Okay. And this project also in line with our commitment towards sustainable development goal and the global target 15 life on land, which is to protect, to restore, and to promote the use of terrestrial ecosystem as well as sustainably manage forests and to avoid the loss of biodiversity. But the production of ecosystem is often neglected and the cause of the, this loss, we don't know how much the loss and always if something happened to the society, to the community, people always reflect to forest. Betul tak Dato? Ada ada isu je, banjir ke, jabatan perhutanan kena jawab betul ke, kerana logging ke apa ke semua kan. Ha? Jadi, this kind of uh, sentiment is really uh, what we call uh, very hot sentiment, especially with uh, NGO and others uh, also uh, about the decision of the government in terms of the land use uh, uh, policy and also the Im implementation problem uh, with uh, the to implement that uh, policy that already uh, stated in our natural uh, biodiv uh, policy, uh, biodiversity policy. Okay, because of that, actually, as, uh, in 12 Malaysia plan, uh, economic planning unit endorsed a project entitled Economic Value of Natural Capital Towards National Green Accounting. Alamak dah habis. Okay. Okay. Baru macam intro. Okay. So, uh, this project is a, a collaboration with a Forestry Department Peninsula Malaysia, Kedah State Forestry Department, UPM, UUM, Madas, Irat, and also the Mardi. And what is this project all about? Actually, this project consists of three scopes. First scope in terms of economic valuation of ecosystem services, also development of centralized database for economic value of ecosystem service. That is the first scope. The second scope is local community dependency and awareness towards sustainable use of forest resources. This uh, scope is led by uh, Sheikh Farid. Uh, the third scope is study on the value change of downstream industry around protected forest area. So we see that this scope actually uh, covering what are inside the forest, nearby the forest, and the spillover from the forest ecosystem service. And uh, I think this map is uh, almost all the presenters show the same uh, map. <coughs> For Ulumuda Forest Reserve consists of uh, lowland detroka about 17 uh, 11% hill detroka 62% 62% and upper hill detroka about uh, 27% okay this topology as i mentioned before in early uh, an introduction ulumuda is located on hilipiti wangsa ridge that's why the importance of ulumuda not only in terms of biodiversity, but also in terms of contribution of the ecosystem service to the local community and the spillover to the economic activity. Okay, these are the study area. The study area for three scope, different scope, as I mentioned. The scope number one, referring to the, we cover the inventory inside the forest. For the scope number two, we cover what, who are the community, villages, let's say, nearby the forest. If, uh, 
border uh, 5 km from the forest. But the third part is the spillover from ecosystem when we look at the value change from uh, to the economic activity in radius uh, 15 km from the border of Ulumuda Forest Reserve. Okay, that is the difference between scope one, two, three. And then what is the methodology that we refer to? We use the TEB, the economics of ecosystem and biodiversity from here. Okay. For scope number one, we cover on to identify what are the ecological structure and then the ecosystem, also the biodiversity of the Ulumuda. For scope number two, how this forest ecosystem or ecosystem and biodiversity related to the social uh, of local community nearby the forest. Also, for scope number three, we look at the quantification of the impact from ecosystem services and biodiversity to, uh, to economic activity of other related uh, industry and economic entity nearby the uh, Ulumuda Forest Reserve. We believe by quanti quantifying the spillover from the ecosystem services and biodiversity will help the government in terms of policy decision making, in terms of threat of analysis. We heard about uh, Kedah State Government looking for uh, compensation from federal, how much they will uh, uh, 100 million uh, from uh, 100 million from the federal and then the federal uh, said 100 million and so on. So this kind of uh, study can be used as a uh, guideline to measure the total economic value of our ecosystem service in Ulu Muda and the impact from the ecosystem to the community, also the economic industry. But for today, my presentation will focus. Uh, these are the actually uh, yesterday Prosha asking about the how you quantify the value of rotan, value of medicinal plant, whatsoever. As mentioned by NCRF, we just finished the inventory part. So uh, that's why, uh, and then we cannot uh, quantify each individual, individual ecosystem service yet, but is in our uh, pipeline because we have to finish all the calculation by end of this year to submit the report to economic training unit. And inshallah, we will share with others the finding from this uh, kajian. Nah, okay. This is the approach for economic valuation and ecosystem service that we use. For ecotourism, we'll cover by uh, Puan Marina after this and so ever. Okay, for today uh, presentation, I will focus for scope number three. We calculate and quantify the spillover from the ecosystem service. Uh, we use, first, we have to identify, uh, we uh, have to identify identify what are the product from the ecosystem service. Who are the actor for each product that generated from our ecosystem service and uh, from Ulumuda Forest Reserve? How this uh, actor is connecting each other? We call it as function analysis. After that, we will conduct the network analysis and spatial analysis, which is when we talk about value change, it's not only one change. Well, uh, uh, okay, normally we talk about value change they're only referring to one change, but in reality, it's not only one change, it's become the network analysis. Let's say, for example, fishermen from the Ulumuda Forest Lake, they, 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 they collect fish from the Tasik Gube, they call it Tasik Gube. Okay, even though there is no Tasik Gube, actually it's Tasik Muda. muda. Okay, but but local uh, local always refer to Tasik Gube. That's why uh, uh, in the beginning of our survey, uh, we find difficulty when we ask that you know Tasik Muda, they don't know the Tasik Muda because they call it as Tasik Gube. Okay, so uh, for example, uh, for fishermen, they use boat from who uh, when uh, when uh, they get uh, the boat. Uh, is it from the local or they have to import? 
Or, and then what are about the jala that they use for fishing activity where they get this uh, jala all uh, the resource that they can use for fishing activity so we have to quantify and calculate every single resource that they use and then where they can uh, supply and uh, market their product and then let's say for fishermen they will sell for perkasam makers over there or they can sell to uh, the wholesaler uh, for all fish uh, in Tasik Gube or for other restaurant or for other economic activity. From there, we will survey again about the perkasam makers. How they, and then from there, we tracking all the value chain from the ecosystem towards the consumer. That's what we call as network analysis. And we try to uh, uh, overlay with the spatial analysis and then from there we can quantify the uh, the contribution from the our ecosystem service towards the gross uh, 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 gross domestic product gdp national keluaran dalam negara kasar using input output uh, table okay our pathway how we do it is not easy as mentioned by our dg during the uh, uh, opening speech because the project is launched during the pandemic, MCO. Can you imagine we have to do it only within four months uh, since uh, last September 2021. That's the, the starting point that we have to finish and the, we have to start, we uh, get approval to start the inventory part and the all data collection part. So that's, why, that's why I agree that the time frame is quite limited. That's why we try to uh finalize our report and to show to the EPU as uh, our uh, kajian rintis what are the findings from other uh, our kajian rintis and then that's the selling point for us to further extend the study uh, uh to apply for another funding to more uh, to more to collect more data to complete the whole study okay we do a lot of stakeholder engagement with Forestry Department Peninsula Malaysia. Datuk Zari is there during the at, at launch last year um, with Forest uh, State Forestry Kedah. And then this uh, uh, engagement with Department of Statistic Malaysia, we have to ensure that our uh, sampling method is uh, correct and what we did is in line with, with uh, uh, CR that mentioned by uh, Datuk Sri uh, yesterday. Also, we look, uh, we do a lot of engagement with uh, local community, as mentioned by uh, uh, Mr. Arif. It's not easy to to get information from them, so we have to uh, give what trust from them to give uh, to provide information that we need uh, for our study. But uh, and then we do also. Stakeholder consultation last year in Kedah, uh, Alustar Kedah. Uh, then we juga also present a paper on uh, Kedah Forestry Department over there. This is the uh, engagement with community. And then uh, this year, uh, we do conduct uh, uh, focus group discussion uh, with Kampung Landai, as mentioned by Chi Arif. Uh, this is Datuk uh, YB Tarmizi. He mentioned about the project twice in our parliament. So he asked budget for government to, for, uh, to further extend our study, which is very encouraging. And then these are uh, some photos during the exploration and site visit. This is how we conduct survey, detailed survey for this study. We have two phases of survey. First phase is more to exploration. We count every single economic entity nearby the forest, mm -hmm. in border 15 kilometers from the forest. We count every single and we uh, 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 take the coordinate for each individual economic activity. For phase two, we do conduct detailed survey. Mm -hmm. And because uh, uh, after we finalize and identify who are the uh, economic uh, activity that uh, related to our ecosystem services. And then these are uh, the photos related to this one is honey, 
honey for from glue load and others mushroom there is a organic berry farm see okay uh what uh, that uh, apa, that besar uh, i can't remember uh, zakaria uh, okay okay General Zakaria, he did uh, organic paddy farm. You don't need to go to Sarawak to get <laughs> organic paddy. And then kita pegasam. What are the interesting part from our finding is actually, I can say that uh, economic activity is generated in Ulu Muda is internal uh, economic activity. They didn't depend much from the outside. That means something happened to the nation, they can survive. Because they have their own paddy, they have their own production. Then in terms of food security for their uh, uh, community, they can still survive compared to us. I think we have depends a lot from outside or import. Even for fishermen, the net maker is doing in sea for uh, fiber boat manufacturer also there. This is Pakasam. We know about Nestle, right? Nestle promoting uh, Kedah Kopi. Kedah Kopi actually is from C. Kopi Kedah. Kopi Kedah, Kopi Kopi Kedah. It's from C. And then we managed to, uh, it's under Kedah. Uh, we managed to visit the plantation for kopi. Cik Zainu dia tahu tak? Tahu kan? Uh, mestilah. Dah masuk TV3, majalah 3 apa semua kan? Uh, it's actually from seed. We, Alhamdulillah, we managed to visit uh, the plantation area for Nestle. And then traditional, we do have uh, capacity building. Oh, ten. Okay, 10 minutes. Eh. Okay, the capacity building activity. Okay, preliminary finding. Look at the figures. Can you imagine nearby for uh, Ulu Muda, there is 2,816 economic activity. It's a lot. Based on literature, for forest economic activity nearby forest with this number of economic activity is a lot. So currently, we are in the process of analyzing what are the factors that influence this economic activity. Okay, look at the figures. Here, number of economic activities by industry sector, which is 86.9% is for, uh, for servicing and retailing activity. For agriculture, about 4.4% is more or less same with the state contribution. Is it true? Right? Even for national contribution, also of, uh, around that figures, 4%. Or do, do uh, uh, from Ulu Muda also. So, what is the agriculture, forestry, and fishery economic activity? This is the activity related to agriculture, forestry, uh, forestry and fisheries, which is uh, 12 is uh, retailing uh, retail trade activities, but is related to uh, uh, forestry activity. And then 52 focus for uh, uh, fisheries, as I mentioned, is more to fishermen, uh, agriculture about 47 and livestock 24 and 74 is from forestry in picture uh, pure forestry which is referring to non-timber forest product actually okay out of first phase as i mentioned before we have two phase of uh, survey first phase is exploratory survey we covered 2860 economic activity from that we do detailed survey which is x percent which uh, 222, 222 is the economic entity that relate, related directly with the ecosystem service. Okay. Top five value change. We, uh, I didn't share the complicated how we identify the value change uh, activity uh, based on uh, function analysis that we conduct using factor minor analysis. Uh, we identify the first value change economic activity nearby the uh, forest ecosystem service is non-wood forest product. 
uh, we always refer to non-timber forest product, but this name is based on Malaysia Standard Industry Classification. They call it as non-wood forest product. Okay, because uh, after the, uh, uh, after uh, after this, we will compare with the uh, our national information. That's why we refer to Malaysia Standard Industrial Classification to make sure that we can compare same uh, same uh, sector uh, concurrently. Okay, the second is about the fishing uh, economic activity. The third of is fruit plantation is related the pollination activity that mentioned by uh, that uh, presented by Marty this uh, morning and then number four is ecotourism will be presented by Paul Marina after this and beekeeping and production of honey okay this is the top five how much the value is this but I have to uh, please do not quote this uh, uh, finding yet because this finding is only referred to the sample of 222 number of respondents uh, that related to forest ecosystem service, we have to quantify individual margin of error and population and whatsoever uh, before we can extrapolate to, to quantify the total economic, uh, total value of our uh, forest uh, ecosystem service uh, from Ulu Muda. And right now, based on our survey, we got about 17 million ringgit per year. That means this is the contribution from our forest ecosystem service in Ulu Muda to the local community. It's a lot. That means something happened to the forest in effect about 17 million income generation to the community. So in terms of the land use, we have to make sure that community part should be uh, in the process. Uh, I think it's in line with uh, Dato mentioned about social forestry. There is an opportunity and frame looking forward the collaboration with forestry department. Also, actually, we already engage with uh, our innovation organization to look at what are the technology intervention that frame can uh, incorporate with the ecosystem service. And then we um, mix together with the community how this uh, this kind of arrangement also can generate income to the uh, state government same time okay i could acknowledge everybody involved directly or indirectly with the project it's not easy to all communities and economic activities okay okay mm. Uh, sorry, to sorry to okay, interrupt, okay. Uh, okay. So just a kind remind, a reminder that the time allocated okay. to you is so Please uh, okay. wrap up your okay. presentation. Thank you, Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Uh, two last presentation. Okay, this is uh, our last. Uh, I share overall achievement from uh, our project. We managed to uh, assess uh, and conduct inventory for 17 ecosystem service. We covered 2,816 uh, economic activity. We surveyed 1,697 household head in 10, uh, 32 villages. Uh, and then one interactive webinar were organized with participated by 793 participants, six technology transfer and others, okay? Okay, with that, thank you. Okay, thank Maksim. you. Uh, Good. Uh, so very good. It's a very interesting topic. So I'm sure that our audience here uh, have a, a lot of questions uh, want to raise and ask for Rana. But uh, I just uh, open at least one or two questions only because uh, we are running uh, on time. So please. Okay, bro. I would just like to refer to the, the overall contribution that mm -hmm. about 16, 16, 16 million, right? Ah, 16 million. 16 million. 16 million right? uh, my suspicion is that uh, there are duplicates along the way because you are not adding the value adding. You are, for example, cattle manufacturing, right? It's the gross output. 
but within gross output tu the value of the rattan the value of the along the way you know? yeah so jadi you may want to think about adding the value add yeah uh, when you add the value adding then you can be equated dengan kita punya income national income lah yeah, you say you may want to check this yeah uh, i do agree with you bro uh, actually uh, we on uh, for this presentation i only focus for first part which is only for function analysis but after this we have to conduct the network analysis and spatial analysis mm. from this finding from that we can quantify and integrate uh, by using the value added and then integrate with the input output table and to quantify at the end how much the contribution from the our ecosystem service to our gdp thank you prof thank you prof so any question no okay no question eh? so yeah uh, i just also want to wrap up your uh, presentation so i hope that Paulana can share with us eh, uh, your slide presentation so audience can uh, go through the slide presentation and if you got anything to ask they just uh, directly to Paulana okay i agree with one uh, yes it's not easy and uh, very difficult for us especially uh, as a forest manager it's a very tough yeah. so very hard to uh, manage our forest uh, reserve but uh, inshallah we can uh, manage uh, our forest yeah. and then uh, since now yeah uh, the audience know a lot of issues and everything but uh, inshallah we can manage on that one uh, so under 74 to uh, clear that uh, forest uh, is totally under uh, state jurisdiction yeah. so state can do anything but uh, yeah uh, we still have to follow uh, the rules and everything but inshallah we try our best eh? okay sekali lagi uh, thank you Puan Luana and thank you for the session okay. so uh, we Proceed to the uh, next presentation uh, from Forestry Department Peninsula Malaysia, and the title of the uh, papers or presentation: the economic value of ecotourism in Ulu Muda Forest Reserve. Uh, presenter Puan Tuan Marina Binti Tuan Ibrahim uh, online. Puan, you can hear yeah. me, yeah, Puan. Dah ada dah. Kau di dato. All right. Okay. Uh, little bit uh, background uh, for Tuan Marina. Uh, Tuan Marina binti Tuan Ibrahim is uh, head of economic section uh, forestry department Peninsula Malaysia. Is under forest planning and economic division. So uh, she is one of the uh, economic economists in uh, forestry department. So uh, expert uh, for grading Gaharu from ITTO, economic valuation and total economic valuation, and also cost benefit analysis for various state for central forest uh, spine project. So uh, the education is a bachelor of economic from the UUM and uh, working experience 26 years in economic section forestry department peninsula malaysia uh, otai otai the forestry department eh? right. all the economic customer we will refer to tuan tuan marina okay so uh, uh, the presentation uh, he will share about the economic value of the ecotourism in ulu muda forest reserve i believe we can get new information about this topic it's a very interesting because we can predict, I think, uh, about the value of ecotourism in Ulu Muda Forest Reserve. And from this paper, the uh, value of uh, BioD or the importance of ecotourism uh, will be shared with us, I think, yeah? uh, my prediction. Okay, without further ado, I would like to welcome Puan Tuan Marina uh, from Forestry Department, Peninsula Malaysia to deliver a presentation with the title of Economic Value of Ecotourism in Ulu Muda Forest Reserve. Please, one, the floor is the floor with 20 minutes. Eh? Uh, it's your now, please. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Chairman. 
yang berusia uh, Dr. Muhammad Rosli Harun Director Research Planning Division um, Also my Sifu Like uh, Puan Rahana said just now Dr. Awan Noor, Dr. Shawahid Before yesterday When I came to that co this conference yesterday Puan Rahana said Like we are in Waiwa Because our Sifu that <laughs> All uh, depan kita kan Macam kita ni Waiwa sekarang kan All the uh, apa tu? All the research that we have done So uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Dan selamat petang uh, Before uh, I start from uh, my presentation uh, I'm minta maaf Kerana tidak dapat hadir Because I, I have another meeting At Petrajaya now Tak sempat nak balik So uh, I will present here and with me I hope uh, Puan Mukrima uh, Puan Mu and uh, a person that uh, a commit uh, like Puan Mukrima Puan Noliana and Dr Huda also there because mereka yang sebenarnya um, orang yang betul-betul memberi full commitment for the uh, economic valuation of nature uh, uh, for the recreational site ni So uh, I will present the economic relation of natural areas as recreational site in Ulumuda Forest Complex, um, uh, UMF, UMFC, uh, Malaysia. This project uh, actually is daripada macam Puan Rahana kata tadi, uh, daripada projek nilai ekonomi aset semula jadi ke arah perekaunan hijau negara. So uh, for the next Next, Encik Arif, uh, please help me for the next slide. Okay. Uh, for the introduction, according to uh, this, ecotourism can be uh, defined as responsible travel to natu natural areas that conserve the environment, sustains the well-being of local people and involve interpretation and education. Uh, Next slide. For our forestry experience, a uh, natural area areas area are recreational sites are uh, increasingly uh, increase 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 recognized as important assets in conserving natural resources and generating economic growth via ecotourism development. And the demand for tourism related to the nature is quite sus uh, sustainable and is fast expanding because I have a figure from uh, the forest uh, eco park uh, division, uh, forest Record division at forestry department uh, at two two zero one eight with a one two eight forest eco park and forest state park. The number that we visit, visit for that uh, forest eco park and forest state park is about 3.2 million and for two, uh, 2019 about 3.6 million but it's dropped uh, in 2020 and 2021 because of the COVID. Yesterday also Dr. Huda present about ecotourism development about 40.2% and just now Puan Rahana Uh, present that ecotourism number uh, and 26 numbers of entities for the ecotourism developed at the Ulu Muda, Ulu Muda uh, complex. Okay, next, next slide. For the information, just I want to share for 2000, uh, 2021. Uh, uh, Taman Negeri Ulu Buddha have uh, in a list of the um, of the hutan taman uh, hutan taman negeri in SM2 is uh, for the Semenanjung Malaysia lah. Then we have 132 for the ter ter taman ekorimba stand for taman ekorimba and hutan uh, hutan taman uh, ta taman negeri. Uh, about 132 uh, for the figure in 2021 and next next slide i will share the purpose okay 
Then I refer the uh, I focus the purpose of the study to estimate the value of Ulumuda Forest Complex in Malaysia as a recreation site through users' willingness to pay. Uh, the importance of economic valuation study itself is to support a policy. Like uh, the next slide, the Christ, uh, from Christie to 2006 and Jamal and Dr. Shawahid 1999 stated that environmental valuation technique can provide useful evidence to support such policies by quantifying the economic value associated with the protection of biological resources and externalities refers to the benefit that are not paid and also not uh, internalize the decision making process and uh, Harrison and Hester, uh, 2010, ecosystem services are always been undervalued and ignored, especially in decision-making process. And new uh, for the new financing mechanism, carbon taxing payment for ecosystem services, PES, extra can be further explored and considered to be implement implemented. And value added, this economic valuation which represent, represent a different uh, res, uh, perspective and reflect the, the important in monetary values of the ecosystem. And for the outcome and, and or the impact, the valuation will measure the outcome of the benefit of the conservation rehabilitation project by the government. This, this, uh, because the economic valuation uh, help a lot of for the decision making, like Dato Dato uh, Dato Chairman said just now, because of the economic valuation from the forestry department and lead by Dato Sendiri, um, see the importance of the economic valuation itself. Then uh, that's why lah. Uh, for the Jabatan Perhutanan sendiri still come, still uh, doing the economic valuation for the decision making uh, decision. Okay, next slide. For the site study, site study for this research, a site study for this research at Ulumuda Forest Complex. Uh, the previous, uh, I, th uh, I know that the previous uh, presenter have explained uh, all about the Ulumuda itself. Then uh, for the scope of the study, next slide, the, res the, the research conduct is on estimating the value of direct use through the, the, the application of non-market commodity valuation techniques. A direct use value refers to the value of service obtained directly from the use of the environmental resources services for ecotourism and recreation activities and estimating technique for non-market uh, communities to use to use the uh, CVM uh, co uh, contingent valuation method approach. The contingent valuation approach uh, we use a single bonded and open-ended. The uh, next slide, the contingent uh, valuation method, the respondent were asked whether they would be willing to contribute a conservation fee to preserve UMFC as a recreational site. Mm, the, est uh, the estimation of willingness to pay value is using logistic and OLS models. And the data collection, the data collection, we, uh, the data collection point, uh, we get it at uh, at Google JT and at Purdue JT. Okay, next slide. Uh, next slide. The result. If coming, the result. Okay, the result from the slide. From this slide, we can see the highest from Kedah itself. That uh, the respondent is about. Uh, we can uh, the. 252 and the uh, Kedah itself uh, uh, we, the percentage uh, about 18.6% respondent. Uh, others is from Perlis, Penang, Kuala Lumpur, Selangor, Johor, Terengganu, Kelantan and Perak. And, uh, and we uh, the next slide 
we also see the gen uh, gen gen gender and the age from this graph about 38 percent are female and 60 percent from male and when we want to develop the uh, develop the ecotourism at Ulu Muda, we can focus to the male activities because we get it and 60 percent 60 percent is from the men and the uh the younger the youngest program the younger the program we can focus for the young age because in this slide we can see that uh the age is 20 20 22 to 40 40 40 and above is uh, uh will help uh will visit the ulu muda uh, visit the Ulumuda of uh, area complex. Okay, next. For actually the, the risk also is important because uh, we can see uh, because we can focus uh, because now we can see that 245 is Malay that um, when we want to develop the when we can when we develop the facilities we can focus to the malay uh, malays uh, malays facilities uh, like sura or others and for the education for education also we can see that 50, 51% is from the secondary school and uh, and the occupation is uh, self employed okay next uh, this is the result that we come, the average is uh, income, the average income is uh, about 2,481. And then the, the next slide that I want to share is about the um, main purpose of the visit that we can find the highest of the for recreation uh, is they come for a recreation and to rest and others is to enjoy the natural uh, environment this is uh, that's why we have to uh, maintain the area for the for the for to to attract the the local and international international visitors to enjoy the natural uh, environment okay uh, for a tour for a tour information we find that our first visit to umf umfc is about uh 60 62 and and not the first visit about uh, 192. That is a, a they frequently visit to Ulumuda. And the uh, second, the next slide, uh, this is also uh, we can see uh, an average uh, average score for satisfaction with uh, recreational facilities. Um, we can see uh, the the you can see the uh the ranking uh the ranking about quality secure location uh cleanliness and the the function and the highest the highest the highest average score is for campsite and the second one is and uh, the highest score is the nat nature nature trail nature trail and uh, the second one is the scientific expedition center. And next slide. Uh, we we also uh, we also um, we also uh, look at the uh, about involvement in activities, social satisfaction, satisfaction, facility service provided, and layout of the recreational facilities. From 
uh, from very unsatisfied, we went into very satis satisfied that we uh, we we can find that uh, they they are very satisfied uh, about involved in the activities, and they they very satis uh, also very satisfied in involved in the activities. And this is a slide that UMC provide added. Uh, the uh, pro, uh, UMC also provide added value to the visitors. Uh, the higher ranking is really stressed, have a fun, closer to the families, and able to uh, exercise. This is very uh, important when the decision making want to develop that. Ulumuda, Ulumuda Forest Complex, they have to uh, suit the facilities and suit the program with that, this ranking also. Okay, for the next slide, the, uh, the, uh, the attribute for the performance that we also focus on natural environment, information services, and staff feedback and facilities condition. We found that we found that um, this, they, sati they satisfied uh, for the natural environment. And the, they also satisfied about the uh, about the facilities condition there, okay. And the next is a witness to pay that the objective of the research, the price ranking of uh, that uh, we we ranking uh, five ringgit to thirty ringgit, and we found that from the others, the, uh, we found that. Uh, from this research, we, uh, we found the average level of winners to pay for the conservation is 12 ringgit, 12 ringgit, uh, uh, 12.3 and six, uh, 63 uh, cents. This is, uh, uh, I think from my experience, this is the higher, this uh, uh, quite highest that uh, people willingness to pay for the conservation areas. Okay, let's next slide. This is the slide that I see just now. And the, the next slide is the overall values analysis to estimate the estimation of the mean value of willingness to pay and the measurement of the values of economic benefits. From the dichotomous uh, choice logistic, we found that mean willingness to pay is 14 ringgits, and the open ended, we found that uh, 13 ringgit. And the overall value analysis, the values of the uh, of net benefit of UMFC conservation for recreation and ecotourism based on mean willingness to pay from logistic and OLS model, we found that. Uh, in year 2022, number of the visitors 5,000, uh, we can estimate that about uh, the value about 70,700 with a uh, decatomous uh, choice logistic. And for the open-ended OLS, we need to pay with uh, 13 ringgit. We found that the value is about thirty five thousand four hundred for the uh, for the uh, for the ecotourism value. Uh, from this slide, I think that's uh, my that is my presentation for the economic uh, valuation of natural area as a recreational site in Ulumuda Forest Complex, uh, Malaysia. Thank you, uh, Dato Chair. Okay, thank you, Puan uh, Marina, for the informative and interesting presentation. So now I open to Q&A session. Uh, so anybody have a question? 
So I can ask uh, Puan Tuan Marina, and then I can ask uh, Tuan, Puan, Tuan Puan Marina later because we are the same uh, under uh, same division. Anytime I can ask uh, Puan Tuan Marina, inshallah. Okay, Puan, your first uh, question from uh, from Shawai. Okay, please. Assalamualaikum, Tuan Marina. Okay, salam Dr. Eh, Dr. Uh, saya berminat dengan uh, analisa yang dibuat sebab uh, pengalaman saya bila saya guna travel cost method mm -hmm. dapat nilai yang tinggi RM20, RM60, mm -hmm. consumer surplus mm -hmm. kalau kita guna contingent valuation ataupun method most choice punya approach uh, tendensinya akan menurun dia punya risk sebab kita menanya orang banyak mana nak bayar ya yeah, ya yeah, betul hypothetical you boleh mm -hmm. nak 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 kod dari high value ya yeah, ya yeah, yeah. perlu reveal preference maknanya berdasarkan kepada pengalaman orang depend on people travel so far tu butuh mudah cost of transportation kalau nak nilai tu tak tinggi tak kena sanggup susah payah tinggi yeah. so of travel and so on mm -hmm. Jadi saya minta pandangan dalam kes-kes macam ini macam mana nak 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 kita justify nak guna travel cost ke nak guna data uh, tools choice approach yang you buat. Uh, uh, terima kasih uh, yang berusaha uh, doktor nak jawab soalan uh, Cifu ni rasa macam aduh dahlah uh, saya koordin uh, apa tu Moderator saya, my boss. Lepas tu, Sifu pula soal. Um, tapi yang boleh membantu saya ialah Puan Mukrimah kalau ada kat situ, Puan Muk. Ya, ya Puan Muk, ada kat situ, ya? Puan Muk lagi, ya. Minta, minta talian hayat. Minta talian hayat. Ha? <laughs> uh, Puan Muk nak jawab dulu ke? Saya nak jawab dulu. Tak ada, Bu. Ha? Puan Muk tak ada. Ah, Puan Muk tak ada. Okey, Puan Muk tak ada. Okey. Uh, uh, bagi jawapan tadi uh, yang bersama doktor, uh, yang bersama doktor, bagi saya lah, uh, memang uh, saya pun tengok daripada research, uh, daripada research-research lepas, perbezaan yang ketara antara kalau kita buat travel cost method dengan yang uh, yang saya buat ni, because of the Maybe because of the area, Doctor. Jika saya pasang, jika area tu, that, jika is area is very exclusive, ah, uh, the uh, the area is very exclusive. I think the ulu muda, ah, uh, my opinion, ulu muda is like um uh, um uh, like taman negara, hutan taman negeri is very exclusive. If better we use the CVM, uh, CVM method. Ah, uh, is my this my opinion. Ah, uh, this my opinion. And but is and uh, if there is a uh, like hutan uh, like uh, hutan lipo ataupun uh, the area that uh, a small small area that don't have uh, any much activities, this is suitable for the travel cost method. Ini semai opinion tu, tapi pulang kepada kajian lah tu, ya. Eh. Saya pun tengok daripada analisa daripada kajian-kajian uh, lepas juga tu. Terima kasih. Okay, thank you, Puan Tuan Marina. So from hope that I can answer your question. Shabbat. Hmm. Okay, so uh, any question? One, two, three, no. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, very fast. Okay, okay, I give you. Uh, Nak nak tanya. Oh, okay. So okay. So again, so, thank you, Puan Tuan Marina. So please uh, give a big shout to Puan Tuan Marina for his presentation. Dear Honorable Prof, Dato, Prof, Doctors, uh, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. So our first uh, three presentation has covered on the scope of forestry dependency. The Dependency in Ulu Muda Forest Reserve, which is uh, highlighted the economic, the value of uh, non-forest products, uh, local commodities, uh, strategies, uh, and etc. Now we move to our fourth or last presentation for this session. So, 
Saya call for Puan Cik eh, Cik eh Cik lagi ah, Cik. Okay, Sorry ya eh. So Cik Fatin Atikah Roslan From Forest Eco Park and Forest State Park Division Kedah State Forestry Department And the title of uh, your presentation eh, Puan eh, Cik uh, Fatin The role and planning of the Kedah State Forestry Department for Ulu Muda Forest Reserve to a Sustainable Development Goal. This one uh, is a very special uh, paper uh, because uh, Fatin, Chief Fatin uh, is uh, forestry, uh, Kedah State Forestry Department is a guardian of penjaga kepada forest uh, reserve Ulu Muda. So uh, I think uh, it's a very interesting uh, presentation. So anybody you waiting for your presentation, Cik Pati, eh? So without you, I, I pass to you for your uh, presentation, please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and very good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nahidi, for the introduction. I'm Fatin, representative of Kedah Street Forestry Department. Um, I'm sure that all of us will receive a lot of information from each keynote or, or presentation regarding on flora, fauna, hydrology, uh, economy, and uh, socioeconomy. So I am the last presenter for today to represent about the rule and planning of the Kedah State Forestry Department for the Ulumuda Forest Reserve towards Sustainable de Development Goals. So uh, before I go further, let me introduce a little bit background of Ulumuda Reserve Forest. So Ulumuda Forest Reserve is one of the largest forest reserve in Peninsula Malaysia and also classified as tropical rainforest. So, expanding across the eastern and southern parts of Kedah, Ulumuda Forest Reserve measure approximately total 105,059 hectares, boosting a hilly topography consisting of land of low land zitrocot forest. Out of its total area, 88,232 hectares are classified as production forest and the rest, 16,827 hectares are classified as protected forest. So the protected forest of Pulumuda Forest Reserve plays a critical function as a platform for conservation, as well as the ecological economic powerhouse that is essential to the economic well-being of its surrounding community. So Ulumuda Forest Reserve also located under the tree administration, which is District Forest Office of Central, North and South of Kedah. Okay, so 88,232 hectares is the production forest. For your information, for the timber harvesting in production forest, Kedah State Forestry Department was applied the log fisher technology for the Ulumuda Forest Reserve. So the operational application of the log fisher technology was applied to reduce the impact logging. And I'm really sure that all of us familiar with this operational application of log fisher. Okay, next. Nation criteria and indicator for sustainable forest management. As we all know, management certification is an important activity at the international level, especially in the trade of timber product. So implementation of MCNI for SFM by Kedah State Forestry <coughs> Department to the important maintaining the forest resources, especially of, uh, in Ulumuda Forest Reserve of the country, particularly in area, of the permanent forest reserve. Okay, so now we move to protected forest. Out of the 16,827 hectare of forest 
at, uh, of the protected forest consists four types of forest, which is uh, water catchment forest, virgin forest, land protected forest, and state park forest. So a part of Ulumuja Forest Reserve is an ecological economic corridor that has provided the local communities from various economic activities such as commercial fisheries, ecotourism, health and beauty, food sources, and furniture manufacturing. Okay, so uh, this is the economic activity that will be in Ulumuja Forest Reserve, which is a uh, fisheries, ecotourism, health awareness, furniture manufacturing, food sources. I think five elements of these economic activities will be explained more by uh, Point Rohana just now. So this is a few photos that we taken uh, in Ulubudia Forest Reserve. So to maintain the sustainable of forest resources and improve the economy of local population. So for the focus, uh, for the sustainable development goals, our focus on Ulumuda State Park. So the SDG goal, life on land, protect, restore and promote the sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystem, manage forests, prevent use, stop and restore land degradation, and stop the sustainable loss of biodiversity. To ensure the conservation, restoration, and sustainable use of terrestrial and inland freshwater ecosystem and their services, particularly forests, wetland, mountain, and dry land, in line with obligation under international agreement. So the SDG indicator is forest area as part of the total land area, which is Ulumudia Forest Reserve. So um, maybe not all people know that a part of Ulumudia Forest Reserve were uh, out of that uh, area was uh, gazettement uh, was gazetted uh, as Ulumuda State Park. So the total area for Ulumuda State Park is 26,270 hectares. <clears throat> so the Ulumuda consists, uh, the Ulumuda uh, State Park consists of uh, three forest reserve, which is Chebabasa Forest, uh, Chebabasa Forest Reserve. Padu Forest Reserve and Ulumuda Forest Reserve. So Ulumuda State Park was gazetted on 10 May 2018. Uh, after this, uh, after that, in 2019, Kedah State Forestry Department was uh, were applied for the allocation under the Perth Malaysia Plan uh, for the development of Ulumuda State Park. So this is uh, the map of. Um, Ulumuda State Park. So the green, uh, the green color is Ulumuda State Park, and the, the blue color is water catchment area. Okay, for the objective the, uh, of the development of Ulumuda State Park, first to produce an action plan for the management of Ulumuda State Park. Number two, to develop the ecotourism sector and community-based product. Number three, to conserve and preserve the forest treasure. And number four, to increase the level of community awareness regarding the importance of protecting the forest treasure. So there are four justification uh, for the development of Ulu Modest Park. <coughs> So the number one is to produce an action plan of the management of Ulmuda State Park as our guardian. So since 2021, Kedah State Forestry Department has appointed Prim Incorporation to help us to produce an action plan for our guardians. So number two is to develop, to develop the base area with an ecotourism based on community. 
So for now, uh, if you can see here in uh, Tonkalen Gubi, there, there are no systematic layout uh, that's suitable for ecotourism area. So uh, our, our, in our action plan, uh, we also uh, suggest to input this element to help us how we want to develop a new uh, area that's suitable for ecotourism. <coughs> so after this, I will show uh, some, a few design that uh, Fring suggest to us about the JT. So the number three is conserving some degraded area by planting and treatment the seedling. So in the in the in our action plan also uh, identify some the degraded area that will we plan for uh, tree planting. So number four is to increase the awareness among the local community and the public about the importance of Ulumuda State Park for. Number four justification, uh, start uh, this year, we made uh, three times of corporate social program with community at Gube, Gube Lake. So um, this is the timeline for development of Ulumuda State Park. So the financial performance for this development take five years. Is starting from 2021 until 2022. So there are five scope uh, in this project, which is manage and development action plan of Ulubuda State Park, planting and treatment of seedling, monitoring and evaluation, the development of base area Gubi, which is we will build a jetty, visitor center, and exhibition hall. Um, if you come to Ulumuda State Park, uh, the, the main attraction there, you come here to get uh, makanan kampung, masakan kampung. And then for uh, apa, the, the, the view, but uh, for actually, uh, they are actually based on the Encik Shafish presentation, there are a lot of new species that we can uh, we can explore it and tell the villagers people what are the when can develop the area. So number five is corporate social responsibility program for increase the awareness among the community. Okay, uh, this is the interim report that we received on 2021 about the action plan of Ulumuda State Park. And in this year, we also made a consultation session with the local community about the development uh, that we have started uh, next year for Ulumuda. And we also made the consultation session with the stakeholder. And this is a CSR program with the local community. And every CSR program, we distribute uh, seedling uh, to, to encourage them to plant in tree. Okay, so starting from 2023 until 2025, uh, this is uh, our, our planning that we want to divide in four zones, which is inclusive zone, education zone, pit stop, leisure zone, and extreme recreation zone. Because uh, our state, our Kedah State Forestry, uh, our forestry Department uh, want to focus on ecotourism first. So for the inclusive zone, it will focus in on ecotourism activities that allow it to spend to limited capacity limits and tourism activities with continuous com uh, monitoring. Second, education zone. Visitor can learn about natural history, such as the Mungajah area in Tasik Number three, pit stop leisure zone. 
area that can accommodate a larger number of visitors, such as in the Pankalan Gubri Jetty area. And number four, extreme recreation zone. Uh, this is for someone who like hiking. So for climbing activities, uh, hiking activities involving the rich environment in Padu Lake, like Kaki Terbang and Batu Merah Mountain. So uh, for your information also, Kedah State Forestry Department have their own Maling Gunung Kehutanan. That's, uh, we, we, we produce uh, we get the money from uh, the villagers' paper. So this is uh, the design that a print operated suggested to Kedah State Forestry Department to be applied uh, in the Gubi Lake. So inshallah, uh, this project will start uh, next year. So this is some design that uh, I show. This is the JT because uh, when we go to Gubi Lake, we see there are small systematic layout. So with this uh, project, we want to build some uh, building that uh, look more systematic to uh, be a once product to our promote. Okay, this is a parking area. So at the same time, we also will produce interpret interpretation panel. And these are uh, places that for OOTD. OOTD. <laughs> Office. Yeah. Office. Yeah. Okay, so for the rule and planning. First, it's about conservation of biodiversity resources, which is with, uh, divided by four for flora, fauna, hydrology, and tree planting. So priority will be given to flora conservation in compartment 112, Ulumudia Forest Reserve, because there are three endangered species classified as vulnerable. And some parts of the Ulumudia State Park are uh, area is identified as the central forest pine. This area will be fully protected and planting tree in the great degraded area and ensure that there are no pollution in the river and lake. So this is I mentioned just now. Uh, we will focus on ecotourism development, which is uh, we will divide on four uh, zone, inclusive zone, education zone, pit stop leisure zone, and recreation, and recreation, extreme recreation zone. So, uh, for the strategy implementation, first, every year we will do the CSR program. This is the way how we want to uh, get into with the villages people because after this uh, we want to uh, manage the Ulumuda State Park and uh, another place uh, that protected in Ulumuda Forest Reserve with the cooperation with the local communities. The second is periodic monitoring to ensure the biodiversity will not affected. Number three, inventory and research regarding flora and fauna. And at the same time, uh, Kedah State Forestry Department also um, if uh, someone wants to do research on this area. And we also training for community to learn about interpretive and involved in research. Uh, number five, we will create environmental education program which is uh, after this, we will try and make uh, like good race program with the community, with the students to, to, yeah, to learn about the fauna and flora. And then also we will create a tour package and documentary video to promote this area. So before we promote this area, we want to create a new product for the Ulumuda uh, State Park and Ulumuda Forest Reserve. 
So for the conclusion, Kedah State Forestry Department will continue to monitor and carry out ongoing study to ensure the natural sustainable sustainability of Ulubuda Forest Reserve. The importance of local community support in Ulubuda Forest Reserve management will produce the effective management. And last one, the local community involvement in activities organized by the Kedah State Forestry Department, such as awareness program will be implemented. So that I think uh, that's all for me. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Uh, the new dimension uh, for Ulu Ulu Forest Reserve. So, good move and good initiative uh, from Forestry Department of uh, Keda uh, to make this Ulu Ulu Forest Reserve as a, a state park. Uh, state park, huh? so this, state, state park. I'm going to okay, state park. So in future, we hope that uh, we will have a proper uh, master plan and structured development to conserve this area. So uh, you have to follow all the uh, planning, uh, master plan, to make sure that uh, we can protect this area according to our uh, master plan. OK, so I open to a Q&A session. So anybody want to ask uh, Chief Fatin? Uh, regarding to the uh, topic that uh, uh, is already uh, presented, please. For the so any everybody that I think had uh, body dalam me, but uh, our jasad is not around us now, eh? <laughs> including me. Eh? <laughs> so, uh, bro, uh, any question, bro? Uh, so that is Allah saya tanya lah satu. Okay, berarti berarti lah. Just uh, I mentioned uh, just now that it's a very good initiative uh, to make this uh, forest reserve as a state park. Uh, state park. Uh, one question related. So I just want to know the impact or effect to the local communities when you develop. Or you guess at this area as a state park in terms of economic and everything related. So people surrounding that, uh, who we, we as a, we know that kata boleh cari makan dalam ni lah. But since uh, after you carikan uh, this area as a, a state uh, taman negeri, of course uh, we have a. Uh, undang-undang uh, and everything that sometimes kita uh, kita meningkat mereka. So your uh, pandangan berkenaan dengan uh, apa yang dibangkitkan tadi. Of course, benda itu baik, but we have to uh, kata tengok uh, secara menyeluruh. So your comment, please. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you Dato for the creation. So uh, regarding the creation, that's mengenai um, isu yang berlaku di Ulu Muda bila kita gazet sebagai Ulu Muda State Park so uh, macam mana dengan kita dah tertakluk kepada undang-undang kita so orang yang nak masuk kena ada permit so bila orang kampung untuk buat kerja-kerja uh, di dalam tu yang memang menjadi orang kata memang selalu untuk tempat mereka cari rezeki dan masuk cari ikan uh, berniaga so macam mana uh, how the Kedah State Forestry want to 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 solve it uh, for me? Uh, kalau kita refer section 46 dalam Akta Kutanan Negara 1985, uh, dalam section tu mengatakan yang untuk uh, basic needs for villages uh, tidak perlu uh, kita apa uh, tidak perlu ada kelulusan permit lah but uh, mesti perlu ada kelulusan uh, daripada uh, kerajaan negeri walaupun itu mesti ada kelulusan daripada kerajaan negeri dan mungkin uh, pada kami di Kedah uh, di, di Jabatan Pertanian Kedah kita akan uh, create satu paper kita akan buat perbincangan dulu dengan penduduk kampung dan akan buat satu kertas kerja untuk diangkat kepada kerajaan negeri untuk mengucuanikan 
uh, orang-orang kampung yang mencari uh, rezeki di kawasan tersebut daripada permit kecuali uh, kita untuk yang untuk ekotourism ni baru kita ni lah uh, so itu inisiatif kami lah mungkin kami akan buat perbincangan secara teliti dengan uh, penduduk kampung dan akan angkat kertas kerja pada untuk mendapatkan kelulusan kerajaan negeri uh, mungkin itu dulu saja Datuk ok, thank you so you have to check eh, proper because uh, uh, permit uh, on kata uh, is for one as the is there any possibility yang ni jadi taman negeri okay thank you so ada satu soalan eh? uh, daripada uh, lagi Maya so from Malaysia Nature Society Kedah uh, I think you know siapa because you are working close dengan dia orang dia jiwa question eh sini dia free ah, tak sebab ni kita punya website ah, kita punya facebook dia okey tak akan dia punya okey okey as an ngo for mns station the ulu muda since 2018 till now is there any chance ulu muda to be gathered as taman negeri Betul. Eh, tak apa nak dapat ni? Satu Okay. Satu lah. Thank you for the question from MNS. So, um, for your information, Ulu Muda Forest Reserve, a part of Ulu Muda Forest Reserve, uh, covered by 11,180 hectare, were gathered as a Ulu Muda State Park. So not only of the Ulu Muda Forest Reserve, we gather as a Ulu Muda State Park. Uh, we just uh, gather as a Ulu Muda State Park. Uh, the total area is 11,180 hectare only. So for the rest, uh, maybe we can uh, suggest it to the state government if necessary. Okay, so that's the answer from uh, Cik Fatim uh, to MNS uh, Kedah. Hopefully that uh, boleh menjawab uh, uh, persoalan tu. Okay, so thank you Cik Fatim. Once again, uh, tepukan untuk Cik Fatim. Okay, so, uh, so I wrap up eh, for my session, eh, session five uh, under forest dependency. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, finally we managed to finish uh, our session on the uh, on schedule. I would like to say thanks again to all our presenter for their very informative presentation and to audience for active participation. Hopefully, today's session will be beneficially for everyone or everybody. Thank you for your attention. Let us give a round of applause. And I hope uh, to see you all soon in other forums. Thank you very much. And Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thanks. I pass to uh, back to the uh, MCF. Okay, Thank thanks. Okay. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you very much to Yang Bahagia Datuk Nuhayi Yunus and all the speakers for bringing us to a very informative session just now. As a thankful gesture, I'd like to invite Yang Bahagia Dr. Muhammad Rosli Bin Harun accompanied by Yang Rosa Warahana Binti Abdul Rahman to in front for his more spoken of appreciation. Please welcome Yang Bahagia Datuk Nur Haidi Yunus. Please welcome Encik Arif Fahmi Abu Bakar. Finally, please welcome Encik Fatih Afrika Rostad.
like to note that for Puerto Marina, uh, we'll be given the token of appreciation in person, yeah? Thank you so much, Dr. Rosli and for Marina. Eh, for, sorry, for Rohana. So it's it's afternoon, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'll be passing the uh, this uh, conference back to Afiza. Thank you so much, uh, Chief Fatin. She has been a wonderful MC for the past two days, um, conducting uh, all the session. So, um, and also thank you very much to our moderators and all speakers for the past two, two days. And now, um, without further ado, we are pleased uh, to have us uh, to have with us Team Director of Research Planning Division, Yang Bersihar Dr. Rosli Harun, to deliver his uh, closing remarks. Thank you, MC. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Yang bahagia Datuk Nur Aini Yunus, Head of Section Micro and Micro Planning, Forest Department, Peninsula Malaysia. Yang berusaha Associate Professor Dr. Bakti Hassan Basri, Dean of Faculty of Economics, Finance and Banking, Universiti Tawar Malaysia. Yang berusaha Tuan Zainuddin bin Jamaluddin, Deputy Director, Forest Development Division, Kedah State Forest uh, department DPNK. Uh, our seafood, as mentioned by our speakers, uh, Yang Musa Dr. Awang Noor Abdul Ghani, President Malaysian Environmental Economics Association MEEA, uh, Yang Musa Dr. Muhammad Syah Wahid Aji Osman, Director MSR Inspire Senia Berhad, former Professor Faculty of uh, Economics and Management, Print Division Directors, Researchers, and all participants. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and salam sejahtera. This will be a short and sweet closing remarks. Um, I believe that during these two days, uh, all of us have obtained a fruitful discussion in this free conference 2022, unlocking the value of Ulmuda Forest Ecosystem Services towards sustainable development goal, goals. I believe we have learned a lot from the keynote sessions session with three papers presented on very relevant topics and five sessions with 19 invited speakers who have shared findings and their respective, uh, of their respective studies from this two-year project. We also have 17 posters, which I am sure all of us have viewed them on, online. On behalf of the organiz organizing committee, which include Forestry Department, Peninsula Malaysia, and University of Tarot Malaysia as co-organizers, I would like to express my appreciation to all the presenters for delivering such insightful presentations so that all of us can deepen our knowledge about ecosystem services of this interesting study site, the Ulumuda Forest Reserve. I sincerely hope that through your presentations and discussions, all of us were and will continue to contribute to unlocking the value of Ulumuda Forest Reserve Ecosystem Services. Um, and please submit your extended abstracts so that the scientific committee will be able to produce the conference proceedings without any delay. But more important than that, the project team needs to compile the data and findings from all the studies in order to produce a comprehensive report of this pilot project. Furthermore, I would like to thank all participants who have joined this conference physically and virtually through Zoom and Facebook Live. Throughout the two day, these two days, we have 276 participants, which include 139 particip participants who attended physically and 147 who uh, participants who attended online. I hope that all participants have taken this opportunity 
to expand their networking beyond their own specific fields. Finally, I would like to thank all the committee members for organizing this conference and ensuring that it proceeded smoothly. I would also like to humbly apologize for any inconvenience that you might experience during this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for your participation and wish you all a, a safe journey home. And I take uh, great pleasure de in declaring that the Flint Conference 2022, unlocking the value of Ulumode Forest Ecosystem Services towards Sustainable Development Goals is officially closed. Thank you and keep up the good work. Wabillahi Taufiq Waldaya. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rosli, um, for the speech. And I think um, that's it. Everybody uh, cannot wait to go home. <laughs> but uh, before I conclude this ceremony, um, just a, a reminder that you can access all the information posted um, regarding this conference in uh, the website. Uh, so you can Google it, or I think you can ask the, the um, our secretariat for the link. So I think uh, I hope you found this conference inform informative and useful. And uh, once again, uh, thank you everyone uh, for gracing our conference with your presence, and uh, we appreciate you taking uh, time off your busy schedule to join us these past two days. Um, with that, I conclude the ceremony. Thank you all very much.